Chapter One of the History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joyce Martin. The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless by Eliza Haywood. Chapter One gives the reader room to guess at what is to ensue, though ten to one but he finds himself deceived. It was always my opinion that fewer women were undone by love than vanity, and that those mistakes the sex are sometimes guilty of proceed for the most part rather from inadvertency than a vicious inclination. The ladies, however, I am sorry to observe, are apt to make too little allowances to each other on this force, and seem better pleased with an occasion to condemn than to excuse, and it is not above one, in a greater number than I, will presume to mention, who, while he passes the severest censure on the conduct of her friend, will be at the trouble of taking a retrospect on her own there are some who behold with indignation and contempt those errors in others which unhappily they are every day falling into themselves and as the want of due consideration occasions the guilt so the want of due consideration also occasions the scandal and there would be much less room either for the one or the other were some part of that time which is wasted at the toilet in consulting what dresses most becoming to the face employed in examining the heart, and what actions are most becoming of the character. Betsy Thoughtless was the only daughter of a gentleman of good family and fortune in L, we shall leave the name out, where he constantly resided, scarce ever going to London, and contented himself with such diversions as the country afforded. On the death of his wife he sent his little favorite, then about ten years old, to a boarding-school, the governess of which had the reputation of a woman of great good sense, fine breeding, and every way qualified for the well-forming of the minds of those young persons who were entrusted to her care. The old gentleman was so well pleased with having placed his daughter, where she was so likely to improve in all the accomplishments befitting her sex, that he never suffered her to come home, even at breaking up times, when most of the other young ladies did so. But as the school was not above seven or eight miles from his seat, he seldom failed calling to see her once or twice a week. Miss Betsy, who had a great deal of good nature, and somewhat extremely engaging in her manner of behavior, soon gained the affection not only of the governess, but of all the young ladies. But as girls, as well as women, have their particular favorites, to whom they may communicate their little secrets, there was one who, above all the others, was distinguished by her. Miss Forward, for so she was called, was also very fond of Miss Betsy. This intimacy, beginning but in trivial things, and such as suited their age, continued as they advanced nearer to maturity. Miss Forward, however, had two years the advantage of her friend, yet did not disdain to make her the confidant of a kind of amorous intrigue she had entered into with a young lad called master sparkish the son of a neighboring gentleman he had fallen in love with her at church and had taken all opportunities to convince her of his passion she proud of being looked upon as a woman encouraged it frequent letters passed between them for she never failed to answer those she received from him both which were shown to miss betsy and this gave her an early light into the art and mystery of courtship and consequently a relish for admiration. The young lover, calling his mistress angel and goddess, made her long to be in her teens that she might have the same thing said to her. This correspondence being by some accident discovered, the governess found it behooved her to keep a strict eye upon Miss Forward. All the servants were examined concerning the conveying of any letters, either to or from her, but none of them knew anything of the matter. It was a secret to all but Miss Betsy, who kept it inviolably. It is fit, however, the reader should not remain in ignorance. Master Sparkish had read the story of Pyramus and Thisbe. He told his mistress of it, and, in imitation of those lovers of antiquity, 
stuck his letters into a little crevice he found in the garden wall, whence she pulled them out every day, and returned her answers by the same friendly breach, which he very gallantly told her in one of his epistles, had been made by the god of love himself in order to favor his suit so that all the governess's circumspection could not hinder this amour from going on without interruption and could they have contented themselves with barely writing to each other they might probably have done so till they both had been weary and although i will not pretend to say that either of them had anything in their inclinations that was not perfectly consistent with innocence yet it is certain that both languished for a nearer conversation which the fertile brain of miss forward at last brought about she pretended one sunday in the afternoon to have so violent a pain in her head that she could not go to church miss betsy begged leave to stay and keep her company and told the governess she would read a sermon or some other good work to her the good old woman little suspecting the plot concerted between them readily consented nobody being left in the house but themselves and one maid-servant young sparkish who had previous notice at what hour to come was let in at the garden door the key being always in it miss betsy left the lovers in an arbor and went into the kitchen telling the maid she had read miss forward to sleep and hoped she would be better when she waked she amused the wretch with one little chat or another till she thought divine service was near over then returned into the garden to give her friends warning it was time to separate they had after this many private interviews through the contrivance and assistance of miss betsy who quite charmed at being made the confidant of a person older than herself set all her wits to work to render herself worthy of the trust reposed in her sometimes she made pretenses of going to the milliner the mantua maker or to buy something in town and begged leave that miss forward should accompany her saying she wanted her choice in what she was to purchase sparkish was always made acquainted when they were to go out and never failed to give them a meeting miss forward had a great deal of the coquette in her nature she knew how to play at fast and loose with her lover and young as she was took a pride in mingling pain with the pleasure she bestowed miss betsy was a witness of all the airs the other gave herself on this occasion and the artifices she made use of in order to secure the countenance of his addresses so that thus early initiated into the mystery of courtship it is not to be wondered at that when she came to the practice she was so little at a loss this intercourse however lasted but a small time their meetings were too frequent and too little circumspection used in them not to be liable to discovery the governess was informed that in spite of all her care the young folks had been too cunning for her on which she went to the father of sparkish acquainted him with what she knew of the affair and entreated he would lay his commands on his son to refrain all conversation with any of the ladies under their tuition the old gentleman flew into a violent passion on hearing his son had already begun to think of love he called for him and after having rated his youthful folly in the severest manner charged him to relate the whole truth of what had passed between him and the young lady mentioned by the governess the poor lad was terrified beyond measure at his father's anger and confessed every particular of his meetings with miss forward and her companion and thus miss betsy's share of the contrivance was brought to light and drew on her a reprimand equally severe with that miss forward had received the careful governess would not entirely depend on the assurance the father of sparkish had given her and resolved to trust neither of the ladies out of her sight while that young gentleman remained so near them which she knew would be but a short time he having finished his school learning and was soon to go to the university to prevent also any future stratagems being laid between miss betsy and miss forward she took care to keep them from ever being alone together which was a very great mortification to them but a sudden turn soon after happened in the affairs of miss betsy which put all i have been relating entirely out of her head End of chapter one reading by joyce martin
Chapter Two of the History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joyce Martin. The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One by Eliza Haywood. Chapter Two. Shows Miss Betsy in a new scene of life, and the frequent opportunities she had of putting in practice those lessons she was beginning to receive from her young instructors at the boarding school. Though it is certainly necessary to inculcate into young girls all imaginable precaution in regard to their behavior toward those of another sex, yet I know not if it is not an error to dwell too much upon that topic. Miss Betsy might possibly have sooner forgot the little artifices she had seen practiced by Miss Forward, if her governess, by too strenuously endeavoring to convince her how unbecoming they were, had not reminded her of them. Besides, the good old gentlewoman was far stricken in years. Time had set his iron fingers on her cheek, had left his cruel marks on every feature of the face, and she had little remains of having ever been capable of exciting those inclinations she so much condemned, so that what she said seemed to Miss Betsy as spoke out of envy, or to show her authority rather than the real dictates of truth. I have often remarked that reproofs from the old and ugly have much less efficiency than those given by persons less advanced in years, and who may be supposed not altogether past sensibility themselves of the gaieties they advise others to avoid. Though all the old gentlewoman said could not persuade Miss Betsy there was any harm in Miss Forward's behavior toward young Sparkish, yet she had the compliance to listen to her with all the attention the other could expect or desire from her. She was, indeed, as yet too young to consider of the justice of the other's reasoning, and her future conduct showed, also, that she was not of a humor to give herself much pains in examining or weighing in the balance of judgment the merit of the arguments she heard urged, whether for or against any point whatsoever. She had a great deal of wit, but was too volatile for reflection, and as a ship without sufficient ballast is tossed about at the pleasure of every wind that blows. So was she hurried through the ocean of life, just as each predominant passion directed. But I will not anticipate that gratification which ought to be the reward of a long curiosity. The reader, if he has patience to go through the following pages, will see into the secret springs which set this fair machine in motion and produced many actions which were ascribed by the ill-judging and malicious world to causes very different from the real ones. All this, I say, will be revealed in time, but it would be absurd in a writer to rush all at once into the catastrophe of the adventures he would relate, as it would be impracticable in a traveler to reach the end of a long journey without sometimes stopping at the inns in his way to it, to proceed, therefore, gradually with my history. The father of Miss Betsy was a very worthy, honest, and good-natured man, but somewhat too indolent, and by depending too much on the fidelity of those he entrusted with the management of his affairs, he had been for several years involved in a lawsuit, and to his misfortune the aversion he had to business rendered him also incapable of extricating himself from it and the decision was spun out to a much greater length than it need to have been, could he have been prevailed upon, to have attended in person the several courts of justice the cause had been carried through by his more industrious adversary. The exorbitant bills, however, which his lawyers were continually drawing upon him, joined with the pressing remonstrances of his friends, at last roused him from his inactivity of mind, which had already cost him so dear, and determined him not only to take a journey to London, but likewise not to return home till he had seen a final end put to this perplexing affair. Before his departure, he went to the boarding-school to take his leave of his beloved Betsy, and renew the charge he had frequently given the governess concerning her education, adding, in a mournful accent, 
that it would be a long time before he saw her again. These words, as it proved, had somewhat of prophecy in them. On his arrival in London he found his cause in so perplexed and entangled a situation as gave him little hopes of ever bringing it to a favorable issue. The vexation and fatigue he underwent on this account, joined with the closeness of the town air which had never agreed with his constitution even in his younger years, soon threw him into that sort of consumption which goes by the name of a galloping one and, they say, is the most difficult of any to be removed. He died in about three months without being able to do any great matters concerning the affair which had drawn him from his peaceful home, and according to all possibility hastened his fate, being perfectly sensible and convinced of his approaching dissolution. He made his will, bequeathing the bulk of his estate to whom whose right it was, his eldest son then upon his travels through the greatest part of Europe, all his personals, which were very considerable, to the bank, and other public funds he ordered should be equally divided between Francis, his second son, at that time a student at Oxford, and Miss Betsy, constituting at the same time as trustees to the said testament, Sir Ralph Trusty, his near neighbor in the country, and Mr. Goodman, a wealthy merchant in the city of London, both of them gentlemen, of unquestionable integrity, and with whom he had pursued a long and uninterrupted friendship. On the arrival of this melancholy news, Miss Betsy felt as much grief as it was possible for a heart so young and gay as hers to be capable of, but a little time, for the most part, serves to obliterate the memory of misfortunes of this nature, even in persons of a riper age and had Miss Betsy been more afflicted than she was, something happened soon after, which would have very much contributed to her consolation. Mr. Goodman, having lived without marrying till he had reached an age which one should have imagined would have prevented him from thinking of it at all, at last took it into his head to become husband. The person he made choice of was called Lady Mellison, relict of a baronet, who, having little or no estate, had accepted of a small employment about the court, in which post he died, leaving her ladyship one daughter named Flora in a very destitute condition. Goodman, however, had wealth enough for both, and consulted no other interest than that of his heart. As for the lady, the motive on which she had consented to be his wife may easily be guessed, and when once made so, gained such an absolute ascendancy over him, that whatever she declared as her will with him had the force of a law. She had aversion to the city. He immediately took a house of her choosing at St. James, inconvenient as it was for his business. Whatever servants she disapproved, though of never so long standing, and of the most approved fidelity, were discharged, and others, more agreeable to her, put in their places. In fine, nothing she desired was denied. He considered her as an oracle of wit and wisdom, and thought it would be unpardonable arrogance to attempt to set his reason against hers. This lady was no sooner informed of the trust reposed on him than she told him she thought it would be highly proper for Miss Betsy to be sent for from the school and boarded with them, not only as her daughter would be a fine companion for that young orphan, they being much the same age, and she herself was more capable of proving her mind than any governess of a school could be supposed to be, but that also, having her under her own eye, he would be more able to discharge his duty toward her as a guardian than if she were at the distance of near an hundred miles. There was something in this proposal which had indeed the face of a great deal of good nature and consideration for Miss Betsy. At least it seemed highly so to Mr. Goodman. But as Sir Ralph Trusty was joined with him in the guardianship of that young beauty and was at that time in London, he thought it proper to consult him on the occasion, which, having done, and finding no objection on the part of the other, Lady Mellison to show her great compliance to the daughter of her husband's deceased friend, 
set her own woman to bring her from the boarding-school and attend her up to London. Miss Betsy had never seen this great metropolis, but had heard so much of the gay manner in which the genteel part of the world passed their time in it, that she was quite transported at being told she was to be removed thither. Mrs. Prinks, for so Lady Mellison's woman was called, did not fail to heighten her ideas of the pleasures of the place to which she was going, nor to magnify the goodness of her lady in taking her under her care with the most extravagant encomiums. It is not therefore to be wondered at that neither the tears of the good governess, who truly loved her, nor those of her dear Miss Forward, nor any of those she left behind, could give her any more than a momentary regret to a heart so possessed with the expectations of going to receive everything with which youth is liable to be enchanted. She promised, however, to keep up a correspondence by letters, which she did, till things that seemed to her of much more importance put her school acquaintances entirely out of her head. She was met at the end where the stage put up by Mr. Goodman in his own coach, accompanied by Miss Flora. The good old gentleman embraced her with the utmost tenderness, and assured her that nothing in his power nor in that of his family would be wanting to compensate as much as possible the loss she had sustained by the death of her parents. The young lady also said many obliging things to her, and they seemed highly taken with each other at this first interview, which gave the honest heart of Goodman an infinite satisfaction. The reception given her by Lady Mellison, when brought home and presented to her by her husband, was conformable to what Mrs. Prinks had made her expect, that lady omitting nothing to make her certain of being always treated by her with the same affection as her own daughter. Sir Ralph Trusty, on being informed his young charge was come to town, came the next day to Mr. Goodman's to visit her. His lady accompanied him. There had been a great intimacy and friendship between her and the mother of Miss Betsy, and she could not hold in her arms the child of a person so dear to her, without letting fall some tears, which were looked upon by the company as the tribute due to the memory of the dead. The conjecture, in part, might be true, but the flow proceeded from the mixture of another motive not suspected, that of compassion for the living. This lady was a woman of great prudence, piety, and virtue. She had heard many things relating to the conduct of Lady Mellison, which made her think her a very unfit person to have the care of youth, especially those of her own sex. She had been extremely troubled when Sir Ralph told her that Miss Betsy was sent for from the country to live under such tuition, and would fain have opposed it, could she have done so without danger of creating a misunderstanding between him and Mr. Goodman, well knowing the bigoted respect the latter had for his wife, and how unwilling he would be to do anything that had the least tendency to thwart her inclinations. She communicated her sentiments, however, on this occasion, to no person in the world, not even her own husband but resolved within herself to take all the opportunities that fell in her way of giving Miss Betsy such instructions as she thought necessary for her behavior in general, and especially toward the family in which it was her lot to be placed. Miss Betsy was now just entering into her fourteenth year, a nice and delicate time in persons of her sex, since it is then they are most apt to take the bent of impression which, according as it is well or ill-directed, makes or mars the future prospect of their lives. She was tall, well-shaped, and perfectly amiable, without being what is called a complete beauty, and as she wanted nothing to render her liable to the greatest temptations, so she stood in need of the surest arms for her defense against them. But, while this worthy lady was full of cares for the well-doing of a young creature who appeared so deserving of regard, Miss Betsy thought she had the highest reason to be satisfied with her situation, and how, indeed, could it be otherwise? Lady Mellison kept a great deal of company. 
She received visits every morning from ten to one o'clock from the most gay and polite of both sexes. All the news of the town was talked on at her levee, and it seldom happened that some party of pleasure was not formed for the ensuing evening, in all which Miss Betsy and Miss Flora had their share. Never did the mistress of a private family indulge herself and those about her with such a continual round of public diversions. The court, the play, the ball, the opera, with giving and receiving visits, engrossed all the time that could be spared from the toilet. It cannot, therefore, seem strange that Miss Betsy, to whom all these things were entirely new, should have her head turned without the promiscuous enjoyment and the very power of reflection lost amidst the giddy whirl, nor that it should be so long before she could recover it enough to see the little true felicity of such a course of life. Among the many topics with which this brilliant society entertained each other, it may be easily supposed that love and gallantry were not excluded. Lady Mellison, though turned of forty, had her fine things said to her, but both heaven and earth were ransacked for comparisons in favor of the beauties of Miss Flora and Miss Betsy. But as there was nothing particular in these kinds of addresses, and attended only to show the wit of those that made them, these young ladies answered them only with raillery, in which art Miss Betsy soon learned to excel. She had the glory, however, of being the first who excited a real passion in the heart of any of those who visited Lady Mellifin, though being accustomed to hear declarations which had the appearance of love, yet were really no more than words of course, and made indiscriminately to every fine woman, she would not presently persuade herself that this was more serious. The first victim of her charms was the only son of a very rich alderman, and having a fortune left him by a relation independent of his father, who was the greatest miser in the world, was furnished with the means of mingling with the beau monde and of making one at every diversion that was proposed. He had fancied Miss Flora a mighty fine creature before he saw Miss Betsy, but the imaginary flame he had for her was soon converted into a sincere one for the other. He truly loved her, and was almost distracted by the little credit she gave to his professions. His perseverance, his tremblings whenever he approached her, his transports on seeing her, his anxieties at taking leave, so different from what she had observed in any other of those who had pretended to list themselves under the banner of her charms, at length convincing her of the conquest she had made, awakened in her breast that vanity so natural to a youthful mind. She exulted, she plumed herself, she used him ill and well by turns, taking an equal pleasure in raising or depressing his hopes, and, in spite of her good nature, felt no satisfaction superior to that of the consciousness of a power of giving pain to the man who loved her. But with how great a mortification this short-lived triumph was succeeded, the reader shall presently be made sensible. End of chapter 2 Recording by Joyce Martin Chapter 3 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joyce Martin. The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1 by Eliza Haywood. Chapter 3. Affords matter of condolence or raillery, according to the humor the reader happens to be in for either. We often see that the less encouragement is given to the lover's suit, with the more warmth and eagerness he prosecutes it, and many people are apt to ascribe this hopeless perseverance to an odd perverseness in the very nature of love. But, for my part, I rather take it to proceed from an ambition of surmounting difficulties. It is not, however, my province to enter into any discussion of so nice a point. I deal only in matters of fact, and shall not meddle with definition. 
It was not till after Miss Betsy had reason to believe she had engaged the heart of her lover too far for him to recall it, that she began to take a pride in tormenting him. While she looked on his addresses, as of a piece with those who called themselves her admirers, she had treated him in that manner which she thought would most conduce him to make him really so. But no sooner did she perceive, by the tokens before mentioned, and many others, that his passion was of the most serious nature, than she behaved to him in a fashion quite the reverse, especially before company. For as she had not the least affection or even a liking toward him, his submissive deportment under the most cold, sometimes contemptuous carriage could afford her no other satisfaction than, as she fancied, it showed the power of her beauty, and piqued those ladies of her acquaintance who could not boast of such an implicit resignation and patient suffering from their lovers. In particular, Miss Flora, who she could not forbear imagining, looked very grave on the occasion. What foundation there was for a conjecture of this nature was nevertheless undiscoverable till a long time after. As this courtship was no secret to any of the family, Mr. Goodman thought himself obliged, both as the guardian of Miss Betsy and the friend of Alderman Saving, for so the father of this young enamorado was called, to inquire upon what footing it stood. He thought that if the old man knew and approved of his son's inclinations, he would have mentioned the affair to him, as they frequently saw each other, and it seemed to him neither for the interest nor reputation of his fair charge to receive the clandestine addresses of any man whatsoever. She had a handsome fortune of her own, and he thought that, and her personal accomplishments, sufficiently to entitle her to as good a match as Mr. Saving, but then he knew the sordid nature of the aldermen, and that all the merits of Miss Betsy would add nothing in the balance if her money was found too light to pose against the sums his son would be possessed of. This being the case, he doubted not but that he was kept in ignorance of the young man's intentions, and fearing the matter might be carried too far, resolved either to put a stop to it at once, or permit it to go on on such terms as should free him from all censure from the one or the other party. On talking seriously to the lover, he soon found the suggestions he had entertained had not deceived him. Young Saving frankly confessed that his father had other views for him, but added that if he could prevail on the young lady to marry him, he did not despair but that when the thing was once done and past recall, the alderman would by degrees receive them into favor. "'You know, sir,' said he, "'that he has no child but me, nor any kindred for whom he has the least regard, and it cannot be supposed that he would utterly discard me for following my inclinations in this point, especially as they are in favor of the most amiable and deserving of her sex.' He said much more on this head, but it had no weight with the merchant. He answered that if the alderman was of his way of thinking that all the flattering hopes his passion suggested to him on that score might be realized, but that according to the disposition he knew him to be of, he saw but little room to think he would forgive a step of this kind. Therefore, continued he, I cannot allow this love affair to be prosecuted any further, and must desire you will desist visiting at my house till you have either conquered this inclination or Miss Betsy is otherwise disposed of. This was a cruel sentence for the truly affectionate saving, but he found it in vain to solicit a repeal of it, and all he could obtain from him was a promise to say nothing of what had passed to the alderman. Mr. Goodman would have thought he had but half completed his duty had he neglected to sound the inclination of Miss Betsy on this account, and in order to come more easily at the truth he began with talking to her in a manner which might make her look on him rather as a favorer of Mr. Saving's pretensions than the contrary, and was extremely glad to find, by her replies, how indifferent that young lover was to her. He then acquainted her with the resolution he had taken, and the discourse he had just had with him, and, to keep her from ever after encouraging the addresses of any man, 
without being authorized by the consent of friends on both sides, represented, in the most pathetic terms he was able, the danger to which a private correspondence renders a young woman liable. She seemed convinced of the truth of what he said, and promised to follow, in the strictest manner, his advice. Whether she thought herself in reality so much obliged to the conduct of her guardian in this, I will not take upon me to say, for though she was not charmed with the person of Mr. Saving, it is certain she took an infinite pleasure in the acidities of his passion. It is therefore highly probable that she might imagine he meddled in this affair more than he had any occasion to have done. She had, however, but little time for reflection on her guardian's behavior. An accident happening which showed her own to her in a light very different from what she had ever seen it. Lady Mellison had a ball at her house. There was a great deal of company, among whom was a gentleman named Galand. He was a man of family, had a large estate, sung, danced, spoke French, dressed well. Frequent successes among the women had rendered him extremely vain and as he had too great an admiration for his own person to be possessed of any great share of it for that of any other, he enjoyed the pleasures of love without being sensible of the pains. This darling of the fair it was that Miss Betsy picked out to treat with the most peculiar marks of esteem whenever she had a mind to give umbrage to poor saving. Much had that faithful lover suffered on the account of this fop, but the fair inflictor of his torments was punished for her insensibility and ingratitude by a way her inexperience of the world, and the temper of mankind in general, had made her far from apprehending. While the company were employed, some in dancing, and others in particular conversation, the beau found an opportunity to slip into Miss Betsy's hand a little billet, saying to her at the same time, you have got my heart, and this little bit of paper will convey to you the sentiments it is inspired with in your favor. She, imagining it was either a sonnet or epistle in praise of her beauty, received it with a smile and put it into her pocket. After everybody had taken leave and she was retired to her chamber, she examined it and found to her great astonishment the contents as follow. Dear Miss, I must certainly be either the most ungrateful or most consumedly dull fellow upon earth, not to have returned the advances you have been so kind to make me, had the least opportunity offered for my doing so. But Lady Mellison, her daughter, the fool saving or some impertinent creature or other, has always been in the way, so that there was not a possibility of giving you even the least earnest of love. But, my dear... I have found out a way to pay you the whole sum with interest, which is this. You must invent some excuse for going out alone, and let me know by a billet directed for me at White's the exact hour, and I will wait for you at the corner of the street in a hackney coach, the window drawn up, and whirl you to a pretty snug place I know of, where we may pass a delicious hour or two, without a soul to interrupt our pleasures." Let me find a line from you to-morrow, if you can any way contrive it, being impatient to convince you how much I am your dear creature, yours, etc., etc., J. Galand. Impossible is it to express the mingled emotions of shame, surprise, and indignation which filled the breast of Miss Betsy on reading this bold invitation. She threw the letter to the ground. She stamped upon it. She spurned it and would have treated the author in the same manner had he been present. But the first transports of so just a resentment being over, a consciousness of having, by a too free behavior toward him, emboldened him to take this liberty, involved her in the utmost confusion, and she was little less enraged with herself than she had reason to be with him. She could have tore out her very eyes for having affected to look kindly on a wretch who durst presume so far on her supposed affection, and though she spared those pretty twinklers that violence, she half drowned their luster in a deluge of tears. 
never was a night passed in more cruel anxieties than what she sustained both from the affront she had received and reflection that it was chiefly the folly of her own conduct which had brought it on her and what greatly added to her vexation was the uncertainty how it would best become her to act on an occasion which appeared so extraordinary to her she had no friend whom she thought it proper to consult she was ashamed to relate the story to any of the discreet and serious part of her acquaintance she feared their reproofs for having counterfeited a tenderness for a man which she was now sensible she ought if it had been real rather to have concealed with the utmost care both from him and all the world and as for lady mellison and miss flora though their conduct inspired her not with any manner of awe yet she thought she saw something in those ladies which did not promise much sincerity and showed as if they would rather turn her complaints into ridicule than afford her that cordial and friendly advice that she stood in need of these were the reasons which determined her to keep the whole thing a secret from every one at first she was tempted to write to galen and testify her disdain of his presumption in terms which should convince him how grossly his vanity had imposed upon him but she afterward considered that a letter from her was doing him too much honour and though never so reproachful might draw another from him either to excuse and beg pardon for the temerity of the former or possibly to affront her a second time by defending it and repeating his request she despised and hated him too much to engage in a correspondence with him of any kind and therefore resolved as it was certainly most prudent not to let him have anything under her hand but when next she saw him to show her resentment by such ways as occasion should permit he came not to mr goodman's however for three days possibly waiting that time for a letter from miss betsy but on the fourth he appeared at lady mellison's tea-table there were besides the family several others present so that he had not an opportunity of speaking in private to miss betsy but the look she gave him so different from all he had ever seen her assume toward him might have shown any man not blinded with his vanity how much she was offended but he imagined her ill-humour proceeded only from the want of means to send to him came again the next day and happening to find her alone in the parlour what my dear said he taking her in a free manner by the hand have you been so closely watched by your guardian and guardianesses here that no kind moment offered for you to answer the desires of your humble servant the surest guardians of my fame and peace replied she snatching her hand away is the little share of understanding i am mistress of which i hope will always be sufficient to defend my honour in more dangerous attacks than the rude impertinencies of an idle coxcomb these words and the air with which they were spoke one would think should have struck with confusion the person to whom they were directed but galen was not so easily put out of countenance and looking her full in the face ah child cried he sure you are not in your right senses to-day understanding impertinencies idle coxcomb very pleasant i faith but upon my soul if you think these airs become you you are the most mistaken woman in the world it may be so cried she ready to burst with inward spite at his insolence but i should be yet more mistaken if i were capable of thinking a wretch like you worthy of anything but contempt with these words she flung out of the room and he pursued her with a hoarse laugh till she was out of hearing and then went into the dining-room where he found lady mellison and several who had come to visit her miss betsy who had gone directly to her own chamber sent to excuse coming down to tea pretending a violent headache nor would be prevailed upon to join the company till she heard galen had taken his leave which he did much sooner than usual being probably a good deal disconcerted at the shock his vanity had received End of chapter 3, reading by Joyce Martin.
Chapter 4 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joyce Martin. The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1 by Eliza Haywood, Chapter 4. Verifies the old proverb that one affliction treads upon the heels of another. As Miss Betsy was prevented from discovering to any one the impudent attempt Galand had made on her virtue by the shame of having emboldened him to it by too unreserved a behavior, so also the shame of the disappointment and rebuff he had received from her kept him from saying anything of what had passed between them, and this resolution on both sides rendered it very difficult for either of them to behave to the other so as not to give some suspicion. Betsy could not always avoid seeing him when he came to Lady Mellison's, for he would not all at once desist his visits, for two reasons. First, because it might give occasion for an enquiry into the cause, and secondly, because Miss Betsy would plume herself on the occasion as having by her scorn triumphed over his audacity and drove him from the field of battle. He therefore resolved to continue his visits for some time, and to pique her, as he imagined, directed all the fine things his commonplace book was well stored with, to Miss Flora, leaving the other wholly neglected. But here he was little less deceived than he had been before in the sentiments of that young lady. The hatred his late behavior had given her and the utter detestation it had excited in her toward him had, for a time, extinguished that vanity, so almost inseparable from youth, especially when accompanied with beauty, and she rather rejoiced than the contrary to see him affect to be so much taken up with Miss Flora, that he could scarce say the least compliant thing to her, as it freed her from the necessity of returning it in some measure. Her good sense had now scope to operate. She saw, as in a mirror, her own late follies in those of Miss Flora, who swelled with all the pride of flattered vanity on this new imaginary conquest over the heart of the accomplished Galand, as he was generally esteemed, and perceived the errors of such a way of thinking and acting in so clear a light as had it continued would, doubtless, have spared her those anxieties her relapse from it afterward occasioned. In these serious reflections, let us leave her, for a time, to see in what situation Mr. Saving was, after being denied access to his mistress. As it was impossible for a heart to be more truly sincere and affectionate, he was far from being able to make any efforts for the banishing of Miss Betsy's image thence. On the contrary, he thought of nothing but how to continue a correspondence with her, and endeavor by all means in his power to engage her in a private interview. As his flame was pure and respectful, he was some days debating with himself how to proceed so as not to let her think he had desisted from his pretensions, or to continue them in a manner at which she should not be offended. Love, when real, seldom fails of inspiring the breast that harbors it with an equal share of timidity. He trembled whenever he thought of soliciting a meeting, yet without it how could he hope to retain any place in her memory, much less make any progress in gaining her affection? At length, however, he assumed courage enough to write to her, and by a bribe to one of the servants got his letter delivered to her, fearing if he had sent it by the post or any public way to the house it would be intercepted by the caution he found Mr. Goodman had resolved to observe in this point. Miss Betsy, knowing his hand by the superscription, was a little surprised, as perhaps having never thought of him since they parted, but opened it without the least emotion, either of pain or pleasure. She knew him too well to be under any apprehensions of being treated by him, as she had been of Galand and was too little sensible of his merit to feel the least impatience for examining the dictates of his affection. Yet, indifferent as she was, she could not forbear being touched on reading these lines. Most adored of your sex, 
I doubt not, but you are acquainted with Mr. Goodman's behavior to me. But, oh, I fear you are too insensible of the agonies in which my soul labors through this cruel caution. Dreadful is the loss of sight. Yet what is sight to me when it presents not you? Though I saw you regardless of my ardent passion, yet still I saw you, and while I did so could not be wholly wretched. What have I not endured since deprived of that only joy for which I wish to live? Had it not been improper for me to have been seen near Mr. Goodman's house, after having been forbid entrance to it, I should have dwelt for ever in your street, in hope of sometimes getting a glimpse of you from one or other of the windows. This, I thought, would be taken notice of and might offend you. But darkness freed me from these apprehensions, and gave me the consolation of breathing in the same air with you. Soon as I thought all watchful eyes were closed, I flew to the place, which, wherever my body is, contains my heart and all its faculties. I pleased myself with looking on the roof that covers you, and invoked every star to present me to you in your sleep, in a form more agreeable than I can hope I ever appeared to you in your waking fancy. Thus I have passed each night, and when the morning dawned, unwillingly retired to take that rest which nature more especially demands, when heavy melancholy oppresses the heart. I slept. But how? Distracting images swam in my tormented brain and waked me with horrors inconceivable. Equally lost to business as to all social commerce, I fly mankind, and like some discontented ghost, seek out the most solitary walks and lonely shades to pour forth my complaints. Oh, Miss Betsy, I cannot live if longer deny the sight of you. In pity to my sufferings, permit me yet once more to speak to you, even though it be to take a last farewell. I have made a little kind of interest with a woman at the habit shop in Covent Garden, where I know you sometimes go. I dread to entreat you would call there to-morrow, yet if you are so divinely good, be assured I shall entertain no presuming hopes on the condensation you shall be pleased to make me. But acknowledge it as the mere effect of that compassion which is inherent to your generous mind. Alas! I must be much more worthy than I can yet pretend to be before I dare flatter myself with owing anything to a more soft emotion than those I have mentioned. Accuse me not, therefore, of too much boldness in this petition, but grant to my despair what you would deny to the love of your most faithful and everlasting slave. H. Saving P.S. The favor of one line to let me know whether I may expect the blessing I implore will add to the bounty of it. The same hand that brings you this will also deliver your commands to yours as above. Miss Betsy read this letter several times, and the oftener she did so, the more she saw into the soul of him that sent it. How wide the difference between this and that she received from Galen! Tis true, they both desired a meeting, each made the same request, but the manner in which the former was asked and the end proposed by the grant of it she easily perceived were as distant as heaven and hell. She called to mind the great respect he had always treated her with. She was convinced both of his honor and sincerity, and thought something was due from her on that account. In fine, after deliberating a little within herself, she resolved to write to him in these terms. Sir, though it is my fixed determination to encourage the addresses of no man whatever without the approbation of my guardians, yet I think myself too much obliged to the affection you have expressed for me to refuse you a favor of so trifling a nature as that you have taken the pains to ask. I will be at the place you mention to-morrow, some time in the forenoon, but desire you will expect nothing from it but a last farewell, which you have promised to be contented with. Till then, adieu. After finishing this little billet, she called the maid, whom Saving had made his confidant, into the chamber, and asked her when she expected he would come for an answer. To which the other replied that he had appointed her to meet him at the corner of the street very early in the morning, before any of the windows were open. 
"'Well, then,' said Miss Betsy, smiling and putting the letter into her hands, "'give him this. I do it for your sake, Nanny, for I suppose you will have a double fee on the delivery.' "'The gentleman is too much in love,' answered she, "'not to be grateful.' "'Miss Betsy passed the remainder of that day and the ensuing night "'with that tranquillity which is inseparable from a mind unencumbered with passion. "'But the next morning, remembering her promise, "'while Lady Mellison and Miss Flora were engaged with the bow and bells at their levy, "'she slipped out, and taking a chair at the end of the street, "'went to the milliner's according to appointment.' She doubted not, but the impatience of her lover would have brought him there long before her, and was very much amazed to find herself the first comer. She knew not, however, but some extraordinary accident, unforeseen by him, might have happened to detain him longer than he expected, and from the whole course of his past behavior could find no shadow of reason to suspect him of a willful remissness. She sat down in the shop and amused herself with talking to the woman on the new modes of dress and such like ordinary matters, but made not the least mention of the motive which had brought her there that morning, and the other, not knowing whether it would be proper to take any notice, was also silent on that occasion. But Miss Betsy observed she often turned her head toward the window and ran to the door, looking up and down the street as if she expected somebody who was not yet come. Miss Betsy could not forbear being shocked at a disappointment which was the last thing in the world she could have apprehended. She had, notwithstanding the patience, to wait for a little past eleven till near two o'clock, expecting during every moment of that time that he would either come or send some excuse for not doing so. But finding he did neither, and that it was near the hour in which Mr. Goodman usually dined, she took her leave of the woman and went home, full of agitations. The maid, who was in on the secret, happening to open the door, and Miss Betsy looking round and perceiving there was nobody in hearing, said to her, "'Nanny, are you sure you delivered my letter safe into Mr. Saving's hand?' "'Sure, miss,' cried the wench. "'Yes, as sure as I am alive, and he gave me a good Queen Anne's guinea for my trouble. I have not had time since to put it up,' continued she, taking it out of her bosom. "'Here it is.' "'Well, then, what did he say on receiving it?' said Miss Betsy. "'I never saw a man so transported,' replied she. "'He put it to his mouth and kissed it with such an eagerness I thought he would have devoured it. Miss Betsy asked no further questions, but went up to her chamber to pull off her hood, not being able to know how she ought to judge of this adventure. She was soon called down to dinner, but her mind was too much perplexed to suffer her to eat much. She was extremely uneasy the whole day, for an explanation of what at present seemed so mysterious— and this gave her little less pain than perhaps she would have felt had she been possessed with an equal share of love. But in the evening her natural vivacity got the better, and not doubting but the next morning she should receive a letter with a full and clarissement of this affair, she enjoyed the same sweet repose as if nothing had happened to ruffle her temper. The morning came, but brought no billet from that once obsequious lover. The next, and three or four succeeding ones, were barren of the fruit she so much expected. What judgment could she form of an event so odd? She could not bring herself to think savings had taken pains to procure a rendezvous with her, on purpose to disappoint and affront her, and was not able to conceive any probable means by which he could be prevented from writing to her. Death, only, she thought, could be an excuse for him, and had that happened she should have heard of it. Sometimes she fancied that the maid had been treacherous, but when she considered she could get nothing by being so, and that it was, on the contrary, rather her interest to be sincere, she rejected that supposition. The various conjectures which by turns came into her head rendered her, however, excessively disturbed, and in a situation which deserved some share of pity, had not her pride kept her from revealing either the discontent or the motives of it to any one person in the world. End of chapter 4 Reading by Joyce Martin
Chapter Five of the History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joyce Martin. The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One by Eliza Haygood. Chapter Five contains nothing very extraordinary, yet such things as are highly proper to be known. I think it is generally allowed that there are few emotions of the mind more uneasy than suspense. Not the extreme youth of Miss Betsy, nor all her natural cheerfulness, nor her perfect indifference for the son of Alderman Saving, could enable her to throw off the vexation in which his late behavior had involved her. Had the motive been the most mortifying of any that could be imagined to her vanity, pride and resentment would then have come to her assistance. She would have despised the author of the insult, and in time have forgot the insult itself, but the uncertainty in what manner she ought to think of the man and this last action of his made both dwell much longer on her mind than otherwise they would have done. As the poet truly says, when puzzling doubts the anxious bosom sees, to know the worst is some degree of ease. This is a maxim which will hold good, even when the strongest and most violent passions operate. But Miss Betsy was possessed of no more than a bare curiosity, which, as she had yet no other sensation that demanded gratification, was sufficiently painful to her. It was about ten or twelve days that she continued to labor under this dilemma, but at the expiration of that time was partly relieved from it by the following means. Mr. Goodman, happening to meet Alderman Saving, which whom he had great business, upon change, desired he would accompany him to an adjacent tavern, to which the other complied, but with an air much more grave and reserved than he was accustomed to put on with the person whom he had known for a great number of years and was concerned with in some affairs of traffic. They went together to the ship tavern. After having ended what they had to say to each other upon business, "'Mr. Goodman,' said the alderman, "'we have long been friends. I always thought you an honest, fair-dealing man, and am therefore very much surprised you should go about to put upon me in the manner you have lately done.' "'Put upon you, sir,' cried the merchant. I know not what you mean, and am very certain I never did anything that might call in question my integrity, either to you or any one else. It was great integrity indeed, resumed the alderman with a sneer, to endeavor to draw my only son into a clandestine marriage with the girl you have at your house. Mr. Goodman was astonished, as well he might, at this accusation, and perceiving by some other words that the alderman let fall, that he was well acquainted with the love young Saving had professed for Miss Betsy, frankly related to him all that he knew of the courtship, and the method he had taken to put a stop to it. "'That was enough, sir,' cried the alderman hastily. "'You should have told me of it. Do you think young folks like them would have regarded your forbidding? No, no, I'll warrant you they would have found some way or other to come together before now, and the boy might have been ruined if I had not been informed by other hands on how things were carried on, and put it out of the power of any of you to impose upon me. The girl may spread her nets to catch some other woodcock if she can, thanks to heaven, and by my own prudence my son is far enough out of her reach. Mr. Goodman, though one of the best-natured men in the world, could not keep himself from being a little ruffled at the alderman's discourse and told him that though he had been far from encouraging Mr. Saving's inclinations, and should always think it the duty of a son to consult his father in everything he did, especially in so material a point as that of marriage, yet he saw no reason for treating Miss Betsy with contempt, as she was of a good family, had a very pretty fortune of her own, and suitable accomplishments. "'You take a great deal of pains to set her off,' said the alderman, "'and since you married a court lady not worth a grout, "'have got all the romantic idle notions of the other end of the town "'as finely as if you had been bred there. "'A good family. Very pleasant, I faith. "'Will a good family go to market? "'Will it buy a joint of mutton at the butcher's, "'or a pretty gown at the mercer's? "'Then a pretty fortune, you say. "'Enough it may be to squander away at cards or masquerades for a month or two. 
she has suitable accomplishments too oh yes indeed they're suitable ones i believe i suppose she can sing dance and jobber a little french but i'll be hanged if she knows how to make a pie or a pudding or to teach her maid to do it the reflection on lady macellison in the beginning of this speech so much incensed mr goodman that he could scarce attend to the latter part of it he forbore interrupting him however but as soon as he had done speaking replied in terms which showed his resentment in fine such hot words passed between them as had they been younger men might have produced worse consequence but the spirit of both being equally evaporated in mutual reproaches they grew more calm and at last talked themselves into as good harmony as ever mr goodman said he was sorry that he had been prevailed upon by the young man's entreaties to keep his courtship to miss betsy a secret and the alderman begged pardon in his turn for having said anything disrespectful of lady mellison on this they shook hands another half pint of sherry was called for and before they parted the alderman acquainted mr goodman that to prevent entirely all future correspondence between his son and miss betsy he had sent him to holland some days ago without letting him know anything of his intentions till everything was ready for his embarkation i sent said he the night before he was to go his portmanteau and what other luggage i thought he would have occasion to the inn where the harwich stage puts up and making him be called up very early in the morning told him he must go a little way out of town with me upon extraordinary business he seemed very unwilling said he had appointed that morning to meet a gentleman and begged i would delay the journey to the next day or even till the afternoon what caused this backwardsness i cannot imagine for i think it was impossible he could know my designs on this score but whatever was in his head i took care to disappoint it i listened to none of his excuses nor trusted him out of my sight but forced him to go with me to the coach in which i had secured a couple of places he was horribly shocked when he found where he was going and would fain have persuaded me to repeal his banishment as he called it i laughed in my sleeve but took no notice of the real motive i had for sending him away and told him there was an absolute necessity for his departure that i had a business of the greatest importance at rotterdam in which i could trust nobody but himself to negotiate and that he would find in his trunk letters and other papers which would instruct him how to act in fine continued the alderman i went with him aboard stayed with him till they were ready to weigh anchor and then returned and stood on the beach till the ship sailed quite out of sight so that if my gentleman had a thought of writing to his mistress he had not the least opportunity for it he added that he did not altogether deceive his son having indeed some affairs to transact in rotterdam though they were not of the mighty consequence he had pretended but which he had by a private letter to his agent there ordered should be made to appear as intricate and perplexing as possible that the young gentleman's return might be delayed as long as there was any plausible excuse for detaining him without his seeing through the reason of it mr goodman praised the alderman's discretion in the whole conduct of this business and to atone for having been prevailed upon to keep young saving secret from him offered to make interest with a friend he had at the post-office to stop any letter that should be directed for miss betsy thoughtless by the way of holland by which means said he all communication between the young people will soon be put an end to he will grow weary of writing when he receives no answers and she of thinking of him as a lover when she finds he ceases to tell her he is so the alderman was ready to hug his old friend for this proposal which it is certain he made in the sincerity of his heart for they no sooner parted than he went to the office and fulfilled his promise when he came home in order to hinder miss betsy from expecting to hear anything more of her saving he told her he had been treated by the alderman pretty roughly on account of the encouragement that had been given in his house to the amorous addresses that had been made to her by his son and added he the old man is so incensed against him for having a thought of that kind in your favour that he has sent him beyond sea i know not to what part but it seems he is never to come back till he has given full assurance the liking he has for you is utterly worn off 
he might have spared himself the pains said miss betsy blushing with disdain his son could have informed him how little i was inclinable to listen to anything he said on the score of love and i myself if he had asked me the question would have given him the strongest assurances that words could form that if ever i changed my condition which heaven knows i am far from thinking on as yet i should never be prevailed upon to do it by any merits his son was possessed of mr goodman congratulated her on the indifference she expressed and told her he hoped she would always continue in the same humour till an offer which promised more satisfaction in marriage should happen to be made nothing more was said on this head but miss betsy upon ruminating on what mr goodman had related easily imagined that the day in which he had been sent away was the same on which he had appointed to meet her and therefore excused his not coming as a thing unavoidable yet as she knew not the precaution his father had taken was not so ready to forgive him for not sending a line to prevent her waiting so long for him at the habit shop she could not however when she reflected on the whole tenor of his deportment to her think it possible he should at all once become guilty of wilfully omitting what even common good manners and decency required she soon grew weary however of troubling herself about the matter and a very few days served to make her lose even the memory of it end of chapter five recording by joyce martin Chapter Six of the History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joyce Martin. The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One by Eliza Haywood. Chapter Six may be of some service to the ladies especially the younger sort if well attended to miss betsy had now no person that professed a serious passion for her but as she had yet never seen the man capable of inspiring her with the least emotions of tenderness she was quite easy as to that point and wished nothing beyond what she enjoyed the pleasure of being told she was very handsome and gallanted about by a great number of those who go by the name of very pretty fellows. Pleased with the praise, she regarded not the condition or merits of the praised, and suffered herself to be treated, presented, and squired about in all public places, either by the rake, the man of honor, the wit, or the fool, the married as well as the unmarried, without distinction and just as either fell in her way such a conduct as this could not fail of laying her open to the censure of malicious tongues the agreeableness of her person her wit and the many accomplishments she was mistress of made her envied and hated even by those who professed the greatest friendship for her several there were who though they could scarce support the vexation it gave them to see her so much preferred to themselves yet chose to be as much with her as possible in the cruel hope of finding some fresh matter wherewith to blast her reputation certain it is that though she was as far removed as innocence itself from all intent or wish of committing a real ill yet she paid too little regard to the appearances of it and said and did many things which the actually criminal would be more cautious to avoid hurried by an excess of vanity and that love of pleasure so natural to youth she indulged herself in liberties of which she foresaw not the consequences lady trusty who sincerely loved her both for her own sake and that of her deceased mother came more often to mr goodman's than otherwise she would have done on purpose to observe the behaviour of miss betsy she had heard some accounts which gave her great dissatisfaction but as she was a woman of penetration she easily perceived that plain reproof was not the way to prevail on her to reclaim the errors of her conduct that she must be insensibly weaned from what at present she took so much delight in 
and brought into a different manner of living, by ways which should rather seem to flatter than check her vanity. She therefore earnestly wished to get her down with her into Livermore, where she was soon going herself, but knew not how to ask her without making the same invitation to Miss Flora, whose company she no way desired, and whose example she was sensible had very much contributed to give Miss Betsy that air of levity which rendered her good sense almost useless to her. This worthy lady, happening to find her alone one day, a thing not very usual, she asked, by way of sounding her inclination, if she would not be glad to see Livermore again, to which she replied that there were many people for whom she had a very great respect, but the journey was too long to be taken merely on the score of making a short visit, for she owned she did not like the country well enough to continue in it for any length of time. Lady Trusty would fain have persuaded her into a better opinion of the place she was born in, and which most of her family had passed the greatest part of their lives in. But Miss Betsy was not to be argued into any tolerable ideas of it, and plainly told her ladyship that what she called a happy, tranquil manner of spending one's day seemed to her little better than being buried alive. From declaring her aversion to a country life, she ran into such extravagant encomiums on those various amusements which London every day presented, that Lady Trusty perceived it would not be, without great difficulty, she would be brought to a more just way of thinking. She concealed, however, as much as possible, the concern it gave her to hear her express herself in this manner, contenting herself with saying calmly, that London was indeed a very agreeable place to live in, especially for young people, and the pleasures it afforded were very elegant. But then, said she, the too frequent repetition of them may so much engross the mind as to take it off from other objects which ought to have their share in it. Besides, continued she, there are but too frequent proofs that an innate principle of virtue is not always a sufficient guard against the many snares laid for it under the show of innocent pleasures by wicked and disingenuous persons of both sexes. Nor can be esteemed prudence to run oneself into dangers merely to show our strength in overcoming them. Nor, perhaps, would even the victory turn always to our glory. The world is censorious and seldom ready to put the best construction on things, so that reputation may suffer, though virtue triumphs. Miss Betsy listened to all this with a good deal of attention. The impudent attempt Galen had made on her came fresh into her mind and made this lady's remonstrances sink the deeper into it. The power of reflection being a little awakened in her, some freedoms also, not altogether consistent with strict modesty which others had offered to her, Convinced of the error of maintaining too little reserve, she thanked her kind adviser, and promised to observe the precept she had been given. Lady Trusty, finding this good effect of what she had said, ventured to proceed so far as to give some hints that the conduct of Miss Flora had been far from blameless. And therefore, pursued she, I should be glad, methinks, to see you separated from that young lady, though it were but for a small time, and then gave her to understand how great a pleasure it would be to her to get her down with her to live a more, if it could be any way contrived that she should go without Miss Flora. As I have been so long from home, said she, I know I shall have all the gentry round the country to welcome me at the return, and if you should find the company less polite than those you leave behind, it will at least diversify the scene, and render the entertainments of London new to you a second time when you come back. Miss Betsy found in herself a strong inclination to comply with this proposal, and told Lady Trusty she should think herself happy in passing the whole summer with her, and as to Miss Flora the same offer might be made to her without any danger of her accepting it. "'I am not of your opinion,' said the other. "'The girl has no fortune but what Mr. Goodman shall be pleased to give her, "'which cannot be very considerable. "'And he has a nephew in the East Indies, "'whom he is extremely fond of and will make his heir. 
Lady Mellison would therefore catch at the opportunity of sending her daughter to a place where there are so many gentlemen of estates, among whom she might have a better chance of getting a husband than she can have in London, where her character would scarce entitle her to such a hope. I will, however, persuaded she, run the risk, and chose rather to have a guest whose company I do not so well approve of than be deprived of one I so much value. Miss Betsy testified the sense she had of her ladyship's goodness, in the most grateful and obliging terms, and Lady Mellison and Miss Flora coming home soon after, Lady Trusty said she was come on purpose to ask permission for Miss Flora and Miss Betsy to pass two or three months with her down in Livermore. Lady Mellison, as the other had imagined, seemed extremely pleased with the invitation, and told her she did her daughter a great deal of honor, and she would take care things should be prepared for both the young ladies to attend her on her setting out. Lady Trusty then told her she had fixed the day for it, which was about a fortnight after this conversation. And some other matters relating to the journey being regulated took her leave, highly pleased with the thoughts of getting Miss Betsy a place where she should have an opportunity of using her utmost endeavors to improve the good she found in her disposition, and of weaning her by degrees from any ill habits she might have contracted in that babble of mixed company she was accustomed to at Lady Mellison's. End of Chapter 6 Reading by Joyce Martin Chapter 7 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1, by Eliza Haywood. Chapter 7 Is a medley of various particulars which pave the way for matters of more consequence. Miss Flora had now nothing in her head but the many hearts she expected to captivate, when she should arrive in L, and Lady Mellison, who soothed her in all her vanities, resolved to spare nothing which she imagined would contribute to that purpose. Miss Betsy, who had the same ambition, though for different ends, made it also pretty much her study to set off, to the best advantage, the charms she had received from nature. The important article of dress now engrossed the whole conversation of these ladies. The day after that in which Lady Trusty had made the invitation to the two young ones, Lady Mellison went with them to the Mercer's to buy some silks. She pitched on a very genteel new-fashioned pattern for her daughter, but chose one for Miss Betsy, which, though rich, seemed to her not well fancied. She testified her disapprobation, but Lady Mellison said so much in the praise of it, and the Mercer either to please her, or because he was desirous of getting it sold assured Miss Betsy that it was admired by everybody, that it was the newest thing that he had in his shop, and had already sold several pieces to ladies of the first quality. All this did not argue Miss Betsy into a liking of it, yet between them she was over-persuaded to have it. When these purchases were made, they went home, only stopped at the mantua-makers on their way, to order her to come that afternoon. Lady Mellison did no more than set them down, and then went on in the coach to make a visit. The young ladies fell to reviewing their silks, but Miss Betsy was no way satisfied with hers. The more she looked upon it, the worse it appeared to her. "'I shall never wear it with any pleasure,' said she. "'I wish the man had it in his shop again, for I think it quite ugly.' Miss Flora told her that she wondered at her, that the thing was perfectly handsome, and that my lady's judgment was never before called in question. "'That may be,' replied Miss Betsy, "'but certainly every one ought to please their own fancy in the choice of their clothes. For my part, I shall never endure to see myself in it, not when their fancy happens to differ from that of those who know better than themselves what is fit for them, cried Miss Flora, and besides have the power over them. She spoke this with so much pertinence that Miss Betsy, who had a violent spirit, was highly provoked. Power over them, cried she, I do not know what you mean, Miss Flora. Mr. Goodman is one of my guardians indeed, but I don't know why that should entitle his lady to direct me in what I shall wear. Mr. Goodman, who happened to be looking over some papers in a little closet he had within his parlour, hearing part of this dispute, and finding it was like to grow pretty warm, came out, in hopes of moderating it. 
on hearing miss betsy's complaint he desired to see the silk which being shown to him i do not pretend said he to much understanding in these things but methinks it is very handsome it would do well enough for winter sir replied miss betsy but it is too hot and heavy for summer besides it is so thick and clumsy it would make me look as big again as i am i'll not wear it i'm resolved in the country whatever i do when i come to town in the dark weather well said mr goodman i will speak to my lady to get it changed for something else indeed sir cried miss flora i am sure my mamma will do no such thing and take it very ill to hear it proposed you need not put yourself in any heat replied miss betsy i don't desire she should be troubled any farther about it but sir continued she turning to mr goodman i think i am now at an age capable of choosing for myself in the article of dress and as it has been settled between you and sir ralph trusty that out of the income of my fortune thirty pounds a year should be allowed for my board twenty pounds for my pocket expenses and fifty for my clothes i think i ought to have the two latter entirely at my own disposal and to lay it out as I think fit, and not be obliged, like a charity child, to wear whatever livery my benefactor shall be pleased to order. She spoke this with so much spleen, that Mr. Goodman was a little nettled at it, and told her that what his wife had done was out of kindness and good will, which, since she did not take it as it was meant, she should have her money to do with as she would. "'That is all I desire,' answered she. "'Therefore be pleased to let me have twenty guineas now.' or if there does not remain so much in your hands i will ask sir ralph to advance it and you may return it to him when you settle accounts no no cried the merchant hastily i see no reason to trouble my good friend sir ralph on such a frivolous matter you shall have the sum you mentioned miss betsy whether so much remains out of the hundred pounds a year set apart for your subsistence or not as i can but deduct it out of the next payment but I would have you manage with discretion, for you may depend that the surplus of what was at first agreed upon shall not be broken into, but laid up to increase your fortune, which, by the time you come of age, I hope, will be pretty handsomely improved. Miss Betsy then assured him that she doubted not of his zeal for her interest, and hoped she had not offended him in anything she had said. No, no, replied he, I always make allowances for the little impatiencies of persons of your sex and age, especially when dress is concerned. In speaking these words he opened his bureau, and took out twenty guineas, which he immediately gave her, making her first sign a memorandum of it. Miss Flora was all on fire to have offered something in opposition to this, but durst not do it, and the mantua-maker that instant coming, she went upstairs with her into her chamber, leaving Miss Betsy and Mr. Goodman together, the former of whom, being eager to go about what she intended, ordered a hackney-coach to be called, and taking the silk with her, went directly to the shop where it was bought. The mercer at first seemed unwilling to take it again, but on her telling him she would always make use of him for everything she wanted in his way, and would then buy two suits of him, he at last consented. As she was extremely curious in everything relating to her shape, she made choice of a pink-coloured French lustring, to the end that the plates lying flat would show the beauty of her waist to more advantage, and to atone for the slightness of the silk, purchased as much of it as would flounce the sleeves and the petticoat from top to bottom. She made the mercer also cut off a sufficient quantity of a rich green Venetian satin to make her a riding habit, and as she came home bought a silver trimming for it of point d'Espagne, all which, with the silk she disliked in exchange, did not amount to the money she had received from Mr. Goodman. On her return she asked the footman, who opened the door, if the mantua-maker was gone, but he, not being able to inform her, she ran hastily upstairs to Miss Flora's chamber which indeed was also her own, for they lay together. She was about to bounce in, but found the door was locked, and the key taken out on the inside. This very much surprised her, especially as she had thought she had heard Miss Flora's voice as she was at the top of the staircase. Wanting, therefore, to be satisfied who was with her, she went as softly as she could into Lady Mellison's dressing-room, which was parted from the chamber but by a slight wainscot. She put her ear close to the panel in order to discover the voices of them that spoke and finding, by some light that came through a crack or flaw in the boards, her eyes, as well as ears, contributed to a discovery she little expected. In fine, she plainly perceived Miss Flora and a man rise off the bed. She could not at first discern who he was, but on his returning to go out of the room, knew him to be no other than Galand. They went out of the chamber together, as gently as they could, and though Miss Betsy might, by taking three steps, have met them in the passage, and have had an opportunity of revenging herself on Miss Flora for the late airs she had given herself, 
by showing how near she was to the scene of infamy she had been acting, yet the shock she felt herself on being witness of it kept her immovable for some time, and she suffered them to depart without the mortification of thinking any one knew of their being together in the manner they were. This young lady, who though, as I have already taken notice, was of too volatile and gay a disposition, hated anything that had the least tincture of indecency, was so much disconcerted at the discovery she had made that she had not power to stir from the place she was in, much less to resolve how to behave in this affair. That is, whether it would be best or not to let Miss Flora know she was in the secret of her shame, or to suffer her to think herself secure. She was, however, beginning to meditate on this point, when she heard Miss Flora come up the stairs, calling at every step, "'Miss Betsy, Miss Betsy, where are you?' Galen was gone, and his young mistress, being told Miss Betsy was coming home, guessed it was she who had given an interruption to their pleasures by coming to the door. She, therefore, as she could not imagine her so perfectly convinced, contrived to disguise the whole and worst of the truth by revealing a part of it, and as soon as she had found her. "'Lord, Miss Betsy,' cried she, with an unparalleled assurance, "'where have you been? How do you think I have been served by that cursed toad Galen? He came up into our chamber, where the mantua-maker and I were, and as soon as she was gone, locked the door, and began to kiss and tease me so, that I protest I was affrighted almost out of my wits. The devil meant no harm, though, I believe, for I got rid of him easy enough, but I wish you had rapped hardly at the door, and obliged him to open it, that we both might have rated him for his impudence.' "'Some people have a great deal of impudence, indeed,' replied Miss Betsy, astonished at her manner of bearing it off. "'Aye, so they have, my dear,' rejoined the other, with a careless air. "'But, prithee, where have you been rambling by yourself?' "'No farther than Bedford Street,' answered Miss Betsy. "'You may see on what errand,' continued she, pointing to the silks which she had laid down on a chair. Miss Flora presently ran to the bundle, examined what it contained, and either being in a better humour, or affecting to be so, than when they talked on this head in the parlour, testified no disapprobation of what she had done, but on the contrary talked to her in such soft obliging terms that Miss Betsy, who had a great deal of good nature, when not provoked by anything that seemed an affront to herself, could not find in her heart to say anything to give her confusion. When Lady Mellison came home, and was informed how Miss Betsy had behaved in relation to the silk, she at first put on an air full of resentment, but finding the other wanted neither wit nor spirit to defend her own cause, and not caring to break with her, especially as her daughter was going with her to L, soon grew more moderate, and at length affected to think no more of it. Certain it is, however, that this affair, silly as it was, and as one would think insignificant in itself, lay broiling in the minds of both mother and daughter and they waited only for an opportunity of venting their spite in such a manner as should not make them appear to have the least tincture of so foul and mean a passion. But as neither of them were capable of a sincere friendship, and had no real regard for any one besides themselves, their displeasure was of little consequence. Preparations for the journey of the young ladies seemed for the present to employ all their thoughts, and diligence enough was used to get everything ready against the time prefixed which wanted but three days of being expired when an unforeseen accident put an entire stop to it miss betsy received a letter from her brother mr francis thoughtless accompanied with another to mr goodman acquainting them that he had obtained leave from the head of the college to pass a month in london that he should set out from oxford in two days and hoped to enjoy the satisfaction of being with them in twelve hours after this letter what could she now do it would have been a sin not only against natural affection, but against the rules of common good manners, to have left the town either on the news of his arrival or immediately after it, nor could Lady Trusty expect or desire she should entertain a thought of doing so. She was too wise and too good not to consider the interest of families very much depended on the strict union among the branches of it, and that the natural affection between brothers and sisters could not be too much cultivated. Far, therefore, from insisting on the promise Miss Betsy had made of going with her into the country, she congratulated her on the happy disappointment, and told her that she should receive her with a double satisfaction if, after Mr. Francis returned to Oxford, she would come and pass what then remained of the summer season with her. This Miss Betsy assured her ladyship she would do, so that according to all appearance the benefits she might have received, by being under the eye of so excellent an instructress, were but delayed, not lost. End of chapter 7
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1, by Eliza Haywood. Chapter 8 relates how, by a concurrence of odd circumstances, Miss Betsy was brought pretty near the crisis of her fate, and the means by which she escaped. Mr. Francis Thoughtless arrived in town the very evening before the day in which Sir Ralph Trusty and his lady were to set out for L. They had not seen this young gentleman since the melancholy occasion of his father's funeral, and would have been glad to have spent some time with him, but could no way put off their journey, as word was sent of the day in which they were expected to be at home. Sir Ralph knew very well that a great number of his tenants and friends would meet him on the road, and a letter would not reach them soon enough to prevent them from being disappointed. They supped with him, however, at Mr. Goodman's, who would not permit him to have any other home than his house during his stay in town. Lady Trusty, on taking leave of Miss Betsy, said to her she hoped she would remember her promise when her brother was returned to Oxford, on which she replied that she could not be so much an enemy to her own happiness as to fail. Miss Betsy and this brother had been always extremely fond of each other, and the length of time they had been asunder, and the improvement which at that time had made in both, heightened their mutual satisfaction in meeting. All that troubled Miss Betsy now was that her brother happened to come to London at a season of the year in which he could not receive the least satisfaction. The king was gone to Hanover, the foreign ministers and great part of the nobility attended him, and the rest were retired to their country seats so that an entire stop was put to all public diversions worth seeing. There were no plays, no operas, no masquerades, no balls, no public shows, except at the little theatre in the Haymarket, then known by the name of F.'s Scandal Shop, because he frequently exhibited there certain drolls, or more properly invectives, against the ministry, in doing which it appears extremely probable that he had two views, the one to get money, which he very much wanted, from such as delighted in low humour, and could not distinguish true satire from scurrility, and the other in the hope of having some post given him by those whom he abused, in order to silence his dramatic talent. But it is not my business to point out either the merit of that gentleman's performances or the motives he had for writing them, as the town is perfectly acquainted both with his abilities and success, and has since seen him with astonishment wriggle himself into favour by pretending to cajole those he had not the power to intimidate. But though there were none of the diversions I have mentioned, nor Ranala at that time thought of, nor Vauxhall, Marlebone, nor Cooper's Garden, in the repute they since have been, the young gentleman found sufficient to entertain him, empty as the town was. Lady Mellison was not without company, who made frequent parties of pleasure, and when nothing else was to be found for recreation, cards filled up the void. Nothing material enough to be inserted in this history happened to Miss Betsy during the time her brother stayed, till one evening, as the family were fitting together, some discourse concerning Oxford coming on the tapis, Mr. Francis spoke so largely in the praise of the wholesomeness of the air, the many fine walks and gardens with which the place abounded, and the good company which were continually resorting to it, that Miss Betsy cried out she longed to see it. Miss Flora said the same. On this the young gentleman gave them an invitation to go down with him when he went, saying they could never go at a better time as both the assizes and races were to be in about a month. Miss Betsy said such a jaunt would vastly delight her. Miss Flora echoed her approbation, and added she wished my lady would consent. "'I have no objection to make to it,' replied Lady Mellison, "'as you will have a conductor, who I know will be very careful of you.' Mr. Goodman's consent was also asked for the sake of form, though every one knew the opinion of his wife was of itself a sufficient sanction." though it is highly probable that Miss Betsy was much better pleased with this journey than she would have been with that to L. Yet she thought herself obliged, both in gratitude and good manners, to write to Lady Trusty and make the best excuse she could for her breach of promise, which she did in these terms. To Lady Trusty, most dear and honoured madam, my brother Frank, being extremely desirous of showing Miss Flora and myself the curiosities of Oxford, has obtained leave from Mr. Goodman and Lady Mellison for us to accompany him to that place. I am afraid the season will be too far advanced for us to take a journey to L at our return. Therefore, flatter myself, your ladyship will pardon the indispensable necessity I am under of deferring, till next spring, the happiness I proposed in waiting on you. All here present my worthy guardian and your ladyship with their best respects. 
I beg mine may be equally acceptable, and that you will always continue to favour with your good wishes her who is, with the most perfect esteem, Madam, your ladyship's most obliged and most obedient servant, E. Thoughtless. The time for the young gentleman's departure being arrived, they went together in the stage, attended by a footman of Mr. Goodman's, whom Lady Mellison would needs send with them in order to give the young ladies an air of dignity. They found on their arrival, at that justly celebrated seat of learning, that Mr. Francis had given no greater eulogiums on it than it merited. They were charmed with the fine library, the museum, the magnificence of the halls belonging to the several colleges, the physic garden, and other curious walks. But that, which above all the rest gave the most satisfaction to Miss Betsy, as well as to her companion, was that respectful gallantry with which they found themselves treated by the gentlemen of the university. Mr. Francis was extremely beloved amongst them, on account of his affability, politeness, and good humour, and they seemed glad of an opportunity of showing the regard they had for the brother by paying all manner of civilities to the sister. He gave the ladies an elegant entertainment at his own rooms, to which also some of those with whom he was the most intimate were invited. All these thought themselves bound to return the fame compliment. The company of every one present were desired at their respective apartments, and as each of these gentlemen had besides other particular friends of their own whom they wished to oblige, the number of guests were still increased at every feast. By this means Miss Betsy and Miss Flora soon acquired a very large acquaintance, and as through the care of Mr. Francis, they were lodged in one of the best and most reputable houses in town. Their families known, and themselves were young ladies who knew how to behave as well as dress, and receive company in the most elegant and polite manner. Every one was proud of a pretense for visiting them. The respect paid to them would doubtless have every day increased during the whole time they should have thought of proper to continue in Oxford, and on quitting it have left behind them the highest idea of their merit, if by one inconsiderate action they had not at once forfeited the esteem they had gained, and rendered themselves the subjects of ridicule even to those who before had regarded them with veneration. They were walking out one day about an hour or two before the time in which they usually dined, into the park, where they were met by a gentleman commoner and a young student, both of whom they had been in company with at most of the entertainments before mentioned. The Sparks begged leave to attend them, which was readily granted. They walked all together for some time. But the weather, being very warm, the gentleman commoner took an occasion to remind the ladies how much their beauties would be in danger of suffering from the immoderate rays of Phoebus, and proposed going to some gardens full of the most beautiful alcoves and arbors, so shaded over that the sun, even in his meridian force, could at the most but glimmer through the delightful gloom. He painted the pleasures of the place, to which he was desirous of leading them, with so romantic an energy, that they immediately, and without the least scruple or hesitation, consented to be conducted thither. This was a condescension which he who asked it scarce expected would be granted, and on finding it so easily obtained, began to form some conjectures no way to the advantage of those ladies' reputations. It is certain, indeed, that as he professed a friendship for the brother, he ought not in strict honour to have proposed anything to the sister, which would be unbecoming her to agree to. But he was young, gay to an excess, and in what he said or did took not always consideration for his guide. They went on laughing till they came to the place he mentioned, where the gentlemen, having showed their fair companions into the gardens, in which were indeed several recesses, no less dark than had been described. On entering one of them Miss Betsy cried, "'Bless me! This is fit for nothing but for people to do what they are ashamed of in the light.' "'The fitter, then, madam,' replied the gentleman commoner, "'to encourage a lover, who perhaps has suffered more through his own timidity than the cruelty of the object he adores.' He accompanied these words with a seizure of both her hands and two or three kisses on her lips. The young student was no less free with Miss Flora, but neither of these ladies gave themselves the trouble to reflect what consequences might possibly attend a prelude of this nature, and repulsed the liberties they took in such a manner as made the offenders imagine they had not sinned beyond a pardon. They would not, however, be prevailed on to stay or even to sit down in that darksome recess, but went into a house where they were shown into a very pleasant room, which commanded the whole prospect of the garden and was sufficiently shaded from the sun by jessamine and honeysuckles, which grew against the walls. Here wine, cakes, jellies, and such like things being brought, the conversation was extremely lively, and full of gallantry, without the least mixture of indecency. The gentlemen exerted all their wit and eloquence to persuade the ladies not to go home in the heat of the day, but take up such entertainment as the place they were in was able to present them with. 
neither of them made any objection except that having said they should dine at home the family would wait in expectation of their coming but this difficulty was easily got over the footman who had attended miss betsy and miss flora in their morning's walk was in the house and might be sent to acquaint the people that they were not to expect them as they were neither displeased with the company nor place they were in they needed not abundance of persuasions and the servant was immediately dispatched the gentleman went out of the room to give orders for having something prepared but stayed not two minutes and on their return omitted nothing that might keep the good humour and sprightliness of their fair companions persons of so gay and volatile a disposition as these four could not content themselves with sitting still and barely talking every limb must be in motion every faculty employed the gentleman commoner took miss betsy's hand and led her some steps of a minuet then fell into a rigadoon then into the louvre and so ran through all the school dances without regularly beginning or ending any one of them, or of the tunes he sung. The young student was not less alert with Miss Flora, so that between singing, dancing, and laughing they all grew extremely warm. Miss Betsy ran to a window to take breath and get a little air. Her partner followed, and taking up her fan which lay on a table, employed it with a great deal of dexterity to assist the wind that came in at the casement for her refreshment. Heaven, cried he, how divinely lovely do you now appear, the goddess of the spring, nor Venus's self was ever painted half so beautiful. What eyes, what a mouth, and what a shape, continued he, surveying her, as it were, from head to foot. How exquisitely turned, how taper, how slender, I don't believe you measure half a yard round the waist. In speaking these words he put his handkerchief around her waist, after which he tied it round his head, repeating these lines of Mr. Waller's. That which her slender waist can find shall now my joyful temples bind. No monarch but would give his crown, his arms might do what this has done. Oh, fie upon it, said Miss Betsy, laughing and snatching it from his head. This poetry is stale. I should rather have expected from an Oxonian some fine thing of his own extempore, on this occasion which perhaps I might have been vain enough to have got printed in the monthly magazines. Ah! Madam, replied he, looking on her with dying languishments, where the heart is deeply affected, the brain seldom produces anything but incongruous ideas. Had Saccharissa been mistress of the charms you are, or had Waller loved like me, he had been less capable of writing in the manner he did. The student, perceiving his friend was entering into a particular conversation with Miss Betsy, found means to draw Miss Flora out of the room, and left them together though this young lady afterwards protested she called to miss betsy to follow but if she did it was in such a low voice that the others did not hear her and continued her pleasantry rallying the gentleman commoner on everything he said till he finding the opportunity he had of being revenged soon turned his humble adoration into an air more free and natural to him as she was opening her mouth to utter some sarcasm or other he catched her in his arms and began to kiss her with so much warm and eagerness that surprised her she struggled to get loose, and called Miss Flora, not knowing she was gone, to come to her assistance. The efforts she made at first to oblige him to desist were not, however, quite so strenuous as they ought to have been on such an occasion, but finding he was about to proceed to greater liberties than any man before had ever taken with her, she collected all her strength and broke from him, when looking around the room and seeing nobody there. "'Bless me!' cried she. "'What is the meaning of all this? Where are our friends?' They are gone, said he, to pay the debt which love and youth and beauty challenge. Let us not be remiss, nor waste the precious moments in idle scruples. Come, my angel, pursued he, endeavouring to get her once more into his arms, make me the happiest of mankind, and be as divinely good as you are fair. I do not understand you, sir, replied she, but neither desire nor will stay to hear an explanation. She spoke this with somewhat of an haughty air, and was making towards the door, but he was far from being intimidated, and instead of suffering her to pass, he seized her a little roughly with one hand, and with the other made fast the door. "'Come, come, my dear creature,' cried he, "'no more resistance. You see you are in my power, and the very name of being so is sufficient to absolve you to yourself, for any act of kindness you may bestow upon me. Be generous, then, and be sure it shall be an inviolable secret.' She was about to say something, but he stopped her mouth with kisses, and forced her to sit down in a chair where holding her fast, her ruin had certainly been completed, if a loud knocking at the door had not prevented him from prosecuting his design. This was the brother of Miss Betsy, who, having been at her lodgings, on his coming from thence met the footman, who had been sent to acquaint the family the ladies would not dine at home. He asked where his sister was, 
and the fellow, having told him, came directly to the place. A waiter of the house showed him to the room. On finding it locked he was strangely amazed, and both knocked and called to have it opened, with a good deal of vehemence. The gentleman commoner, knowing his voice, was shocked to the last degree, but quitted that instant his intended prey, and let him enter. Mr. Francis, on coming in, knew not what to think. He saw the gentleman in great disorder, and his sister in much more. "'What is the meaning of this?' said he. "'Sister, how came you here?' "'Ask me no questions at present,' replied she, scarce able to speak. So strangely had her late fright seized on her spirits. "'But see me safe from this cursed house, and that worst of men.' Her speaking in this manner made Mr. Francis apprehend the whole, and perhaps more, than the truth. "'How, sir,' said he, darting a furious look at the gentleman commoner, "'what is it I hear? Have you dared to—' "'Whatever I have dared to,' interrupted the other, "'I am capable of defending.' "'Tis well,' rejoined the brother of Miss Betsy. "'Perhaps I may put you to the trial, but this is not a time or place.' He then took hold of his sister's hand and led her downstairs. As they were going out— Miss Betsy stopping a little to adjust her dress, which was strangely disordered, she bethought herself of Miss Flora, who, though she was very angry with, she did not choose to leave behind at the mercy of such rakes, as she had reason to think those were whom she had been in company with. Just as she was desiring her brother to send a waiter in search of that young lady, they saw her coming out of the garden, led by the young student, who, as soon as he beheld Mr. Francis, cried, "'Ha! Frank! How came you here? You look out of humour!' "'How I came here it matters not,' replied he, sullenly, "'and as to my being out of humour, perhaps you may know better than I yet do what cause I have for being so.' He waited for no answer to these words, but conducted his sister out of the house as hastily as he could. Miss Flora followed, after having taken leave of her companion, in what manner she thought proper. On their coming home, Miss Betsy related to her brother, as far as her modesty would permit, all the particulars of the adventure, and ended with saying, that sure it was heaven alone that gave her strength to prevent the perpetration of the villain's intentions. Mr. Francis, all the time she was speaking, bit his lips, and showed great tokens of an extraordinary disturbance in his mind, but offered not the least interruption. When he perceived she had done, "'Well, sister,' said he, "'I shall hear what he has to say, and will endeavour to oblige him to ask your pardon.' and soon after took his leave. Miss Betsy did not very well comprehend his meaning in these words, and was, indeed, still in too much confusion to consider on anything, but what the consequences were of this transaction the reader will presently be informed of. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of the History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joyce Martin. The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One by Eliza Haywood. Chapter Nine contained such things as might be reasonably expected after the preceding adventure. When, in anything irregular, and liable to censure, more persons than one are concerned, how natural is it for each to accuse the other, and it often happens, in this case, that the greatest part of the blame falls on the least culpable. After Mr. Francis had left the ladies, in order to be more fully convinced in the matter, and to take such measures as he thought would best become him for the reparation of the affront offered the honour of his family, Miss Flora began to reproach Miss Betsy for having related anything of what had passed to her brother. "'By your own account,' she said, "'no harm was done to you, but some people love to make a bustle about nothing.' "'And some people,' replied Miss Betsy tartly, "'love nothing but the gratification of their own passions, "'and having no sense of virtue and modesty themselves "'can have no regard to that of another.' "'What do you mean, Miss?' cried the other with a pert air. "'My meaning is pretty plain,' rejoined Miss Betsy. "'But since you affect so much ignorance, I must tell you, that the expectations of a second edition of the same work Mr. Galen had helped you to compose, though from another quarter, tempted you to sneak out of the room and leave your friend in danger of falling a sacrifice to what her soul most detests and scorns. 
these words stung miss flora to the quick her face was in an instant covered with a scarlet blush and every feature betrayed the confusion of her mind but recovering herself from it much sooner than most others her age could have done good lack cried she i fancy you are setting up for a prude but pray how came mr galland into your head what because i told you he innocently romped with me one day in the chamber are you so censorious as to infer anything criminal passed between us whatever i infer replied miss betsy disdainfully i have better vouchers for the truth of than your report and would advise you when you go home to get the chink in the panel of the wainscot of my lady's dressing-room stopped up or your next rendezvous with that gentleman may possibly have witnesses of more ill nature than myself that can scarcely be said miss flora ready to burst with vexation but don't think i value your little malice you are only angry because he slighted the advances you made him and took all opportunities to show how much his heart and judgment gave the preference to me these words so picked the vanity of miss betsy that not able to bear she should continue in the imagination of being better liked than herself though even by the man she hated told her the solicitations he had made to her, the letter she had received of him, and the rebuff she had given him upon it. So that, pursued she, it was not till after he found there was no hope of gaining me that he carried his desires to you. Miss Flora was more nettled at this than she was at the discovery she now perceived the other had made of her intrigue. She pretended, however, not to believe a word of what she had said, but willing to evade all further discourse on that head, returned to the adventure they had just gone through with the Oxonians. Never expect, said she, to pass it upon any one of common sense, that if you had not a mind to have been alone with that terrible man, as you now describe him, you would have stayed in the room after I was gone, and called to you to follow. It was in vain that Miss Betsy denied she had either heard her speak or knew anything of her departure till some time after she was gone, and the gentleman commoner began to use her with such familiarities as convinced her he was sensible no witnesses were present. This, though no more than truth, was of no consequence to her justification, to one determined to believe the worst, or at least seemed to do so. Miss Flora treated with contempt all she said on this score, derided her imprecations, and, to mortify her the more, said to her in a taunting manner, "'Come, come, Miss Betsy, tis a folly to think to impose upon the world by such shallow artifices. What your inclinations are is evident enough, any one may see, that if it had not been for your brother's unseasonable interruption, nobody would ever have heard a word of these insults you now so heavily complain of. Poor Miss Betsy could not refrain from letting fall some tears at so unjust and cruel an innuendo. But the greatness of her spirit enabled her in a few moments to overcome the shock it had given her. She returned reproaches with reproaches, and as she had infinitely more of truth and reason on her side, had also much the better in this combat of tongues. Nevertheless, the other would not give out. She upbraided and exaggerated with the utmost malicious comments on every little indiscretion Miss Betsy had been guilty of, repeated every censor which she had heard the ill-natured part of the world pass upon her conduct, and added many more, the invention of her own fertile brain. Some ladies they had made acquaintance with in town coming to visit them put an end to the debate, but neither being able presently to forget the bitter reflections cast on her by the other, both remained extremely sullen the whole night, and their mutual ill-humor might possibly have lasted much longer, but for an accident more material which took off their attention, as it might have produced much worse consequences than any quarrel between themselves could be attended with. It happened in this manner. The brother of Miss Betsy was of a fiery disposition, and though those who were entrusted with the care of his education were not wanting in their pains to correct this propensity, which they thought would be the more unbecoming in him, as he was intended for the pulpit, yet did not their endeavors for that purpose meet with all the success they wished. Nature may be moderated, but never can be wholly changed. 
the seeds of wrath still remained in his soul nor could the rudiments that had been given him be sufficient to hinder them from springing into action when urged by any provocation the treatment his sister had received from the gentleman commoner seemed to him so justifiable a one that he thought he ought not without great submissions on the part of the transgressor be prevailed upon to put up with it the first step he took was to sound the young student as to what he knew relating to the affair who freely told him as miss betsy herself had done where they met the ladies and the manner in which they went into the house protesting that neither himself nor according to the best of his belief the gentleman commoner had at that time any designs in view but mere complacence and gallantry how then came you to separate yourselves cried mr francis with some earnestness that also is accidental replied the other your sister's companion telling me she liked the garden better than the room we were in i thought i could do no less than attend her thither i confess i did not consult whether those we left behind had any inclination to follow us or not the air with which he spoke of this part of the adventure had something in it which did not give mr francis the most favourable idea of miss flora's conduct but that not much conquering him and finding nothing wherewith he could justly reproach the student he soon after quitted him and went to the gentleman commoner having been told he might find him in his rooms had any one been witness of the manner in which these two accosted each other they would not have been at a loss to guess what would ensue the brother of miss betsy came with a mind full of resentment and determined to repair the affront that had been offered to him in the person of a sister who was very dear to him by calling the other to a severe account for what he had done the gentleman commoner was descended of a noble family and had an estate to support the dignity of his birth and was too much puffed up and insolent on the smiles of fortune he was conscious the affront he had given demanded satisfaction and neither doubted of the errand on which mr francis was come nor wondered at it but could not bring himself to acknowledge he had done amiss nor think of making any excuse for his behaviour guilt in a proud heart is generally accompanied with a sullen obstinacy for as the poet says forgiveness to the injured does belong but they ne'er pardon who have done the wrong he therefore received the interrogatories mr francis was beginning to make with an air rather indignant than complying which the other not being able to brook such hot words arose between them as could not but occasion a challenge which was given by mr francis the appointment to meet was the next morning at six o'clock and the place that very field in which the gentleman commoner and his friend had so unluckily happened to meet the ladies in their morning walk neither of them wanted courage nor communicated their rendezvous to any one person in hopes of being disappointed without danger of their honour but each being equally animated with the ambition of humbling the arrogance of the other both were secret as to the business and no less punctual as to the time the agreement between them was sword and pistol which both having provided themselves with they no sooner came within a proper distance than they discharged at one another the first course of this fatal entertainment that of the gentleman commoner was so well aimed that one of the bullets lodged in the shoulder and the other grazing on the fleshy part of the arm of his antagonist put him into a great deal of pain but these wounds rather increased than diminished the fury he was possessed of he instantly drew his sword and ran at the other with so well directed a force that his weapon entered three inches deep into the right side of the gentleman commoner both of them received several other hurts yet both still continued to fight with equal vehemence nor would either of them in all probability have receded till one or the other of them had lain dead upon the place if some countrymen who by accident were passing that way had not with their clubs beat down the swords of both and carried the owners of them by mere force into the village they were going to where they were no sooner entered than several people who knew them seeing them pass by in this manner covered all over with their own blood and guarded by a pack of rustics ran out to inquire what had happened which being informed of they took them out of the hands of these men and provided proper apartments for them 
By this time they were both extremely faint through the anguish of their wounds and the great effusion of blood that had issued from them. Surgeons were immediately sent for who, in examining their hurts, pronounced none of them to be mortal, yet such as would require some time for cure. Mr. Francis suffered extreme torture in having the bullet extracted from his shoulder, yet notwithstanding that and the weak condition he was in, he made a servant support him in his bed while he scrawled out these few lines to his sister, which as soon as finished were carried to her by the same person. To Miss Betsy Thoughtless, my dear sister, I have endangered my life, and am now confined to my bed by the wounds I have received in endeavouring to revenge your quarrel. Do not think I tell you this by way of reproach, for I assure you, would the circumstance of the affair have permitted it to have been concealed, you never should have known it. I should be glad to see you, but think it not proper that you should come to me, till I hear what is said concerning this matter, I shall send to you every day, and that you will be perfectly easy is the earnest request of, dear Betsy, your most affectionate brother, and humble servant, F. Thoughtless. The young ladies were that morning at breakfast in the parlour, with the gentlewoman of the house, when the maid came running in and told her mistress she had heard in a shop where she had been, of a sad accident that had just happened. Two gentlemen, cried she, of the university have been fighting and almost killed one another, and they say, continued she, it was about a young lady that one of them attempted to ravish. Miss Betsy and Miss Flora at this intelligence looked at each other with a good deal of confusion, already beginning to suspect who the persons were and how deeply themselves, one of them especially, was interested in this misfortune. The gentlewoman asked her servant if she knew the names of those who fought. No, madam, answered she, I could not learn that as yet, but the people in the street are all talking of it, and I doubt not, but I shall hear the whole story the next time I go out. The good gentlewoman, little imagining how much her guests were concerned in what she spoke, could not now forbear lamenting the ungovernableness of youth, the heedless levities of the one sex, and the mad brain passions of the other. The persons on whom she directed this discourse would not at another time have given much ear to it, or perhaps have replied to it with raillery, but the occasion of it now put both of them in too serious a temper to offer any interruption. And she was still going on, inveighing against the follies and vices of the age, when Miss Betsy received the above letter from her brother, which confirmed all those alarming conjectures the maid's report raised in her mind. The mistress of the house, perceiving the young man who brought the letter, came upon business to the ladies, had the good manners to leave the room that they might talk with the greater freedom. Miss Betsy asked a thousand questions, but he was unable to inform her of no farther particulars than what the letter contained. The moment he was gone, she ran up to her chamber, threw herself upon the bed, and in a flood of tears gave loose to the most poignant vexation she had ever yet experienced. Miss Flora followed, and seeing her in this condition, thought she could do no less in decency than contribute everything in her power for her consolation. By the behavior of this young lady in other respects, however, the reader will easily perceive it was more through policy than real good nature she treated her afflicted companion with the tenderness she did now. She knew that it was not by an open quarrel with Miss Betsy she could wreck any part of the spite she had conceived against her, and was therefore glad to lay hold of this opportunity to be reconciled. "'I was afraid, my dear,' said she, that it would come to this, and that put me in so great a passion with you yesterday for telling Mr. Francis anything of the matter. The men are such creatures that there is no trusting them with anything. But come, continued she, kissing her cheek, don't grieve and torment yourself in this matter. You find there is no danger of death on either side, and as for the rest, it will all blow off in time. Miss Betsy said little to this. The sudden passion of her soul must have its vent. But when that was over, she began to listen to the voice of comfort, and, by degrees, to resume her natural vivacity, not foreseeing that this unhappy adventure would lay her under mortifications which to a person of her spirit were very difficult to be borne.
End of chapter 9 Reading by Joyce Martin Chapter 10 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1, by Eliza Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. Gives the Catastrophe of the Oxford Ramble, and in what manner the young ladies returned to London. If the wounds Mr. Francis had received had been all the misfortune attending Miss Betsy in this adventure, it is probable that as she every day heard he was in a fair way of recovery, the first gust of passion would have been all she had sustained. But she soon found other consequences arising from it, which were no less afflicting and more galling to her pride. The quarrel between the two young gentlemen, and the occasion of it, was presently blazed over the whole town. It spread like wildfire. Every one made their several comments upon it, and few there were who endeavored to find any excuse for the share Miss Betsy and Miss Flora had in it. The ladies of Oxford are commonly more than ordinarily circumspect in their behavior, as indeed it behooves them to be, in a place where there are such a number of young gentlemen many of whom pursue pleasure more than study, and scruple nothing for the gratification of their desires. It is not, therefore, to be wondered at, that being from their infancy trained up in the most strict reserve, and accustomed to be upon their guard against even the most distant approaches of the other sex, they should be apt to pass the severest censures on a conduct, which they had been always taught to look upon as a sure destruction of reputation, and frequently fatal to innocence and virtue. This being pretty generally the characteristic of those ladies, who are of any distinction in Oxford, Miss Betsy and Miss Flora immediately found that while they continued there, they must either be content to sit at home alone, or converse only with such as were as disagreeable to them, as they had now rendered themselves to those of a more unblemished fame. They had received several visits, all of which they had not yet had time or leisure to return, but now going to pay the debt which complaisance demanded from them, they were denied access at every place they went to. All the persons were either abroad or indisposed, but the manner in which these answers were given easily convinced Miss Betsy and Miss Flora that they were no more than mere pretenses to avoid seeing them. In the public walks, and in passing through the streets, they saw themselves shunned even to a degree of rudeness. Those of their acquaintance, who they were obliged to meet them, looked another way, and went hastily on without vouchsafing a salute. This was the treatment their late unhappy adventure drew on them, from those of their own sex, nor did those of the others seem to behave to them with greater tenderness or respect, especially the younger students, who all having got the story thought they had a fine opportunity of exercising their poetic talents. Satires and lampoons flew about like hail. Many of these anonymous compositions were directed to Miss Betsy, and thrown over the rails into the area of the house where she lodged. Others were sung under the windows by persons in disguise, and copies of them handed about throughout the whole town, to the great propagation of scandal and the sneering faculty. Never, certainly did pride and vanity meet with a more severe humiliation, than what these witticisms inflicted on those, who by their inconsiderate behavior had laid themselves open to them. Neither the assurance of Miss Flora, nor the great spirit of Miss Betsy, could enable them to stand the shock of those continual affronts which every day presented them with. They dreaded to expose themselves to fresh insults, if they stirred out of the doors, and at home they were persecuted with the unwearied remonstrances of their grave landlady, so that their condition was truly pitiable. Both of them were equally impatient to get out of a place where they found their company was held in so little estimation. But Miss Betsy thought her brother would not take it well should she go to London and leave him in the condition he then was. Miss Flora's importunities, however, joined to the new occasion she every day had for increasing her discontent on staying, got the better of her apprehension, and she wrote to her brother in the following terms. To Mr. Francis Thoughtless dear brother 
though i am not to my great affliction permitted to see you or offer that assistance which might be expected from a sister in your present situation yet i cannot without the extremest regret resolve to quit oxford before you are perfectly recovered of those hurts you have received on my account however as by your judging it is proper for me to come to you i cannot suppose you are wholly unacquainted with the severe usage lately given me and must look on every affront offered to me as an indignity to you i am apt to flatter myself you will not be offended that i wish to remove from a place where innocence is no defence against scandal and the show of virtue more considered than reality nevertheless i shall determine nothing till i hear your sentiments which if i find conformable to mine shall set out for london with all possible expedition i would very fain see you before i go and if you consent will come to you so muffled up as not to be known by any who may happen to meet me i shall expect your answer with the utmost impatience being my dear brother by friendship as well as blood most affectionately yours e thoughtless when this letter was dispatched, Miss Flora made use of all the arguments she was mistress of, in order to persuade Miss Betsy to go for London, even in case her brother should not be altogether so willing for it, as she wished he would. Miss Betsy, though no less eager than herself to be out of a place she now so much detested, would not be prevailed upon to promise anything on this score but persisted in her resolution of being wholly directed how to proceed by the answer she should receive from mr francis miss flora was so fretted at this perverseness as she called it that she told her in a very great pet that she might stay if she pleased and be the laughing-stock of the town but for her own part she had more spirit and would be gone the next day miss betsy coolly replied that if she thought proper to do so she would doubtless at liberty but believe mr goodman and even lady mellison herself would look on such a behaviour as neither consistent with generosity or common good manners it is indeed scarce probable that the other had the least intention to do as she had said though she still continued to threaten it in the most positive and peremptory terms and this if we consider the temper of both these young ladies we may reasonably suppose might have occasioned a second quarrel between them if the servant whom mr francis always sent to his sister had not that instant come in and put an end to the disputes by delivering a letter to miss betsy which she hastily opening found it contained these lines to miss thoughtless my dear sister it is with an inexpressible satisfaction that i find your own inclinations have anticipated the request i was just about to make you i do assure you the moment i received your letter i was going to write in order to persuade you to do the very thing you seem to desire oxford is indeed a very censorious place i have always observed it to be so and have frequently told the ladies between jest and earnest that i thought it was a town of the most scandal and least sin of any in the world i am pretty confident some of those who pretend to give themselves airs concerning you and miss flora are as perfectly convinced of your innocence as i myself am yet after all that has happened i would not have you think of staying and the sooner you depart the better you need be under no apprehensions on account of my wounds those i receive from the sword of my antagonist are in a manner healed and that with the pistol shot in my shoulder is in as fine a way as can be expected in so short a time those i had the fortune to give him are in a yet better condition so that i believe it was not for the over-caution of our surgeon we might both quit our rooms to-morrow i hear that our grave superiors have had some consultations on our duel and that there is a talk of our being both expelled but for my part i shall certainly save them the trouble and quit the university of my own accord as soon as my recovery is completed my genius is by no means adapted to the study of divinity i think the care of my own soul more than sufficient for me without taking upon me the charge of a whole parish you may therefore expect to see me shortly at london as it is highly necessary i should consult mr goodman concerning my future settlement in the world i should be extremely glad of a visit from you before you leave oxford more especially as i have something of moment to say to you which i do not choose to communicate by letter
but cannot think it at all proper for particular reasons that you should come to me some or other of the gentlemen being perpetually dropping into my chamber and it is impossible for you to disguise yourself so as not to be distinguished by young fellows whose curiosity would be the more excited by your endeavours to conceal yourself as this might revive the discourse of an affair which could wish might be buried in an eternal oblivion must desire you will defer the satisfaction you propose to give me till we meet at london to which i wish you and your fair companion a safe and pleasant journey i am with the greatest tenderness my dear sister your affectionate brother f thoughtless the receipt of this letter gave an infinity of contentment to miss betsy she had made the offer of going to take her leave of him chiefly with the view of keeping him from suspecting she wanted natural affection and was no less pleased with his refusing the request she made him on that account than she was with his so readily agreeing to her returning to london miss flora was equally delighted they sent their footman that instant to take places in the stage-coach and early the next morning set out from a place which on their entering into it they did not imagine they should quit either so soon or with so little regret End of chapter ten recording by ginger cucolo Chapter Eleven of the History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One by Eliza Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin. Lays a foundation for many events to be produced by time and waited for with patience. Miss Betsy and Miss Flora, on their coming home, were in some perplexity how to relate the story of their Oxford adventure to Lady Mellison and Mr. Goodman and it is very likely they would have thought proper to have kept it a secret if the unlucky duel between mr francis and the gentleman commoner which they were sensible would be a known thing had not rendered the concealment of the whole utterly impracticable as there was no remedy miss flora took upon her to lay open the matter to her mamma which she did with so much artifice that if that lady had been as astute as she was really the reverse she could not have found much to condemn either in the conduct of her daughter or miss betsy as to mr goodman he left the whole management of the young ladies in these particulars entirely to his wife so said little to them on the share of the adventure but was extremely concerned for the part mr francis had in it as he supposed it was chiefly owing to that unlucky incident that he had taken in resolution to leave the college and he very well knew that a certain nobleman who was a distant relation of his family and godfather to mr francis had always promised to bestow a large benefice in his gift as soon as he should have completed his studies this honest guardian thought he should be wanting in his duty of the trust reposed in him to suffer his charge to throw away that fine prospect in his view if by any means he could prevent him from taking so rash and inconsiderate a step and as to his being expelled he doubted not but between him and sir ralph interest might be made to the heads of the university to get the affair of the duel passed over the greatest difficulty he had to apprehend in compassing this point was from the young gentleman himself who he had observed was of a temper somewhat obstinate and tenacious of his own opinion resolving however to try all means possible he wrote immediately to him representing to him in the strongest and most pathetic terms he was master of the vast advantages the clergy enjoyed the respect they had from all degrees of people and endeavoured to convince him that there was no avocation whatever by which a younger brother might so easily advance his fortune and do honour to his family he also sent a letter to sir ralph trusty acquainting him with the whole story and earnestly requesting that he would write to Mr. Francis and omit nothing that might engage him to desist from doing a thing so contrary to his interest and the intention of his deceased father, as what he now had thoughts of doing was manifestly so. These efforts by both the guardians were often repeated, but without the least success. The young gentleman found arguments to oppose against theirs, which neither of them could deny to have weight, particularly that of his having no call to take upon him holy orders. During these debates, in which Miss Betsy gave herself no matter of concern, she received a letter from her brother containing these lines. 
to Miss Betsy Thoughtless, my dear sister, though I flatter myself all my letters afford you some sort of satisfaction, yet by what little judgment I have been able to form of the temper of your sex. Have reason to believe this I now send will meet a double portion of welcome from you. It brings a confirmation of your beauty's power, the intelligence of a new conquest, the offer of a heart, which, if you will trust a brother's recommendation, is well deserving your acceptance. But, that I may not seem to speak in riddles, you may remember that the first time I had the pleasure of entertaining you at my rooms, a gentleman called Trueworth was with us, and that the next day, when you dined with that person, who afterward treated you with such unbecoming liberties, he made one of the company, since then you could not see him, as he was obliged to go to his seat, which is about thirty miles off, on an extraordinary occasion, and return not till the day after you left this town. He seemed more than ordinarily affected on my telling him what had happened on your account, and after pausing a little, "'How unhappy was I,' said he, "'to be absent. Had I been there, there would have been no need for the brother of Miss Betsy to have exposed his life to the sword of an injurious antagonist, or his character to the censure of the university.' I would have taken upon myself to have revenged the quarrel of that amiable lady, and either have severely chastened the intolerance of the aggressor, or lost the best part of my blood in the attempt. I was very much surprised at these words, as well as the emphasis with which they were delivered, but recovering myself as soon as I could. "'We are extremely obliged to you, sir,' said I, "'but I know not if such a mistake in generosity might not have been fatal to the reputation of us both.' What would the world have said of me to have been tamely passive and suffer another to revenge the affront offered to my sister? What would they have thought of her on finding her honor vindicated by one who had no concern in it? No concern, cried he with the utmost eagerness. Yes, I have a concern more deep, more strong than that of father, brother, or all the ties of blood could give, and that you had before now had been convinced of had I not been so subtly and so unfortunately called hence. Perceiving, I looked very much astounded, as well I might. Ah, Frank, cried he, I love your charming sister. My friends have, for these last six months, been teasing me to think of marriage, and several proposals have been made to me on that score. But never till I saw the amiable Miss Betsy did I behold the face for whom I would exchange my liberty. In fine, tis she, and only she, can make me blessed, and I return to Oxford full of the hopes of an opportunity to lay my heart my person, and my fortune at her feet. It would require a volume, instead of a letter, to repeat half the tender and passionate expressions he uttered in your favor. What I have already said is enough to give you a specimen of the rest. I shall only add that, being impatient to begin the attack he is determined to make upon your heart, he is preparing to follow you to London with all possible expedition. I once had thoughts of accompanying him, I have since thought it proper to have Sir Ralph Trusty's advice in something I have a mind to do, and for that purpose shall take a journey into Liverpool, as soon as I receive remittances from Mr. Goodman, to pay off some trifling debts I have contracted here, and defray my travelling expenses, so that if things happen as I wish they may, my friend's passion will have made a considerable progress before I see you. Indeed, my dear sister, if you have not already seen a man whose person you like better, you can never have an offer that promises more felicity. He left the college soon after I came into it, beloved and respected by all that knew him, for his discreet behavior, humanity, and affability. He went afterwards on his travels and brought home with him all the accomplishments of the several countries he has been in, without being the least tainted with the vices or fopperies of any of them. He has a much larger estate than your fortune could expect, unencumbered with debts, mortgages, or poor relations. His family is ancient, and by the mother's side honorable, but above all, he has sense, honor, and good nature, rare qualities, which in my opinion cannot fail of making him an excellent husband whenever he comes to be such. But I shall leave him to plead his own cause, and you to follow your own inclinations. I am, with the most unfeigned good wishes, my dear sister, your affectionate brother and humble servant, F. Thoughtless. P.S. 
Mr. Trueworth knows nothing of my writing to you on his behalf, so you are at liberty to receive him as you shall think proper. Miss Betsy required no less a cordial than this to revive her spirits, pretty much depressed since her ill usage at Oxford. She had not time, however, to indulge the pleasure of reflecting on this new triumph on her first receiving the news of it. Lady Mellison had set that evening apart to make a grand visit to a person of her acquaintance, who was just married. The young ladies were to accompany her, and Miss Betsy was in the midst of the hurry of dressing when the post brought the letter, so she only looked it carelessly over and locked it in her cabinet till she should have more leisure for the examination. They were all ready. The coach with the best hammock cloth and harnesses was at the door, and only waited while Miss Prinks was drawing on her lady's gloves, which happened to be a little too tight. In this unlucky instant, one of the footmen came running into the parlour and told Lady Mellison that there was a very ill-looking woman at the door who inquired for her ladyship, and that she must needs speak with her, and that she had a letter to deliver which she would give into nobody's hand but her own. Lady Mellison seemed a little angry at the insolence and folly of the creature, as she then termed it, but ordered she should be showed into the back parlour. They were not above five minutes together before the woman went away, and Lady Mellison returned to the room where Miss Betsy and Miss Flora were waiting for her. A confusion not to be described sat on every feature in her face. She looked pale, she trembled, and having told the ladies something had happened which prevented her from going where she intended, she flew up into her dressing-room, followed by Mrs. Prinks, who appeared very much alarmed at seeing her ladyship in this disorder. Miss Betsy and Miss Flora were also surprised, and doubtless had their own conjectures upon this sudden turn. "'Tis not likely, however, that either of them, especially Miss Betsy, could hit upon the right, but whatever their thoughts were, they communicated them not to each other, and seemed only intent on considering on what matter they should dispose of themselves that evening. It not being proper, they should make the visit above mentioned without her ladyship. As they were discoursing on this head, Mrs. Prinks came down, and having ordered the coach to be put up, and sent a footman to call a hack, ran upstairs again in a great hurry to her lady. In less time than could be almost imagined, they both came down. Lady Mellicent had pulled off her rich apparel, and had mopped herself up in a cloak and hood, that little of her face and nothing of her hair could be distinguished. The two young ladies stared, and were confounded at the metamorphosis. "'Is your ladyship going out in that dress?' cried Miss Flora, but Miss Betsy said nothing. "'I, child,' replied the lady, somewhat faltering in her speech, "'a poor relation, who they say is dying, has sent to beg to see me.' She said no more. The hackney-coach was come. Her ladyship and Mrs. Prink stepped hastily into it, the latter in doing so telling the coachman in so low a voice as nobody but himself could hear to what place he was to drive. After they were gone, Miss Flora proposed walking in the park but Miss Betsy did not happen to be in a humour to go either there or anywhere else at that time, on which the other told her she had got the spleen, but said she, I am resolved not to be infected with it, so you must not take it ill if I leave you alone for a few hours, for I should think it a sin against common sense to sit moping at home without showing myself to any one soul in the world after having taken all this pain in dressing. Miss Betsy assured her, as she might do with a great deal of sincerity, that she should not at all be displeased to be entirely free from any company whatsoever for the whole evening, and to prove the truth of what she said, gave orders that instant to be denied to whoever should come to visit her. "'Well,' cried Miss Flora, laughing, "'I shall give your compliments, however, where I am going,' and then mention the names of some person she had just then taken into her head to visit. "'As you please for that,' replied Miss Betsy, with the same gay air. "'But don't tell them it is because I am eaten up with the vapours "'that I choose to stay at home rather than carry my compliments in person. "'For if ever I find out,' continued she, "'that you are so mischievous, "'I shall contrive some way or other to be revenged on you.' "'They talked to each other in this pleasant manner "'till a chair Miss Flora had sent for was brought into the hall, "'in which she seated herself for her intended ramble.' and Miss Betsy went into her chamber, where, how she was amused, will presently be shown. End of chapter 11 
Reading by Joyce Martin. Chapter 12 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1 by Eliza Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin. Contains some passages which, it is probable, will afford more pain than pleasure, yet are very pertinent to the history and necessary to be related. Though the words which Miss Flora had let fall to Mr. Trueworth concerning Miss Betsy seemed as if spoken by mere chance, they were couched under them, a design of the most black and villainous kind that ever entered the breast of woman, as will presently appear to the astonishment of every reader. In order to do this we must relate an incident in Miss Betsy's life, not hitherto mentioned, and which happened some little time before her going to Oxford with her brother Frank. On her first coming to town a woman had been recommended to her for starching and making up her fine linen. This person she had ever since employed, and took a great fancy to, as she found her honest, industrious, and very obliging. The poor creature was unhappily married. Her husband was gone from her, and had listed himself for a soldier. Being born in a distant country, she had no relations to whom she could apply for assistance was big with child, and had no support but the labor of her hands. These calamitous circumstances so much touched the commiserative nature of Miss Betsy that she frequently gave her double the sum she demanded for her work, and besides bestowing on her many things she left off wearing, which, though trifles in themselves, were very helpful to a person in such distresses. Miss Mabel, for whom she also worked at the same time, was no less her patroness than Miss Betsy. In fine, they were both extremely kind to her, insomuch as made her often cry out, in a transport of gratitude, that these two good young ladies were worth to her all the customers she had besides. They continued to prove themselves so. Indeed, for when her child was born, which happened to be a girl, they stood godmothers, and not only gave handsomely themselves, but raised a contribution among their acquaintance, for the support of the lying-in woman and her infant. The former, however, did not long enjoy the blessing of two such worthy friends. She died before the expiration of her month, and the latter, being wholly destitute, was about to be thrown upon the parish. Some well-disposed neighbor who knew how kind Miss Mabel and Miss Betsy had been came and acquainted them with the melancholy story. They consulted together, and each reflecting that she had undertaken the protection of this infant at the font, thought herself bound by duty to preserve it from those hardships with which children thus exposed are sometimes treated. They, therefore, as they were equally engaged, agreed to join equally in the maintenance of this innocent forlorn. This was a rare charity indeed, and few there are, especially at their years, who so justly considered the obligations of a baptismal covenant. It was also the more to be admired, as neither of them had the incomes of their fortunes in their own hands, the one being under guardianship, and the other at the allowance of a father who, though rich, was extremely avaricious. As they were therefore obliged to be good economists in this point, and nurses in the country are to be had at a much cheaper rate than in town, they got a person to seek out for one who would not be unreasonable in her demands and at the same time do justice to her charge. Such a one, according to the character given of her by neighbors being found, the child decently clothed was sent down to her habitation, which was in a little village about seventeen miles from London. For the sake of concealing the part Miss Mabel had in this affair from the knowledge of her father, it was judged proper that Miss Betsy should seem to take the whole upon herself, which she did and the nurse's husband came up every month and received the money from her hands, as also whatever other necessaries the child wanted. Who would imagine that such a glorious act of benevolence should ever be made a handle to traduce and vilify the author? Yet what cannot malice accompanied with cunning do? It can give the fairest virtue the appearance of the foulest vice, and pervert the just estimation 
of the world into a mistaken scorn and contempt. Miss Flora, after receiving the disappointment as related in the sixth chapter of this volume, was far from desisting from the wicked design she had conceived of putting an end to the intercourse between Miss Betsy and Mr. Trueworth. Her fertile brain presented her with a thousand stratagems, which she rejected either as they were too weak to accomplish what she wished, or too liable to discovery, till at last she hit upon the most detestable project of representing what proceeded from the noblest propensity of Miss Betsy's nature as the effect of a criminal compulsion, in fine to make it appear so feasible as to be believed that the child who owed half its maintenance to her charity was entirely kept by herself and the offspring of her own body. Having well weighed and deliberated on this matter, it seemed to her, such as Mr. Trueworth on the most strict examination could not discover the deception of, she therefore resolved to pursue it, and accordingly wrote the following letter. To Charles Trueworth, Esquire, Sir, the friendship I had for some of your family now deceased, and the respect due to your own character in particular, obliges me to acquaint you with truths more disagreeable than perhaps you ever yet have heard. But before I proceed on the shocking narrative, let me conjure you to believe that in me your better angel speaks, and warns you to avoid that dreadful gulf of everlasting misery into which you are just ready to be plunged. I am informed by those who are most verified in your affairs, and on whose veracity I may depend, that a treaty of marriage is on foot and almost as good as concluded between you and Miss Betsy Thoughtless. A young lady, I must confess, well descended, handsome, and endued with every accomplishment to attract the admiration of mankind, and if her soul had the least conformity with her exterior charms, you doubtless might have been one of the most happy and most envied men on earth. But, sir, this seeming innocence is all a cheat. Another has been beforehand with you in the joys you covet. Your intended bride has been a mother without the pleasure of owning herself as such. The product of a shameful passion is still living, and though she uses the greatest caution in this affair, I have by accident discovered is now nursed at Denham, a small village within two miles of Uxbridge, by a gardener's wife, who is called by the country people Goody Busman. I give you this particular account, in order that you may make what equity you shall think proper into a fact, which I am sorry to say you will find but too real. I pity from my soul the unfortunate seducing young lady. She must be doubly miserable if, by having lost her virtue, she loses a husband such as you. But if after this you should think fit to prosecute your pretensions, I wish she may endeavor by her future conduct to atone for the errors of the past. But, alas, her present manner of behavior affords no such promising expectations. And if you should let your honor and fortune and all that is dear to you against so precarious a stake as the hope of reclaiming a woman of her temper, it must certainly fill all your friends with astonishment and grief. But you are yourself the best judge of what it will become you to do. I only beg that you will be assured this intelligence comes from one who is, with the utmost sincerity, sir, your well-wisher and most humble, though unknown, servant. She would not trust the success of the mischief she intended by this letter till she had examined and re-examined every sentence, and finding it altogether such as she thought would work the desired effect, got one who was always her ready agent in matters of this kind to copy it over, in order to prevent any accident from discovering the real author, and then sent it, as directed, by the penny post. How far the event answered her expectation shall very shortly be related, but incidents of another nature requiring to be first mentioned, the gratification of that curiosity which this may have excited must, for a while, be deferred. End of chapter 12 Recording by Joyce Martin
Chapter 13 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin. Is the recital of some accidents as little possible to be foreseen by the reader as they were by the persons to whom they happened? In youth, when the blood runs high and the spirits are in full vivacity, affection must come very heavy indeed when it makes any deep or lasting impression on the mind. That vexation which Miss Betsy had brought upon herself by going to the play with Miss Forward was severe enough the whole night and the ensuing day a great while it must be confessed for a person of her volatile disposition and when the more violent emotions had subsided the terror she had lately sustained had at least this good effect upon her it made her resolve to take all possible precautions not to fall into the like danger again as she had an infinite deal of generosity in her nature when not obscured by her pride and vanity which the flatteries she had been but too much accustomed to had inspired her with, she could not reflect how ill she had treated Mr. Trueworth, and the little regard she had paid to the tender concern he had shown her for her reputation, without thinking she ought to ask his pardon, and acknowledge she had been in the wrong. If Mr. Trueworth could have known the humour she was at present in, how readily would he have flown to her with all the wings of love and kind forgiveness! but as he had not the spirit of divination and could only judge of her sentiments by her behaviour it was not in his power to conceive how great a change had happened in his favour through a just sensibility of her own error she in the meantime little imagined how far he resented the treatment she had given him especially as she heard he had been to wait upon her the day in which she saw no company and after having passed a night of much more tranquillity than the former had been went down in the morning to breakfast with her usual cheerfulness. She had not been many minutes in the parlour before she was agreeably surprised with the sight of her elder brother, Mr. Francis Thoughtless, who, it seems, had arrived the night before. After the first welcomes were over, Mr. Goodman asked him wherefore he did not come directly to his house, saying he had always a spare bed to accommodate a friend, to which the other replied that he had come from Paris, with some company whom he could not quit, and that they had lain at the Humums. Miss Betsy was extremely transported at his return, and said a thousand obliging things to him, all which he answered with more politeness than tenderness. And this young lady soon perceived by this specimen of his behavior to her, that she was not to expect the same affection from him, as she had received so many proofs of from her younger brother. His long absence from England, and some attachments he had found abroad, had indeed very much taken off that warmth of kindness he would doubtless otherwise have felt for an only sister, and one who appeared so worthy of his love. As Mr. Goodman had acquainted him by letter that he had hired a house for him, according to his request the chief of their conversation turned on that subject, and as soon as breakfast was over they took a walk together to see it. On their return he seemed very much pleased with the choice Mr. Goodman had made, and the little time he stayed was entirely taken up with consulting Lady Mellison, his sister, and Miss Flora concerning the manner in which she should ornament it, for the honest guardian had taken care to provide all such furniture as he thought would be necessary for a single gentleman. No entreaties were wanting to prevail on him to make that house his home till his own was thoroughly aired and in all respects fit for him to go into, but he excused himself saying he could not leave the friends he had travelled with till they were provided for as well as himself. Nor could all Mr. Goodman and the ladies urge persuade him to dine with them that day. It must be acknowledged that this positive refusal of everything that was desired of him had not in it all that complacence which might have been expected from a person just come from among a people more famous for their politeness than their sincerity. But he had his own reasons, which the family of Mr. Goodman as yet were far from suspecting, which made him act in the manner he now did. And it was not in reality the want of French breeding but the want of true old English resolution that enforced this seeming negligence and abruptness. After he was gone, Mr. Goodman went to change, but was scarce entered into the walk 
where he had appointed to meet some merchants, when he was accosted by two rough, ill-looking fellows, who demanded his sword and told him they had a writ against him, and that he was their prisoner and must go with them. Mr. Goodman, who had as little reason as any man living to suspect an insult of this nature, only smiled and told them they were mistaken in their person. "'No, no,' said one of them. "'We are right enough if you are Mr. Samuel Goodman.' "'My name is Samuel Goodman,' replied he, "'but I do not know that it stands in any man's books for debt. "'But pray,' continued he, "'at whose suit am I arrested?' "'At the suit of Mr. Oliver Marlpus,' said the other officer. "'I have no dealings with any such person,' cried Mr. Goodman, "'nor even ever heard the name of him you mention.' "'They then told him, it was his business to prove that. They did but do their duty, and he must obey the writ. Mr. Goodman, on this, knowing they were not the persons with whom this matter should be contested, readily went where they conducted him, which was to a house belonging to him who appeared to be the principal of the two. As they were coming off change, he had his coachman drive his chariot home and tell his lady that he believed he should not dine with her that day, but he kept his footman with him to send on what messages he should find convenient. The officer, knowing his condition, and not doubting that he should have a handsome present for civility money, used him with a great deal of respect when he had got him into his house, and, on his desiring to be informed of the lawyer's name employed in the action, he immediately told him, and also for what sum he was arrested, which was no less than two thousand five hundred and seventy-five pounds eight shillings. "'A pretty parcel of money, truly,' said Mr. Goodman. "'I wonder in what dream I contracted this debt.' He then called for pen, ink, and paper, and wrote a line to his lawyer in the temple, desiring him to go to the other, who, they said, was concerned against him, and find out the truth of this affair." The honest old gentleman, having sent this letter by his servant, called for something to eat, and was extremely factious and pleasant with the officers, not doubting but that what had happened was occasioned through some mistake or other, and should immediately be discharged when the thing was inquired into. But his present good humor was changed into one altogether the reverse, when his own lawyer, accompanied by him who was engaged for his adversary, came to him and told him there was no remedy but to give bail, that the suit commenced against him was on account of a bond given by Lady Mellicent to Mr. Oliver Marlpus some few days previous to her marriage. Tis hard to say whether surprise or rage was most predominant in the soul of this much-injured husband at so shocking a piece of intelligence. He demanded to see the bond which a request being granted he found it not, as he at first flattered himself, a forgery, but signed by his own wife's hand, and witnessed by Mrs. Prinks, her woman, and another person whom he knew not. It is certain that no confusion ever exceeded that of Mr. Goodman's at this time. He sat like one transfixed with thunder, was wholly incapable of uttering one syllable, he appeared to the company as lost in thought, but was indeed almost past the power of thinking, till his lawyer roused him with these words. "'Come, sir,' said he, "'you see how the case stands. There is no time to be lost. You must either pay the money down, or get immediate securities, for I suppose you would not choose to be here to-night.' This seasonable admonition brought him a little to himself. He now began to reflect what it would best become him to do and after a pause of some moments. "'I believe,' said he, "'that I have now in my house more than the sum in bills that would discharge this bond, but I would willingly hear what this woman has to say before I pay the money, and will therefore give in bail.' Accordingly, he sent for two citizens of great worth and credit to desire them to come to him. They instantly complied with the summons, and the whole affair being repeated to them, voluntarily offered to be his sureties. Bail bonds were easily procured, but it took up some time in filling them up and discharging the fees and other consequential expenses that it was past one o'clock before all was over, and Mr. Goodman had liberty to return to his own habitation. It was very seldom that Mr. Goodman stayed late abroad, but whenever anything happened that obliged him to do so, Lady Mellison, 
through the great affection she pretended to have for him, would never go to bed till his return. Mrs. Pranks, for the most part, was her sole companion in such cases, but it so fell out that this night neither of the two young ladies had any inclination to sleep. Miss Flora's head was full of the above-mentioned plot and the anxiety for its success. The remembrance of the last adventure of Miss Forwards was not yet quite dissipated in Miss Betsy. The coldness with which she imagined herself treated by her elder brother, with whom she had flattered herself of living and being very happy under his protection, gave her a good deal of uneasiness. To add to all these matters of disquiet, she had also received that afternoon a letter from Mr. Francis Thoughtless, acquainting her that he had the misfortune to be so much bruised by a fall he got from his horse that it was utterly impossible for him to travel, and she must not expect him in town for yet some days. The ladies were all together, sitting in the parlour, each choosing rather to indulge her own private meditations than to hold discourse with the others, when Mr. Goodman came home. Lady Mellison ran to embrace him with a show of the greatest tenderness. "'My dear Mr. Goodman,' cried she, "'how much have I suffered from my fear, lest some ill accident should have befallen you?' "'The worst that could have happened has befallen me,' replied he, thrusting her from him. "'Yet no more than what you might very reasonably expect would one day or another happen.' "'What do you mean, my dear?' said she, more alarmed at his words and looks than she made show of. "'You may too easily inform yourself what tis I mean,' cried he hastily. "'On the retrospect of your behaviour, I now find but too late how much I have been imposed upon.' "'Did you not assure me,' continued he, somewhat more mildly, "'that you were free from all encumbrances but that girl whom, since our marriage, I have tendered as my own?' And then, perceiving she answered nothing, but looked pale and trembled, he repeated to her the affront he had received, which, said he, in all my dealings in the world would never have happened but on your account. Though Lady Mellison had as much artifice and the power of dissimulation as any of her sex, yet she was at a loss thus taken unprepared. She hesitated. She stammered, and fain would have denied the having given any such bond, but, finding the proofs too plain against her, she threw herself at his feet, wept, and conjured him to forgive the only deception she had practised on him. "'It was a debt,' said she, contracted by my former husband, which I knew not of. I thought the effects he left behind him were more than sufficient to have discharged whatever obligations he lay under, and foolishly took out letters of administration. The demand of Marlpus came not upon me till some time after. I then inconsiderately gave him my own bond, which he, however, promised not to put in force without previously acquainting me. This excuse was too weak, as well as all the affection Mr. Goodman had for her, to pacify the emotions of his just indignation. And pray, cried he in a voice divided between scorn and anger, of what advantage would it have been to me your being previously acquainted with it? Could you have paid the money without robbing or defrauding me? No, madam, continued he, I shall, for the future, give credit to nothing you can say, and as I cannot be assured that this is the only misfortune I have to dread on your account, shall consider what steps I ought to take for my defense. In speaking these words, he rung the bell for a servant, and ordered that bed to which he had invited Mr. Thoughtless, should that instant be made ready for himself. All the tears and entreaties of Lady Mellison were in vain to make him recede from his resolution of lying alone that night, and as soon as he was told his orders were obeyed, he flung out of the room, saying, "'Madam, perhaps we never more may meet between a pair of sheets.' Whether at that time he was determined to carry out his resentment so far or not is uncertain, but what happened very shortly after left him no other part to take than that which he had threatened." End of chapter 13, reading by Joyce Martin. Chapter 14 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless by Eliza Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin. Gives a full explanation of some passages which hitherto have seemed very dark and mysterious. 
this was a night of great confusion in mr goodman's family lady mellison either was or pretended to be in fits miss flora was called up soon after she went to bed but mr goodman himself would not be prevailed upon to rise though told the condition his wife was in and that she begged with the utmost earnestness to see him this behavior in a husband lately so tender and affectionate is a proof not only that the greatest love once turned degenerates into its reverse but also that the sweetest temper when too much provoked by injuries is not always the most easy to be reconciled the perfect trust he had put in lady mellison the implicit faith he had given to all she said and the dependence he had on the love she had professed for him made the deception she was now convicted of appear in worse colors than otherwise it would have done the more he reflected on this ugly affair the more he was convinced of the hypocrisy of his wife in whom he had placed such confidence we have been married near five years said he to himself how comes it to pass that the penalty of this bond was not in so long a time demanded it must be that she has kept it off by large interest and forbearance money and who knows how far my credit may be endangered for the raising of it tis likely that while i thought everything necessary for my family was purchased with ready money it may stand indebted to all the tradesmen this wicked woman has had any dealings with nay i cannot even assure myself that other obligations of the same kind with this i have already suffered for may not some time or other call upon me for their discharge with these disturbed meditations instead of sleep did he pass what was remaining of the night when he went to bed yet he rose the next day full as early as he was accustomed to do after having enjoyed the best repose the first thing he did was to send for as many of those tradespeople as he either knew himself or his servants could inform him had at any time sent goods into his house on their presenting themselves before him he found more to his vexation than surprise for he now expected the worst that all of them even to those who supplied his kitchen had bills of a long standing he discharged all their several demands directly and having taken a receipt in full from each of them desired they would henceforward suffer no goods to be left within his doors without the value being paid on the delivery mr goodman had just dispatched the last of these people when he was told that a woman begged to speak to him another creditor i suppose said he and then ordered she should come in as soon as she did so well mistress cried he seeing her a woman of a very plain appearance what is it you require of me nothing sir said she but you will permit me to acquaint you with a thing which it very much concerns you to be informed of i should otherwise be an enemy to myself resumed he therefore pray speak what you have to say i am sir said she the unfortunate wife of one of the most wicked men upon earth and by my being so have been compelled to be in some measure accessory to the injustice you have sustained but i hope what i have to reveal will atone for my transgression mr goodman then desired she would sit down and without any further prelude proceed to the business she came upon the sum of what i have to relate rejoined she is that the bond on which you were yesterday arrested and for the payment of which you have given security is no more than an impudent fraud but the particulars that prove it such cannot be very displeasing to you however i shall make no apology for relating them as a perfect knowledge of the whole transaction may put you in a way to prevent all future injuries of the like nature my husband whose name is oliver Marlpus, continued she had the honour of waiting on a nobleman belonging to court when sir solomon mellison had a post there his lady now unhappily yours took a fancy to him and entered into a criminal conversation with him some time before her husband's death and has ever since unless very lately broke off continued it on my first discovering it he begged me to be easy and reminded me that as he had nothing at present to depend upon having lost his place but her ladyship's bounty i ought to wink at it and be content that she should share his person since i shared in the benefits arising from her intercourse 
I, knowing his temper too well, not to know that any opposition I could make would be in vain, and feeling no other remedy, was obliged to feign a consent to what the love I had then for him rendered most terrible to me. Thus we went on, her ladyship still supplying him with money for our support, till he being informed that her marriage with you was near being consummated, he bethought himself of a stratagem to prevent the change of her condition from depriving him of the continuance of her favor. It was this. Their private meetings were always in the Savoy, at a house of my husband's choosing for that purpose, the master of it being his intimate friend and companion, myself, and two men whom he made privy to the plot, and were two personate officers of justice who were to be concealed in the next room to the lovers, and as soon as we found they were in bed, burst open the door, rush in and catch them in the very act of shame. All this was executed according as it was contrived. My husband jumped out of bed, pretended to struggle with the sham constables, and swore he would murder me. I acted my part, as they since told me, to the life. Seemed a very fury, and said I did not care what became of me, if I was but revenged upon my rival. Lady Mellison tore her hair, wept, and entreated me in the most abject terms to forgive and not expose a woman of her rank to public scorn and infamy, to which I replied that it was not her quality should protect her. I loaded her with the most inveterate reproaches I could think of. Indeed, there required not much study for my doing so, for I heartily hated her. After some time passed in beseechings on her side and railings on mine, one of the pretended constables took me aside, as if to persuade me to more moderation, while the other talked to her and insinuated as if a sum of money might compromise the matter. My husband also told her that though he detested me for what I had done, yet he wished her ladyship for her own sake would think of some way to pacify me, for, said he, a wife in these cases has great power. The terror she was in of appearing before a civil magistrate and of being liable to suffer that punishment the law inflicts upon an adulteress, and consequently the loss of all her hopes of a marriage with you, sir, made her readily agree to do anything I should require. I seemed quite adverse for a good while to listen to any terms of accommodation, but at length affected to be overcome by the persuasions of the man I brought with me and her promise of allowing us a very handsome support as soon as she became your wife and should have it in her power. This I made flight on, and told her that I would not depend upon her promise for anything. It was then proposed that she should give a bond for a large sum of money to Mr. Malpas. That you may do with safety, said he to her, as I shall have it in my own hands, and you may be assured will never put it in force to your prejudice. In fine, sir, continued Mrs. Malpas, she agreed to this proposal, and as it was then too late for the execution of what she had promised on her making a solemn vow to fulfill it punctually the next day, I told her she was at liberty to go home that night, but that I would not withdraw the warrant I pretended to have taken out against her till all was over. She was, indeed, too much rejoiced at the expectation of getting off from the imaginary prosecution to think of breaking her word. My wicked husband, however, had the success of his design more greatly at heart than to give her any long time for reflection. Accordingly, he went pretty early the next morning to her lodging, accompanied by one of those who had assumed the character of constable, and who in reality had formerly served the parish where he still lives in that capacity, and a lawyer previously directed to fill up the bond in the strongest and most binding terms that words could form. There was not the least demur or objection on the part of her ladyship. She signed her name, and Mrs. Prinks, her woman, and the man we brought with us set their hands as witnesses. You see, sir, pursued she, the drift of this contrivance, Lady Mellison was the instrument, but it was you that was ordained to suffer. There was no fixed sum or sum stipulated for the support we were to receive from her. But Marlpus was so continually draining her purse that I have often been amazed by what arts she imposed on you to replenish it. Whenever she began to make any excuse for not complying with his demands, he presently threatened her with putting the bond in force against you, by which means he extorted from her almost whatever he required. One time in particular he pretended to be under an arrest for three hundred pounds. 
and she not having so much money by her was obliged to send Mrs. Prinks with her diamond necklace to the pawnbrokers to make it up. Yet, would you believe it, sir, notwithstanding all he got from her ladyship, he kept me poor and mean, as you see, would not let me have a servant, but made me wash his linen and do all his drudgery, while he strutted about the town like a fine fellow with his toupee wig and laced waistcoat, and, if I made the least complaint, would tell me in derision that as I had no children I had nothing else to do but to wait upon him. I bore all this, however, because I loved the villain, and indeed did not then know he was so great a one to me as I now find he is. He pretended to me that he was heartily weary of Lady Mellison, hated her, and could no longer bear the pain of dissembling with her. I will, therefore, said he, demand a much larger sum of her than I know it is in her power to raise. Her non-compliance will give me an excuse for compelling her husband to pay the penalty of the bond, and when I have got the money I will purchase an employment in some one or other of the public offices on which you and I may live comfortably together the remaining of our days. Accordingly, at his next meeting with Lady Mellison, he told her he had a present occasion for a sum of money, and she must let him have five hundred pounds within four or five days at farthest. This, it seems, extremely alarmed her. She replied that it was impossible for her to procure so much at once, complained that he had been too pressing upon her, and told him that he ought not to expect she could always supply his extravagancies in the manner she had lately done. High words arose between them on this account. She reproached him with the straits he had already put her into, and said he must wait till money came into her hands. He swore the present exigence of his affairs required an immediate supply, that he saw no remedy but arresting you, and they parted in great anger. The next day he sent me to her with a letter. Neither she nor Mrs. Prinks was at home, and I did not judge proper to leave it with the servants, so carried it back again. He did not happen to ask me for it, and I never thought of returning it, which I am now very glad of, as it may serve to corroborate the truth of what I told you. In speaking thus, she presented a paper to Mr. Goodman, which he took hastily out of her hands and found it contained these words. To Lady Mellison, Madam, your excuses won't do with me. Money I must have. I know you may raise it if you will, and I am amazed you should imagine I can believe anything you say to the contrary, when you have an old fellow who you yourself told me knows no end to his wealth, and that you married him only to make him my banker. Do not therefore offer to trifle with me any longer, for if you do, by my soul, I shall put the bond in force, and then there will be an end to all love and friendship between you and him who has been for so many years your constant servant, O Marlpus. Oh, wretched, wretched woman, cried Mr. Goodman, as soon as he had done reading. To how low, how contemptible a state has vice reduced her! Mrs. Marlpus, perceiving by his countenance the distraction of his mind, would not prosecute her discourse, till he, recovering himself a little, bid her go on, if anything yet remained to be related of this shocking narrative. I have told you, sir, resumed she, the preparations, the conscience you are but too well acquainted with. I have only to assure you that I had not discovered my husband's baseness, but with a view of your doing yourself justice. You have no occasion to pay this bond. You can prove it a fraud by the joint evidence of myself, his wife, and another person, no less deeply concerned in the contrivance, and is ready to make his affidavit of every particular I have recited. But then, whatsoever is done must be done with expedition, or he will be past the reach, either of you or me. I have just now learned that instead of purchasing an employment, as he pretended to me, he is privately preparing to go to Holland, Brussels, or some of those places, and settle there with a young hussy, who they say is with child by him, and will leave me here to starve. His lawyer, to whom he has assigned the bond, is to advance fifteen hundred pounds upon it, on condition he has the residue of it to himself, when you shall discharge the whole. Now, it is in your power, sir, to save yourself the payment of so much money and relieve a much injured and distressed wife by complaining to the court of chancery of the imposition practice on you and procure a net ex regnum to prevent his escape. Here she gave over speaking, and Mr. Goodman, after a short pause, replied that he could not at that instant resolve on anything, 
but added that he would take some advice and then let her know how far she might be serviceable to him, on which she took her leave after giving him directions where she might be found. End of chapter 14 Reading by Joyce Martin Chapter 15 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joyce Martin. The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1 by Eliza Haywood. Chapter 15. Brings many things on the carpet, highly pleasing to Miss Betsy, in their beginning, and no less perplexing to her, in their consequences. The accounts of those many and dreadful misfortunes which the ill conduct of Miss Forward had drawn upon her made Miss Betsy extremely pensive. "'Tis strange,' said she to herself, "'that a woman cannot indulge herself in the liberty of conversing freely with a man without being persuaded by him to do everything he would have her. She thought, however, that some excuse might be made for Miss Forward on the score of her being strictly debarred from all acquaintance with the other sex. People, cried she, have naturally an inclination to do what they are most forbid. The poor girl had a curiosity to hear herself addressed, and having no opportunity of gratifying that passion, but by admitting her lover at so odd a time and place, was indeed too much in his power to have withstood her ruin, even if she had been mistress of more courage and resolution than she was. On meditating on the follies which women are sometimes prevailed upon to be guilty of, the discovery she had made of Miss Flora's intrigue with Galen came fresh into her mind. What, said she, could induce her to sacrifice her honour? Declarations of love were not new to her. She heard every day the flatteries with which our sex are treated by the men, and needed not to have purchased the assiduities of any of them at so dear a rate. Good God, are innocence and the pride of conscious virtue things of so little estimation as to be thrown away for the trifling pleasure of hearing a few tender protestations, perhaps all false, and uttered by one whose heart despises the early fondness he has triumphed over, and ridicules the very grant of what he has so earnestly solicited? It is certain this young lady had the highest notions of honour and virtue, and whenever she gave herself time to reflect, looked on everything that had a tendency to make an encroachment on them with the most extreme detestation. Yet, had she good nature enough to pity those faults in others, she thought it impossible for her to be once guilty of herself. But amidst sentiments as noble and as generous as ever heart was possessed of, vanity, that foible of her soul crept in, and would have its share. She had never been thoroughly attacked in a dishonourable way, but by Galand and the gentleman commoner at Oxford, both which she rebuffed with a becoming disdain. In this she secretly exulted, and had that dependence on her power of repelling all the efforts, come they in what shape soever, that should be made against her virtue, that she thought it beneath her to behave so as not to be in danger of incurring them. How great a pity it is that a mind endured with so many excellent qualities, and which had such exalted ideas of what is truly valuable in womankind, should be tainted with a frailty of so fatal a nature as to expose her to temptations, which, if she were not utterly undone, it must be owing rather to the interposition of her guardian angel than to the strength of human reason. But of that hereafter, at present, there were none had any base designs upon her. We must show what successes those gentlemen met with, who addressed her with the most pure and honourable intentions. Of this number we shall speak, first, of Mr. Trueworth and Mr. Staple, the one, as has been already said, strenuously recommended by her brother, the other by Mr. Goodman. Mr. Staple had the good fortune, if it may be called so, to be the first of those two who had the opportunity of declaring his passion, the journey of the other to London having been retarded two days longer than he intended. 
this gentleman having mr goodman's leave made a second visit at his house lady millicen and miss flora knowing on what business he was come made an excuse for leaving him and miss betsy together he made his addresses to her in the forms which lovers usually observe on the first declaration and she replied to what he said in a manner not to encourage him too much nor yet to take from him all hope while they were discoursing a footman came in and told her a gentleman from oxford desired to speak with her having some commands from her brother to deliver to her mr staple supposing they had business took his leave and mr trueworth for it was he indeed was introduced madam said he saluting her with the utmost respect i have many obligations to mr thoughtless but none of which demands so large a portion of my gratitude as the honour he has conferred upon me in presenting you with this letter to which she replied that her brother must certainly have a great confidence in his goodness to give him this trouble with these words she took the letter out of his hand, and, having obliged him to seat himself, "'You will pardon, sir,' said she, "'the rudeness which my impatience to receive the commands of so near and dear a relation makes me guilty of.' He made no other answer to these words than a low bow, and she withdrew to a window and found the contents of her brother's letter were these. To Miss Betsy Thoughtless My dear sister, I shall leave Oxford to-morrow, in order to cross the country for the seat of Sir Ralph Trusty, as I suppose Mr. Goodman will inform you, I having wrote to him by the post. But the most valuable of my friends being going to London, and expressing a desire of renewing that acquaintance he had begun to commence with you here, I have taken the liberty of troubling him with the delivery of this to you. He is a gentleman whose merits you are yet a stranger to but i have so good an opinion of your penetration as to be confident a very little time will convince you that he is deserving of all the esteem in your power to regard him with in the meantime doubt not but you will receive him as a person whose success in everything is much desired by him who is with the tenderest good wishes dear sister your most affectionate brother f thoughtless as she did not doubt but by the style and manner of this letter that it had been seen by mr trueworth she could not keep herself from blushing which he observing as he sat flattered himself with taking as a good omen he had too much awe upon him however to make any declarations of his passion at the first visit neither indeed had he an opportunity of doing it Lady Mellison and Miss Flora, thinking they had left Mr. Staple and Miss Betsy a sufficient time together, came into the room. The former was surprised to find he was gone, and a strange gentleman in his place. But Miss Flora, remembering him perfectly well, they saluted each other with the freedom of persons who were not entire strangers. They entered into a conversation, and other company coming in, Mr. Trueworth had an opportunity of displaying the fine talents he was master of his travels, the observations he had made on the curiosities he had seen abroad, particularly at Rome, Florence, and Naples, were highly entertaining to the company. On taking leave he told the ladies he hoped they would allow him the favour of making one at their tea-table sometimes, while he remained in London, to which Lady Mellison and her daughter, little suspecting the motive he had for this request, joined in assuring him he could not come too often and that they should expect to see him every day but miss betsy looking on herself as chiefly concerned in this admission modestly added to what they had said only that a person so much and she doubted not but so justly esteemed by her brother might be certain of a sincere welcome from her everybody was full of the praises of this gentleman and miss betsy though she said the least of any one thought her brother had not bestowed more on him than he really deserved Mr. Goodman, coming home soon after, there appeared some marks of displeasure in his countenance, which, as he was the best-humoured man in the world, very much surprised those of his family. But the company not being all retired, none of them seemed to take any notice of it, and went on with the conversation they were upon his entrance. The visitors, however, were no sooner gone than without staying to be asked, he immediately let them into the occasion of his being so much ruffled. 
"'Miss Betsy,' said he, "'you have used me very ill. "'I did not think you would have made a fool of me "'in the manner you have done.' "'Bless me, sir,' cried she, "'in what have I offended?' "'You have not only offended against me,' answered he very hastily, "'but also against your own reason and common understanding. "'You are young, tis true, yet not so young as not to know "'that it is both ungenerous and silly to impose upon your friends.' "'I scorn the thought, sir, of imposing upon anybody,' said she. "'I therefore desire, sir, you will tell me what you mean by so unjust an accusation.' "'Unjust!' resumed he. I appeal to the whole world, if it were well done of you to suffer me to encourage my friend's courtship to you, when at the same time your brother had engaged you to receive the addresses of another. Miss Betsy, though far from thinking it a fault of her to hear the proposals of a hundred lovers, had as many offered themselves, was yet a little shocked at the reprimand given her by Mr. Goodman, and not being able to presently make any reply to what he had said, he took a letter he had just received from her brother out of his pocket and threw it on the table with these words. "'That will show,' said he, "'whether I have not cause to resent your behavior in this point.' Perceiving she was about to take it up, "'Hold!' cried he, "'my wife shall read it and be the judge between us.' Lady Mellison, who had not spoke at all this time, then took the letter and read aloud the contents, which were these. To Mr. Goodman "'Sir,' This comes to let you know I have received the remittances you were so obliging to send me. I think to set out tomorrow for Liverpool, but shall not stay there for any length of time. My intentions for going into the army are the same as when I wrote to you, and the more I consider on that affair, the more I am confirmed that a military life is most suitable of any to my genius and humor. If, therefore, you can hear of anything proper for me, either in the guards or in a marching regiment, against i come to town i shall be infinitely thankful for the trouble you take in the inquiry but sir this is not all the favors i have to ask of you at present a gentleman of family fortune and character has seen my sister likes her and is going to london on no other business than to make his addresses to her i have already wrote to her on this subject and i believe she will pay some regard to what i have said on his behalf I am very well assured she can never have a more advantageous offer as to his circumstances, nor be united to a man of more true honor, morality, and sweetness of disposition, all which I have had frequent occasions of being an eye-witness of. But she is young, gay, and as yet perhaps not altogether so capable as I could wish of knowing what will make for her real happiness. I therefore entreat you, sir, as the long-experienced friend of your family, to forward this match, both by your advice and whatever else is in your power, which certainly will be the greatest act of goodness you can confer on her, as well as the highest obligation to a brother, who wishes nothing more than to see her secured from all temptations, and well settled in the world. I am, with the greatest respect, sir, your most humble and most obedient servant, F. Thoughtless. P.S. I had forgot to inform you, sir, that the name of the gentleman I take the liberty of recommending with so much warmth is Trueworth, that he is descended from the ancient Britons by the father's side, and by the mother's from the honorable and well-known old castles in Kent. "'Oh, fie, Miss Betsy,' said Lady Mellison, "'how could you serve Mr. Goodman so? What will Mr. Staples say when he comes to know he was encouraged to court a woman that was already pre-engaged?' "'Pre-engaged, madam,' cried Miss Betsy, in a scornful tone. "'What, to a man I never saw but three times in my whole life, "'and whose mouth never uttered a syllable of love to me?' "'She was going on, but Mr. Goodman, who was still in a great heat, "'interrupted her, saying, "'No matter whether he has uttered anything of the business or not, "'it seems you are enough acquainted with his sentiments, "'and I doubt not but he knows you are, "'or he would not have taken a journey to London on your account. You ought, therefore, to have told me of his coming, and what your brother had wrote concerning him, and I should then have let Mr. Staple know it would be of no purpose to make any courtship to you, as I did to another just before I came home, who I find has taken a great fancy to you. For my part, I do not understand this way of making gentlemen lose their time. 
"'Tis probable these last words nettled Miss Betsy more than all the rest he had said. She imagined herself secure of the hearts of both Trueworth and Staple, but was vexed to the heart to have lost the addresses of a third admirer through the scrupulousness of Mr. Goodman, who she looked upon to have nothing to do with her affairs in this particular. She was too cunning, however, to let him see what her thoughts were on this occasion, and only said that he might do as he pleased that she did not want a husband, that all men were alike to her, but added that it seemed strange to her that a young woman who had her fortune to make might not be allowed to hear all the different proposals that should be offered to her on that score, and with these words flung out of the room and went up into her chamber, nor would be prevailed upon to come down again that night, though Miss Flora and Mr. Goodman himself, repenting he had said so much, called to her for that purpose. End of chapter 15, reading by Joyce Martin. Chapter 16 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1 by Eliza Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin. Presents the reader with the name and character of Miss Betsy's third lover and also with some other particulars. Though Lady Mellison had seemed to blame Miss Betsy for not having communicated to Mr. Goodman what her brother wrote to her in relation to Mr. Trueworth, yet in her heart she was far from being adverse to her receiving a plurality of lovers, because whenever that young lady should fix her choice, there was a possibility some one or other of those she rejected might transmit his addresses to her daughter, who she was extremely desirous of getting married and had never yet been once solicited on honourable terms. She therefore told her husband that he ought not to hinder Miss Betsy from hearing what every gentleman had to offer, to the end she might accept that which had the prospect of most advantage to her. Mr. Goodman in this, as in everything else, suffered himself to be directed by her judgment, and the next morning when Miss Betsy came down talked to her with his usual pleasantry. Well, said he, have you forgiven my ill humor last night? I was a little vexed to think my friend Staple had so poor a chance for gaining you, and the more so because Frank Thoughtless will take it ill of me if I have done anything in opposition to the person he recommends. But you must act as you please. For my part, I shall not meddle any further in these affairs. "'Sir,' replied Miss Betsy, very gravely, "'I shall always be thankful to my friends for their advice, "'and whenever I think seriously of a husband "'shall not fail to interest yours in my choice. "'But,' continued she, "'one would imagine my brother, by writing so pressingly to you, "'wanted to hurry me into a marriage whether I would or no, "'and though I have as much regard for him as a sister can or ought to have, yet, I shall never be prevailed upon by him to enter into a state to which, at present, I have rather an aversion than inclination. That is, said Mr. Goodman, you rather have an aversion than an inclination to the persons who address you on that score. No, sir, answered she, not at all. The persons and behavior both of Mr. Trueworth and Mr. Staple appear to me to be unexcusable, but sure one may allow a man to have merit and be pleased with his conversation without desiring to be tacked to him for ever. I very believe I shall never be in love, but, if I am, it must be a long length of time, and a series of persevering attitudes must make me so. Mr. Goodman told her these were only romantic notions, which he doubted not, but a little time would cure her of. What reply Miss Betsy would have made is uncertain for the discourse was interrupted by a footman delivering a letter to her in which she found these lines. To Miss Betsy Thoughtless Fair creature, I am no courtier, no beau. I have hitherto had but little communication with your sex. But I am honest and sincere, and you may depend on the truth of what I say. I have, heaven be praised, acquired a very large fortune, and for some time have had thoughts of marrying, to the end I might have a son to enjoy the fruits of my labors, after I am food either for the fishes or the worms. It is no great matter which of them. Now I have been wished to several fine women, but my fancy gives the preference to you, 
and if you can like me as well, we shall be very happy together. I spoke to your guardian yesterday, for I love to be above board, but he seemed to lure, or, as we say at sea, to be a little hazy on the matter, so I thought I would not trouble him any further, but write directly to you. I hear there are two about you, but what of that? I have doubled the Cape of Good Hope many a time, and never failed of reaching my intended port. I, therefore, see no cause why I should apprehend a wreck by land. I am turned of eight and forty, tis true, which may be, you may think, too old. But I must tell you, dear pretty one, that I have a constitution that will wear out twenty of your washy-pampered landmen of not half my age. Whatever your fortune is, I will settle accordingly, and moreover will secure you something handsome to you at my decease, in case you should chance to be the longest liver. I know you young women do not care a man should have anything under your hand, so expect no answer, but desire you will consider on my proposals and let me know your mind this evening at five o'clock, when I shall come to Mr. Goodman's. Let him take it how he will. I can weather out any storm to come at you, and fiercely am, dear soul, your most faithful and affectionate lover, J. Hysom. There were some passages in this letter that set Miss Betsy into such immoderate fits of laughter as made her a long time in going through it. Having finished the whole, she turned to Mr. Goodman, and putting it into his hands, "'Be pleased, sir, to read that,' said she. "'You shall own, at least, that I do not make a secret of all my lovers to you.' Mr. Goodman soon looked it over, and after returning it to her, "'How troublesome a thing it is,' said he, "'to be the guardian to a beautiful young lady. "'Whether I grant or whether I refuse the consent required of me, "'I equally gain ill will from one side or the other.' Lady Mellison, who had all this morning complained of a violent headache, and said nothing during this conversation, now cried out, "'What new conquest is this Miss Betsy has made?' "'Oh, madam,' replied Miss Betsy, "'your ladyship shall judge of the value of it by the doughty epistle I have just received.' With these words she gave the letter to Miss Flora, deferring her to read it aloud, which she did but was obliged, as Miss Betsy herself had done, to stop several times and hold her sides before she got to the conclusion. And Lady Mellison, as little as she was inclined to mirth, could not forbear smiling to hear the manner in which this declaration of love was penned. "'You are all very merry,' said Mr. Goodman, "'but I can tell you, Captain Hysom, is a match that many a fine young lady in this town would jump at. He has been twenty-five years in the service of the East India Company,' has made very successful voyages, and is immensely rich. He has lived at sea, indeed, the greatest part of his life, and much politeness cannot be expected from him. But he is a very honest and good-natured man, and I believe means well. I wish he had offered himself to Flora. Perhaps, sir, I should not have refused him, replied she briskly. I should like a husband prodigiously that would be abroad for the whole years together, and leave me to bowl about on my couch and fix while he ploughed the ocean in search of new creatures to throw into my lap at his return. Well, well, said Miss Betsy, laughing still more, who knows, but when I have teased him a little, he may fly for shelter to your more clement goodness. Aye, aye, cried Mr. Goodman, you are a couple of madcaps indeed, and I suppose between you both. The captain will be finely managed. But no matter, I shall not pity him, as I partly told him what he might expect. After this Mr. Goodman went out, and the young ladies went up to dress against dinner, diverting themselves all the time with the poor captain's letter. Miss Betsy told Miss Flora that as he was for coming so directly to the point, she must use all her artifice in order to keep him in suspense. For, said she, if I should let him know any part of my real sentiments concerning him, he would be gone at once, and we should lose all our sport. I will, therefore, continued she, make him believe that I dare not openly encourage his pretensions, because my brother hath recommended one gentleman to me, and Mr. Goodman another, but shall assure him at the same time that I am inclined to neither of them, and shall contrive to get rid of them both as soon as possible. This, said she, will keep them in hopes, without my downright promising anything in his particular favor. Miss Flora told her she was a perfect Machiavelli in love affairs, 
and was about to say something more when a confused sound of several voices, among which she distinguished that of Lady Mellison very loud, made her run downstairs to see what was the occasion. But Miss Betsy stayed in the chamber, being busily employed in something belonging to her dress, or, had she been less engaged, it is not probable she would have troubled herself about the matter, as she supposed it only a quarrel between Lady Mellison and some of the servants, as in effect it was, and she, without asking, was immediately informed. Nanny, the upper housemaid, and the same who had delivered Mr. Savage's letter to Miss Betsy, and carried her answer to him, coming up with a broom in her hand, in order to sweep her lady's dressing-room, ran into the chamber of Miss Betsy, and seeing that she was alone, "'Oh, miss,' said she, "'there is the devil to do below.' "'I heard a sad noise, indeed,' said she carelessly. "'Well, you must know, miss,' cried the maid, "'that my lady hath given John the butler warning, "'and so his time being up, Mrs. Prinks hath orders to pay him off this morning, "'but would have stopped thirty shillings for a silver orange strainer that is missing. "'John would not allow it, and being in a passion, he told Miss Prinks "'that he would not leave the house without his full wages, "'that for anything he knew the strainer might be gone after the diamond necklace.' This, I suppose, she repeated to my lady, and that put her in so ill a humour this morning, that if my master had not come down as he did, we should all have something at our heads. However, continued the wench, she ordered Mrs. Prinks to give him his whole money. But would you believe it, miss? My master was no sooner gone out than she came down into the kitchen, raving, and finding John there still. The poor fellow, God knows, only stayed to take his leave of us. She tore about and swore we should all go, accused one of one thing and another of another. "'Well, but what did the fellow mean about the diamond necklace?' cried Miss Betsy, interrupting her. "'I will tell you the whole story,' said she, "'but you must promise never to speak a word of it to anybody, for though I do not value the place, nor will I stay much longer, yet they would not give one a character, you know, Miss.' Miss Betsy, then having assured her she would never mention it, the others shut the door and went on in a very low voice in this manner. "'Don't you remember, miss,' said she, "'what a flurry my lady and Mrs. Prinks were in one day? "'How her ladyship pulled off all her fine clothes "'and they both went out in a hackney coach? "'Then Mrs. Prinks came home and went out again?' "'Yes,' replied Miss Betsy. "'I took notice they were both in a good deal of confusion.' "'Aye, miss, well, they might,' said Nanny. "'That very afternoon John was gone to see a cousin "'that keeps a pawnbroker's shop in Thieving Lane, "'and as he was sitting in a little room behind the counter "'that it seemed shuts in with glass doors, "'who should he see through the window but Mrs. Prinks come in? "'She brought my lady's diamond necklace "'and pledged it for a hundred and twenty or a hundred and thirty guineas.' I am not sure which he told me, for I have the saddest memory, but it is no matter for that. John was strangely confounded, as you may think, but resolved to see into the bottom, and when Mrs. Prinks was got into the coach, popped up behind it and got down when it stopped, which was at the sign of the hand and tip staff at Knave's Acre, so that this money was raised to get somebody that was arrested out of the bailiff's hands. For John said it was what they call a sponging house that Mrs. Prinks went into. Lord, how deceitful some people are! My poor master little thinks how his money goes, but I'll warrant our housekeeping must suffer for this. This galloping young huffy would have run on much longer, doubtless, with her comments on this affair, but hearing Miss Flora's foot upon the stairs, she left off, and opening the door, softly slipped into her lady's dressing-room and fell to work in cleaning it. Miss Flora came up, exclaiming on the ill behavior of most servants, telling Miss Betsy what a passion her mamma had been in. The other made little answer to what she said on that or any other score, having her thoughts very much taken up with the account just given her by Nanny. She recollected that Lady Mellison had never dressed since that day, always making some excuse to avoid paying any grand visits, which she now doubted not, but it was because she had not her necklace. It very much amazed her, as she well knew her ladyship was not without a good deal of ready cash, 
therefore it was certain the sum must be large indeed for which her friend was arrested that it reduced her to the necessity of applying to a pawnbroker and who that friend could be for whom she would thus demean herself puzzled her extremely it was not long however before she was let into the secret but in the meantime other matters of more moment must be treated on End of chapter 16, reading by Joyce Martin. Chapter 17 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1 by Eliza Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin. Chapter 17 Is of less importance than the former, yet must not be omitted. Lady Mellison, having vented her spleen on those who by their stations were obliged to hear it, the object of it removed out of the house, became extremely cheerful the remaining part of the day. The fashion in which it might be supposed Miss Betsy would be accosted by the tarpaulin and amorato, and the reception she would give his passion occasioned a good deal of merriment, and even Mr. Goodman, feeling his dear wife took part in it, would sometimes throw in his joke. "'Well, well,' cried Miss Betsy, to heighten the diversion. "'What would you say now if I should take a fancy to the captain, "'so far as to prefer him to any of those who think it worth their while "'to solicit me on the score of love?' "'This is quite ungenerous in you,' cried Miss Flora. "'Did you not promise to turn the captain over to me when you had done with him?' "'That may not happen a great while,' replied the other, "'for I assure you I have seen him three or four times.' when he has called me here on business to Mr. Goodman, and think to part with a lover of his formidable aspect would be to deprive myself of the most conspicuous of my whole train of admirers. But suppose, continued she, in the same gay strain, I resign to you Mr. Staple or Mr. Trueworth. Would not that do as well? Do not put me in the head of either of them, I beseech you, said Miss Flora, for fear I should think too seriously on the matter, and it should not be in your power to oblige me. All that must be left to chance, cried Miss Betsy, but so far I dare promise you as to do enough to make them heartily weary of their courtship to me, and at liberty to make their addresses elsewhere. After this they fell into some conversation concerning the merits of the two last-mentioned gentlemen. They allowed Mr. Staple to have the finest face, and that Mr. Trueworth was the best shaved, and had the most graceful air in everything he did. Mr. Staple had an infinity of gaiety both in his look and behavior. Mr. Trueworth had no less of sweetness, and if his deportment seemed somewhat too serious for a man of his years, it was well atoned by the excellence of his understanding. Miss Flora, however, said, upon the whole, that both of them were charming men, and Lady Mellison added that it was a great pity either of them should have bestowed his heart, where there was so little likelihood of receiving any recompense. "'Why so, my dear?' cried Mr. Goodman. "'If my pretty charge is at present in a humour to make as many fools as she can in this world, I hope she is not determined to lead apes in another. I warrant she will change her mind one time or other.' I only wish she may not, as the old saying is, outstand her market. While they were thus discoursing, a servant brought a letter from Mr. Staple directed to Miss Betsy Thoughtless, which was immediately delivered to her. On being told from whence it came, she gave it to Mr. Goodman, saying, I shall make no secrets of the contents. Therefore, dear guardian, read it for the benefit of the company. Mr. Goodman shook his head at the little sensibility she testified of his friend's devoirs, but said nothing, being willing to gratify the curiosity he doubted not, but they were all in, Miss Betsy herself not excepted, as careless as she affected to be, which he did by reading in an audible voice these lines. To the most amiable and most accomplished of her sex, Madam, If the face is the index of the mind— as I think one of your best poets takes upon him to assert, your soul must certainly be all made up of harmony, and consequently take delight in what has so great a similitude of its own heavenly nature. I flatter myself, therefore, you will not be offended, that I presume to entreat you with grace with your preference, 
a piece of music composed by the so justly celebrated Signor Bonosini, and I hope will have justice done it in the performance, they being the best hands in town that are employed. I do myself the honor to enclose tickets for the ladies of Mr. Goodman's family and beg leave to wait on you this afternoon in the pleasing expectation not only of being permitted to attend you to the concert, but also of an opportunity of renewing those humble and sincere professions I yesterday began to make, of a passion which only charms such as yours could have the power of inspiring in any heart, and can be felt by none with greater warmth, zeal, tenderness, and respect than by that of him who is, and ever must be, madam, your most passionate and most faithful admirer, T. Staple. P.S. If there are any other ladies of your acquaintance to whom you think the entertainment may be agreeable, be pleased to make the invitation. I shall bring tickets with me to accommodate whoever you choose to accompany you. Once more I beseech you, madam, to believe me as above yours, etc. Mr. Goodman had scarce finished reading this letter when Lady Mellison and her daughter both cried out at the same time, "'Oh, Miss Betsy!' How unlucky this happens! What will you do with the captain now? We will take him with us to the concert, replied she, and in my opinion nothing could have fallen out more fortunately. The captain has appointed to visit me at five. Mr. Staple will doubtless be here about that time, if not before, in order to usher us to the entertainment, so that my tar cannot expect any answer from me to this letter, and consequently I shall gain time. Though Mr. Goodman was far from approving this way of proceeding, yet he could not forbear smiling with the rest at Miss Betsy's contrivance, and told her it was a pity she was not a man, she would have made a rare minister of state. "'Well, since it is so,' said Lady Mellison, "'I will have the honour of complimenting the captain with the ticket Mr. Staple intended for me.' Both Miss Flora and Miss Betsy pressed her ladyship to be of their company, and Mr. Goodman likewise endeavoured to persuade her to go, but she excused herself, saying, A concert was never among the number of those entertainments she took pleasure in, on which they left off speaking any further on it. But Miss Betsy was not at a loss in her own mind to guess the true reason of her ladyship's refusal, and looked on it as a confirmation of the truth of what Nanny had told her concerning the diamond necklace. There seemed notwithstanding one difficulty still remaining for Miss Betsy to get over, which was the probability of Mr. Trueworth's making her a visit that afternoon. She did not choose to leave him to go to the concert, nor yet to ask him to accompany them to it, because she thought it would be easy for a man of his penetration to discover that Mr. Staple was his rival, which she was by no means willing he should do before he had made a declaration to her of his own passion. She was beginning to consider how she should manage in a point which she looked upon as pretty delicate, when a letter from that gentleman eased her of all the apprehensions she at present had on the score. The manner in which he expressed himself was as follows. To Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Madam, I remember, as what can be forgot in which you have the least concern, that the first time I had the honour of seeing you at Oxford, you seemed to take a great deal of pleasure in the pretty tricks of a squirrel, which a lady in the company had on her arm. One of those animals, which they tell me has been lately catched, happening to fall in my way, I take the liberty of presenting him to you, entreating you will permit him to give you such diversion as is in his power. Were the little denizen of the woods endued with any share of human reason, how happy would he think himself in the loss of his liberty, and how hug those chains which entitle him to so glorious a servitude! I had waited on you in person, in the hope of obtaining pardon for approaching you with so trifling an offering, but am deprived of that satisfaction by the pressing commands of an old aunt, who insists on my passing this evening with her. But what need is there to apologize for the absence of a person so little known to you, and whose sentiments are yet less so? I rather ought to fear that the frequency of those visits I shall hereafter make may be looked upon as taking too presuming an advantage of the permission you have been so good to give me. I will not, however, anticipate so great a misfortune, but endeavour to prevent it by proving by all the ways I am able that I am, with the most profound submission, madam, your very humble, obedient, and eternally devoted servant, C. Trueworth. 
Miss Betsy, after having read this letter, ordered the person who brought it should come into the parlour, on which he delivered to her the present mentioned in the letter, which she received with a great deal of sweetness, gave the fellow something to drink her health, and sent her service to his master, with thanks, and an assurance that she should be glad to see him whenever it suited with his convenience. All the ladies then began to examine the squirrel, which was doubtless the most beautiful creature of its kind that could be purchased. The chain which fastened it to its habitation was gold, the links very thick and curiously wrought. Every one admired the elegance of the donor's taste. Miss Betsy herself was charmed to an excess, both with the letter and the present, but as much as she was pleased with the respectful passion of Mr. Trueworth, she could not find it in her heart to think of parting with the acidities, Mr. Stable, nor even the blunt addresses of Captain Highfoam, at least till she had exercised all the power her beauty gave her over them. As the two last-mentioned gentlemen were the friends of Mr. Goodman, he went out somewhat before the hour in which either of them was expected to come, choosing not to seem to know what it was not in his power to amend and determined, as he had promised Miss Betsy, not to interfere between her and any of those who pretended to court her. These two lovers came to the door at the same time, and Mr. Staples saying to the footman that opened the door that he was come to wait on Miss Betsy. "'I want to speak to that young gentlewoman, too,' cried the captain, "'if she be at leisure. Tell her my name is Hyphone.' Mr. Staple was immediately showed up into the dining-room, and the captain in the parlour, till Miss Betsy should be told his name. "'That spark,' said he to himself, "'I find is known here. I suppose he is one of those Mr. Goodman told me of, and that has a mind to Miss Betsy. But as she knew I was to be here, I think she might have left some orders concerning me, and not make me wait till that young gigaw had spoke his mind to her.' The fellow, not coming down immediately, he grew very angry, and began to call and knock with his cane against the floor which, it may be easily imagined, gave some sport to those above. Miss Betsy, however, having told Mr. Staple the character of the man, and the diversion she intended to make of his pretensions, would not vex him too much, and, to atone for having made him attend so long, went to the top of the stairs herself and desired him to walk up. The reception she gave him was full of all the sweetness she could assume, and excused having made him wait, and laid the blame on the servant who, she pretended, could not presently recollect his name. This put him into an exceeding good humour. "'Nay, fair lady,' said he, "'as to that I have stayed much longer sometimes before I could get to the speech of some people who I have not half the respect for as I have for you. But you know,' continued he, giving her a kiss the smack of which might be heard three rooms off, "'that I have business with you.' business that requires dispatch, and that made me a little impatient. All the company had much ado to refrain from laughing outright, but Miss Betsy kept her countenance to a miracle. "'We will talk of business another time,' said she. "'We are going to hear a fine entertainment of music. You must not refuse giving us your company. Lady Mellison has got a ticket on purpose for you. I am very much obliged to her ladyship, replied the captain, but I do not know whether Miss Goodman may think well of it or not, for he would fain have put me off from visiting his charge here. I soon found by his way of speaking the wind did not fit fair for me from that quarter, so tacked about, shifted my sails, and stood for the port directly. Manfully resolved indeed, said Mr. Staple, but I hope, Captain, you have kept a good lookout, in order to avoid any ship of greater burthen that might else chance to overset you. "'Oh, sir, as to that,' replied the captain, "'you might have spared yourself the trouble of giving me this caution. There are only two small pinks in my way, and they had best stand clear, or I shall run foul on them.' Now Mr. Staple had been apprised beforehand of the captain's pretenses, and that Miss Betsy intended to encourage them only by way of amusement to herself and friends. Yet the rough manner in which his rival had uttered these words brought the blood into his cheeks, which Lady Mellison perceiving, and fearing that what was began in just might, in the end, become more serious than could be withstood, turned the conversation, and addressing herself to the captain on the score of what he had said concerning Mr. Goodman, made many apologies for her husband's behavior in this point assured him that he had not a more sincere friend in the world, nor one who would be more ready to serve him in whatever was in his power. 
The captain had a fund of great good nature in his heart, but was somewhat too much addicted to passion, and frequently apt to resent without a cause. But when once convinced he had been in the wrong, no one could be more ready to acknowledge and ask pardon for his mistake. He had been bred at sea. His conversation for almost his whole life had been chiefly among those of his own occupation. He was altogether unacquainted with the manners and behavior of the polite world, and equally a stranger to what is called genteel raillery, as he was to courtly complacence. It is not, therefore, to be wondered at that he was often rude, without designing to be so, and took many things as affronts which were not meant as such. Lady Mellison, who never wanted words, and knew how to express herself in the most persuasive terms whenever she pleased to make use of them, had the address to convince the captain that Mr. Goodman was no enemy to his suit, though he would not appear to encourage it. While the captain was engaged with her ladyship in this discourse, Miss Betsy took the opportunity of telling Mr. Staple that she insisted upon it, that he should be very civil to a rival from whose pretensions he might be certain he had nothing to apprehend, and moreover that when she gave him her hand to lead her into the concert-room, he should give his to Miss Flora, without discovering the least marks of discontent. The lover looked on this last injunction as too severe a trial of his patience. But she would needs have it so, and he was under a necessity of obeying, or of suffering much greater mortification from her displeasure. Soon after this they all four went to the entertainment in Mr. Goodman's coach, which Lady Mellison had ordered to be got ready. The captain was mightily pleased with the music, and had judgment enough in it to know it was better than the band he had on board his ship. "'When they have done playing,' said he, "'I will ask them what they will have to go with me on the next voyage.' but Mr. Staple told him it would be an affront, that they were men who got more by their instruments than the best officer either by sea or land did by his commission. This mistake, as well as many others the captain fell into, made not only the company he was with, but those who sat near enough to hear him, a good deal of diversion. Nothing of moment happening either here or at Mr. Goodman's, where they all supped together, it would be needless to repeat any particulars of the conversation which had been said already of their different sentiments and behavior may be a sufficient sample of the whole. End of chapter 17 Recording by Joyce Martin Chapter 18 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1 by Eliza Haywood this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin Chapter 18 Treats on no fresh matters, but serves to heighten those already mentioned. Mr. Goodman had stayed abroad till very late that night the concert had been performed, so was not a witness of anything that had passed after the company came home. But on Lady Mellison's repeating to him everything she remembered, was very well pleased to hear that she had reconciled the captain to him, though extremely sorry that the blunt, ill-judged affection of that gentleman had exposed him to the ridicule, not only of Miss Betsy, but also of all her followers. That young lady, in the meantime, was far from having any commiseration for the anxiety of those who loved her. On the contrary, she triumphed in the pain she gave if it can be supposed that she, who was altogether ignorant of them in herself, could look upon them as sincere in others. But I am apt to believe ladies of this craft regard all the protestations of love made to them, as indeed many of them are, only as words of course. The prerogative of youth and beauty in the one sex, and a duty incumbent on the other to pay, they value themselves on the number and quality of their lovers, as they do upon the number and richness of their clothes, because it makes them of consideration in the world, and never take the trouble of reflecting how dear it may sometimes cost those to whom they are indebted for indulging this vanity. That this, at least, was the motive which induced Miss Betsy to treat her lovers in the manner she did, is evident to a demonstration from every other action of her life. She had a certain softness in her disposition, which rendered her incapable of knowing the distress of any one, without affording all the relief that was in her power to give. And had she sooner been convinced of the reality of the woes of love, she sooner had left off the ambition of inflicting them, and perhaps 
have been brought to regard those who labored under them rather with too much than too little compassion. But of this the reader will be able to judge on proceeding further in this history. There were now three gentlemen, who all of them addressed this young lady in the most honorable terms. Yet did her giddy mind make no distinction between the serious passion they had for her and the idle gallantries she received from those who either had no design in making them or such as tended to her undoing. Impatient to hear in what manner Mr. Trueworth would declare himself, and imagining he would come the next day, as he had made so handsome an apology for not having waited on her the preceding one, she told Mr. Staple and Captain Hytham, in order to prevent their coming, that she was engaged to pass that whole afternoon and evening with some ladies of her acquaintance. Neither the captain nor Mr. Staple suspected the truth of what she said, but the former was in too much haste to know some issue of his fate to be quite contented with this delay. Miss Betsy was not deceived in her expectations. Soon after dinner was over, she was told Mr. Trueworth had sent to know if she was at home, and begged leave to wait upon her. Lady Mellison, having a great deal of company that day in the dining-room, she went into an adjacent one to receive him. He was charmed at finding her alone, a happiness he could not flatter himself with, on entering the house. He was assured by the number of footmen that he saw in the hall, that many visitors were there before him. This unexpected piece of good fortune, as he had then thought it, especially as he found her playing with the squirrel he had sent to her the day before, so much elated him that it brightened his whole aspect and gave a double share of vivacity to his eyes. "'May I hope your pardon, madam,' said he, "'for presuming to approach you with so trifling a present as that little creature?' "'Oh, Mr. Trueworth,' answered she, "'I will not forgive you if you speak slight of my squirrel, "'though I am indebted to you for the pleasure he gives me. "'I love him excessively. "'You could not have made me a more obliging present.' "'How, madam,' cried he, "'I should be miserable indeed "'if I had nothing in my power "'to offer more worthy your acceptance "'than that animal. "'What think you, madam, "'of an adoring and passionately devoted heart?' "'A heart,' rejoined she, "'oh, dear, a heart may be a pretty thing, "'for aught I know to the contrary. "'But there is such an enclosure of flesh and bone about it "'that it is utterly impossible for one to see into it and consequently to know whether one likes it or not. "'The heart, madam, in the sense, I mean,' said he, "'implies the soul, which being a spirit and invisible "'can only be known by its effects. "'If the whole services of mine may render it an oblation, "'such as may obtain a gracious reception "'from the amiable Miss Thoughtless, "'I shall bless the hour in which I first beheld her charms, as the most fortunate one I ever had to boast of. In ending these words he kissed her hand, with a look full of the greatest respect and tenderness. She then told him the services of the soul must needs be valuable, because they were sincere. But as she knew not of what nature those services were he intended to render her, he must excuse her for not too readily accepting him on which is not to be doubted but that he assured her they should be only such as were dictated by the most pure affections and accompanied by the strictest honour he was going on with such protestations as may be imagined a man so much enamoured would make to the object of his wishes when he was interrupted by miss flora who came hastily into the room and told him that her mamma hearing that he was in the house expected he would not leave it without letting her have the pleasure of seeing him, that they were just going to tea, and that her ladyship entreated he would join the company with those friends she had already with her. Mr. Trueworth would have been glad to have found some plausible pretense for not complying with this invitation, but as he could not make any that would not be looked on as favouring of ill manners, and Miss Betsy insisted on his going, they all went together into the dining-room. The lover had now no further opportunity of prosecuting his suit in this visit, but he made another the next day, more early than before, and found no body but Mr. Goodman with Miss Betsy, either to buy something they wanted, 
or to tumble over goods as they frequently did, merely for the sake of seeing new fashions. Mr. Trueworth, having never been seen by Mr. Goodman, Miss Betsy presented him to him with these words. "'Sir, this is a gentleman from Oxford, an intimate friend of Brother Frank's, who did me the favour to bring me a letter from him.' There needed no more to make Mr. Goodman know both who he was and the business on which he came. He received him with a great deal of good manners, but knowing his absence would be most agreeable after some few compliments, pretended he was called abroad by urgent business and took his leave. How much it rejoiced the sincerely devoted heart of Mr. Trueworth to find himself once more alone with the idol of his wishes may easily be conceived by those who have had any experience of the passion he so deeply felt. But his felicity was of short continuance, and he profited but little by the complacence of Mr. Goodman. He was but just beginning to pour forth some part of those tender sentiments with which his soul overflowed, when he was prevented from proceeding by a second interruption, much more disagreeable than the former had been. Mr. Staple and Captain Hypham, for whom Miss Betsy had not left the same order she had done the day before, came both to visit her. The former had the advantage of being there somewhat sooner than the other, and accosted her with an air which made the enamoured heart of Mr. Trueworth immediately beat an alarm to jealousy. Mr. Staple, who had seen him there once before when he brought her brother's letter to her, did not presently know him for his rival, nor imagined he any other intent in his visits than to pay his compliments to the sister of his friend. They were all three engaged in a conversation which had nothing particular in it, when Miss Betsy was told Captain Hysom desired to speak with her, on which she bid the fellow desire him to walk in. "'He is in the back parlour, madam,' replied he. I told him you had company, so he desires you will come to him there, for he says he has great business with you, and must needs speak with you. Both Miss Betsy and Mr. Staple laughed immoderately at this message. But Mr. Trueworth, who was not in on the secret, looked a little grave, as not knowing what to think of it. "'You would scarce believe, sir,' said Mr. Staple to him, that this embassy came from the court of Cupid, yet I assure you the captain is one of this lady's most passionate admirers. Yes, indeed, added Miss Betsy, and threatens terrible things to every one who should dare to dispute the conquest of my heart with him. But go, continued she, to the footman. Tell him I have friends with me whom I cannot be so rude to leave, and that I insist on him giving us his company in this room. The captain on this was prevailed upon to come in, though not very well pleased at finding himself obliged to do so by the positive commands of his mistress. He paid his respects, however, in his blunt manner to the gentleman as well as Miss Betsy, and having drawn his chair as near her as he could, "'I hoped, madam,' said he, "'you would have found an opportunity of speaking to me before now. You must needs think I am a little uneasy till I know what I have to depend upon.' "'Bless me, sir,' cried she, "'you talk in an odd manner.' And then, continued she, pointing to Mr. Trueworth, "'this gentleman here, who is a friend of my brother's, "'will think I have outrun my income, "'and that you come to dun me for money borrowed of you.' "'No, no,' answered he, "'as to that you owe me nothing but good will, "'and that I think I deserve for the respect I have for you, "'if it were for nothing else. "'But, madam,' I should be glad to know some answer to the business I wrote you upon. Lord, sir, replied she, I have not yet had time to think upon it, much less to resolve on anything. That is strange, resumed he, why you have had three days, and sure that is long enough to think, and to resolve, too, on anything. Not for me, indeed, Captain, answered she, laughing. But come, here are just four of us. What think you, gentlemen, of a game of quadrille to kill time? Mr. Trueworth and Mr. Staple told her at once, and they approved the motion, and she was just going to call for cards and fishes, when the captain stopped her, saying, I never loved to play in my life, and have no time to kill, 
as mayhap these gentlemen have, who, tis likely, have nothing else to do than to dress and visit. I have a great deal of business upon my hands. The ship is taking in her landing, and I do not know, but we may sail in six or seven days. So must desire you would fix a day for us to be alone together, that I may know at once what it is you design to do. Fie, Captain, replied she, how can you think of such a thing? I assure you, sir, added she, with an affected disdain, I never make appointments with gentlemen. That I believe, said he, but you should consider that I live a great way off. Tis a long walk from Mile End to St. James, and I hate your jolting hackney coaches. Besides, I may come and come again and never be able to get a word with you in private in an afternoon, and all the morning I am engaged either at the India House or at Change. Therefore I should think it is better for both of us not to stand shilly-shally, but come to the point at once. For looky, fair lady, if we happen to agree there will be little enough time to settle everything, as I am obliged to go so soon. "'Too little, in my opinion, sir,' answered she. "'Therefore I think it best to defer talking any more of the matter till you come back.' "'Come back!' cried he. "'Why do you consider I shall be gone three years?' "'Really, sir,' said she, "'as I told you before, I have never considered anything about it, "'nor can promise I shall be able to say any more to you "'at the end of twice the time you mention.' Then I can do at present, which I assure you is just nothing at all. Though both Mr. Trueworth and Mr. Staple had too much good manners to do anything that might affront the captain, yet neither of them could refrain their laughter so well as to prevent some marks of the inclination they had for it from being visible on their faces, and willing to contribute something on their parts to the diversion they perceived she gave herself, with a lover so every way unsuitable to her, one told her it was a great pity she did not consult the captain's convenience. The other said that it must needs be a vast fatigue for a gentleman who is accustomed only to walk the quarter-deck, to take a stretch of four miles at once. "'And all to no purpose,' cried he that had spoken first. "'Pray, madam, give him his dispatch.' As little acquainted as the captain was with raillery, he had understanding enough to make him see that Miss Betsy's behavior to him had rendered him the jest of all the company that visited her, and this he took so ill that all the liking he before had to her was now turned into contempt. Finding they were going on in the ironical way they had begun, "'Look ye, gentlemen,' said he with a pretty stern countenance, "'I would advise you to meddle only with such things as concern yourselves. You have nothing to do with me, nor I with you.' If your errand here be as I suspect it is, there sits one who, I dare answer, will find you employment enough, as long as you shall think it worth your while to dance attendance. As for you, madam, continued he, turning to Miss Betsy, I think it would have become you as well to have given me a more civil answer. If you did not approve of my proposals, you might have told me so at first. But I shall trouble neither you nor myself any further about the matter. I see how it is well enough, and when next I steer for the coast of matrimony shall take care to look out for a port not cumbered with rubbish. So your servant. As he was going out of the house he met Lady Mellison and Miss Flora just entering, being returned from the ramble above mentioned. They saw he was very angry, and would fain have persuaded him to turn back, telling him that if any misunderstanding had happened between him and Miss Betsy, they would endeavor to make it up and reconcile them. To which he replied that he thanked them for their love, but he had done with Miss Betsy for good and all, and that she was no more than a young flirt and did not know how to use a gentleman handsomely. Said he should be glad to take a bowl of punch with Mr. Goodman before he went on his voyage, but would not come any more to this house to be scoffed at by Miss Betsy and those that came after her. Miss Flora told him that it was unjust in him to deprive her mamma and herself of the pleasure of his good company for the fault of Miss Betsy, who, she said, she could not help owing was of a very giddy temper. Lady Mellison, to what her daughter had said, added many obliging things in order to prevail on him either to return or renew his visits hereafter. But the captain was obstinate, and, persisting in his resolution of coming there no more, took his leave, 
and miss flora lost all hope of receiving any benefit from his being rejected by miss betsy End of chapter 18 reading by Joyce Martin Chapter 19 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1, by Eliza Haywood This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin Chapter 19 will make the reader little the wiser. The greatest part of the time that Mr. Trueworth and Mr. Staples stayed with Miss Betsy was taken up with talking of Captain Hysom, his passion, his behavior, and the manner in which he received his dismission afforded indeed an ample field for conversation. Lady Mellison and Miss Flora relating the answers he had given them on their pressing him to come back. Mr. Trueworth said that it must be owned that he had shown a strength of resolution which few men in love could boast of. "'Love, sir, according to my notions of that passion,' replied Mr. Staple, "'is not to be felt by every heart. Many deceive themselves in this point, and take for it what is in reality no more than a bare liking of a beautiful object. The captain seems to me to have a soul as well as form, cast in too rough a mould, to be capable of those refined and delicate ideas.' which alone constitute and are worthy to be called love. Yet, said Lady Mellison, I have heard Mr. Goodman give him an excellent character, and above all that he is one of the best-natured men breathing. That may be indeed, madam, resumed Mr. Staple, and some allowances ought to be made for the manner in which he has been bred, though, added he, I have known many commanders, not only of India men, but of other trading vessels, who have all their lifetime used the seas, yet have known how to behave with politeness enough when on shore. Mr. Trueworth agreed with Mr. Staple, that though the amorous declaration of a person of the captain's age, and the fashion of bringing up to one of Miss Betsy's, exposed him to the deserved ridicule of as many as knew it, yet ought not this particular foible be any reflection on his occupation, which merited to be held in the greatest veneration, as the strength and opulence of the nation was owing to its commerce in foreign ports. This was highly obliging to Mr. Staple, whose father had been a merchant, and Mr. Trueworth, being the first who took his leave, perceiving the other stayed supper, he said abundance of handsome things in his praise, and seemed to have conceived so high an esteem of him that Miss Betsy was diverted in her mind to think how he would change his way of speaking when once the secret of his rivalship should come out, as she knew it could not fail to do in a short time. But as easy Mr. Staple was at present on this occasion, Mr. Trueworth was no less anxious and perplexed. He was convinced that the other visited Miss Betsy on no other score than that of love, and appeared to him equally certain by the freedom with which he saw him treated in the family that he was likewise generally encouraged, if not by Miss Betsy herself, at least by her guardian. His thoughts were not wholly taken up with the means, but which he might gain the advantage over a rival, whom he looked upon as a formidable one, not only for his personal accomplishments, but also for his having the good fortune to address her before himself. All he could do was prevent as much as possible all opportunities of his entertaining Miss Betsy in private, till the arrival of Mr. Francis Thoughtless, from whose friendship and the influence he had over his sister he hoped much. He waited on her the next day very early, Mr. Goodman happening to dine that day later than ordinary on account of some friends he had with him, and the cloth not being drawn. Miss Betsy went and received him in another room. Having this favorable opportunity, he immediately began to prepare for putting into execution one of those stratagems he had contrived for separating her from Mr. Staple. After some few tender speeches, he fell into a discourse concerning the weather, said he was sorry to perceive the day so much shortened, that summer would soon be gone, and added that as that beautiful season could last but a small time, the most should be made of it. I came, said he, to entreat the favor of you and Miss Flora, 
to permit me to accompany you in an airing through Brompton, Kensington, Chelsea, and the other little villages on this side of London. Miss Betsy replied that she would go with all her heart, and believed she could answer the same for Miss Flora, there being only two grave dons, and their wives within, whom she would be glad to be disengaged from. But if not, said she, I can send for a young lady in the neighborhood who would be glad to give us her company. She sent first, however, to Miss Flora, who immediately came in, and the proposal being made accepted it with pleasure, and added that she would ask her mamma for orders for the coach to be got ready. "'It need not, madam,' said Mr. Trueworth. "'My servant is here, and he shall get one from Blunt's.' But Miss Flora insisted on their going in Mr. Goodman's, saying she was certain neither he nor her mamma would go out that day, as the company they had were come to stay, on which Mr. Trueworth complied. When she had left the room, "'Ah, madam,' said he to Miss Betsy, "'could I flatter myself with believing I owed this conversation to any other motive than your complaisance to a person who has some share in your brother's friendship? I should be blessed indeed. But, ah, I see I have a rival, a rival dangerous to my hopes, not only on the account of his merits, but also as he had the honour of declaring his passion before me. The fortunate Mr. Staple, added he, kissing her hand, may perhaps have already made some impression on that heart I would sacrifice my all to gain, and I am come too late. Rather too soon, replied she, smiling, both of you equally too soon, admitting his sentiments for me to be as you imagine. For I assure you, sir, my heart has hitherto been entirely my own, and is not very likely to incline to the reception of any guest of the nature you mean, for yet a long, long time. Whoever thinks to gain me must not be in a hurry like Captain Hysom. Mr. Trueworth was about to make some passionate reply when Miss Flora returned, and told them the coach would be ready immediately, for she herself had spoke to the coachman, and bid him put the horses to with all the haste he could, on which the lover expressed his sense of the obligation he had to her for taking this trouble, on the politest terms. A person of much less discernment than this gentleman might easily perceive that the way to be agreeable to Miss Betsy was not to be too serious. He therefore assumed all the vivacity he was master of, both before they went and during the whole course of the little tour they made, in which it is not to be doubted, but he regaled them with everything the places they passed through could furnish. The ladies were so well pleased, both with their entertainment and the company of the person who entertained them, that they seemed not in haste to go home, and he had the double satisfaction of enjoying the presence of his mistress, and of giving at least one day's disappointment on his rival. He was confirmed in the truth of this conjecture, when, on returning to Mr. Goodman's, which was not till some hours after close of day, the footman who opened the door told Miss Betsy that Mr. Staple had been to wait upon her. After this it may be supposed he had a night of much more tranquillity than the preceding one had afforded him. The next morning, as early as he thought decently permitted, he made a visit to Miss Betsy under the pretense of coming to inquire if her health had not suffered by being abroad in the night air, and how she had rested. She received him with a great deal of sprightliness, and replied she found herself so well after it as to be ready for such another jaunt, whenever he had a fancy for it. "'I take you at your word, madam,' cried he transported to hear she anticipated what he came on purpose to entreat. "'I am ready this moment, if you please,' continued he, "'and we will either take a barge and go up the river, or a coach to Hampstead, or any of those places, just to diversify the scene. You have only to say what you choose.' She then told him there was a necessity of deferring their ramble till the afternoon, because Miss Flora was abroad, and would not return till dinner-time. As to what route we shall take, and everything belonging to it, said she, I leave it entirely to you. I know nobody has a more elegant taste or a better judgment. I have taken care, replied he, to give the world a high opinion of me in both, by making my addresses to, to the amiable Miss Betsy. But, madam, pursued he, since we are alone, will you give me leave to tell you how I have employed my hours this morning? 
"'Why, in dressing, breakfasting, and perhaps a little reading,' answered she. "'A small time, madam, suffices for the two former articles with me,' resumed he, "'but I have indeed been reading, happening to dip into the works of a poet who wrote near a century ago. I found some words so adapted to the situation of my heart, and so agreeable to the sense of the answer I was about to make yesterday to what you said, concerning the perseverance of a lover, that I could not forbear putting some notes to them, which I beg you will give me your opinion of. In speaking these words, he took a piece of paper out of his pocket and sung the following stanza. The patriarch to gain a wife, chaste, beautiful, and young, served fourteen years, a painful life, and never thought it long. Oh, were you to reward such cares, and life so long would stay, not fourteen, but four hundred years would seem but as one day. Mr. Trueworth had a fine voice and great skill in music, having perfected himself in that science from the best masters when he was in Italy. Miss Betsy was so charmed both with the words and the notes that she made him sing them several times over, and afterwards sent them down in her music book to the end that she might get them by heart and join her voice in concert with her spinet. Mr. Trueworth would not make his morning visit too long, believing it might be her time to dress against dinner, as she was now in such a disabil as ladies usually put on, on their first rising. So, after having received a second promise from her of giving him her company that day abroad, took his leave, highly satisfied with the progress he imagined he had made in her good graces. The wind happening to grow a little boisterous, though the weather otherwise was fair and clear, made Mr. Trueworth think a land journey would be more agreeable to the ladies than to venture themselves upon the water. He therefore procured a handsome livery coach, and attended by his two servants, went to Mr. Goodman's. The ladies were already in expectation of him, and did not make him wait a moment. Nothing extraordinary happening at this entertainment, nor at those others, which for several succeeding days without interruption, Mr. Trueworth prevailed upon his mistress to accept. It would be superfluous to trouble the reader with the particulars of them. Mr. Staple all this time was very uneasy. He had not seen Miss Betsy for a whole week, and, though he knew not as yet that he was deprived of that satisfaction by her being engrossed by a rival, yet he now began to be sensible she had less regard for him than he had flattered himself he had inspired her with and this of itself was a sufficient mortification to a young gentleman who was not only passionately in love but also could not without being guilty of great injustice to his own merits but think of himself not altogether unworthy of succeeding this however was no more than a slight sample of the inquietudes which the blind god sometimes inflicts on hearts devoted to him as will hereafter appear in the progress of this history End of chapter 19 Recording by Joyce Martin Chapter 20 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1, by Eliza Haywood This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin Chapter 20 Contains an odd accident which happened to Miss Betsy in the cloisters of Westminster Abbey. Mr. Trueworth, who was yet far from being acquainted with the temper of the object he adored, now thought he had no reason to despair of being one day in possession of all he aimed to obtain. It seemed certain with him, at least, that he had nothing to apprehend from the pretensions of a rival, who at first he had looked upon as so formidable and no other, at present, interposed between him and his designs. Miss Betsy, in the meanwhile, wholly regardless of who hoped or who despaired, had no aim in anything she did but merely to divert herself, and to that end laid hold of every opportunity that offered. Mr. Goodman having casually mentioned, as they were at supper, that one Mr. Solgard had just taken orders, and was to preach his first sermon at Westminster Abbey the next day, she presently had a curiosity of hearing how he would behave in the pulpit, 
over his modest and, as they termed it, sheepish behaviour in company, having, as often as he came there, afforded matter of ridicule to her and Miss Flora. These two young ladies, therefore talking on it after they were in bed, agreed to go to the cathedral, not doubting but that they should have enough to laugh at, and repeat to all those of their acquaintance who had ever seen him. What mere trifles! What airy nothing served to amuse a mind not taken with more effectual matters! Miss Betsy was so full of the diversion she should have in hearing the down-looked, bashful Mr. Solgard harangue his congregation, that she could think and talk of nothing else till the hour arrived when she should go to experience which she had so pleasant an idea of. Miss Flora, who had till now seemed as eager as herself, cried all at once that her head ached, and that she did not care for stirring out. Miss Betsy, who would fain have left her out of it, told her she had only got the vapours, that the parson would cure her, and such like things, but the other was not to be prevailed upon by all Miss Betsy, or even Lady Mellison herself could say, and answered with some sullenness that positively she would not go. Miss Betsy was highly ruffled at this sudden turn of her temper as it was now too late to send for any other young lady of her acquaintance to go with her. Resolving, nevertheless, not to balk her humour, she ordered a chair to be called and went alone. Neither the young parson's manner of preaching nor the text he chose being any way material to this history, I shall therefore pass over the time of divine service and only say that after it was ended Miss Betsy, passing towards the west gate, and stopping to look on the fine tomb erected in the memory of a Mr. Secretary Craigs, was accosted by Mr. Bluemaker, a young gentleman who sometimes visited Lady Mellison, and lived at Westminster, in which place he had a large estate. He had with him, when he came up to her, two gentlemen of his acquaintance, but who were entire strangers to Miss Betsy. "'What?' said he. "'The celebrated Miss Betsy Thoughtless?' Miss Betsy Thoughtless, the idol of mankind, alone, unattended by any of her train of admirers, and contemplating these mementos of mortality? To compliment my understanding, replied she gaily, you should rather have told me I was contemplating the mementos of great actions. You are at the wrong end of the cathedral for that, madam, resumed he, and I don't remember to have heard anything extraordinary of the life of this great man, whose effigy makes so fine a figure here, except the favours he received from the ladies. "'Twere too much then to bestow them on him both alive and dead,' cried she, "'therefore we will pass on to some other.' Mr. Bluemaker had a great deal of wit and vivacity, nor were his two companions deficient in either of these qualities, so that between the three Miss Betsy was very agreeably entertained. They went round from tomb to tomb, and the real characters, as well as epitaphs, some of which are flattering enough, afforded a variety of observations. In fine, the conversation was so pleasing to Miss Betsy that she never thought of going home till it grew too dark to examine either the sculpture or the inscriptions. So insensibly does time glide on, when accompanied with satisfaction." but now ensued a mortification which struck a damp on the sprightliness of this young lady. She had sent away the chair which brought her, not doubting but there would be others about the church doors. She knew not how difficult it was to procure such a vehicle in Westminster, especially on a Sunday. To add to her vexation it rained very much, and she was not in a habit fit to travel on foot in any weather, much less in such as this. They went down into the cloisters, in order to find some person whom they might send, either for a coach or chair, for the gentlemen would have been glad of such conveniences for themselves as well as Miss Betsy. They walked round and round several times without hearing or seeing anybody, but at last a fellow who used to be employed in sweeping the church doors offered his service to procure them what they wanted, in case there was a possibility of doing it. They promised to gratify him well for his pains, and he ran with all the speed he could to do as he had said. The rain and wind increased to such a prodigious height 
that scarce was ever a more tempestuous evening almost a whole hour was elapsed and the man not come back so that they had reason to fear neither coach nor chair was to be got miss betsy began to grow extremely impatient the gentlemen endeavoured all they could to keep her in good humour we have a good stone roof over our heads madam said one of them and that at present shelters us from the inclemency of the elements besides cried another the storm cannot last always and when it is a little abated here are three of us we will take you in our arms by turns and carry you home all this would not make miss betsy laugh and she was in the utmost agitation of mind to think what she should do when on a sudden a door in that part of the cloister which leads to little dean's yard was opened and a very young lady not exceeding eleven years of age but very richly habited came running out and taking miss betsy by the sleeve madam said she i beg to speak with you miss betsy was surprised but stepping some paces from the gentleman to hear what she had to say the other drawing her toward the door cried please madam to come and hear on which she followed and the gentleman stood about some four or five yards distant miss betsy had no sooner reached the threshold which had a step down into the hall and pulling her gently down as if to communicate what she had to say with the more privacy then a footman who stood behind the door immediately clapped it to and put the chain across as if he had apprehended some violence might be offered to it miss betsy was in so much consternation that she was unable to speak one word till the young lady who still had hold of her hand said to her you may thank heaven madam that our family happened to be in town else i do not know what mischief might have befallen you bless me cried miss betsy and was going on but the other interrupted her saying hastily as she led her forward walk this way my brother will tell you all miss betsy then stopped short what means all this said she where am i pray miss who is your brother to which the other replied that her brother was the lord viscount and that he at present was the owner of that house the surprise miss betsy had been put in by this young lady's first accosting her was not at all dissipated by these words but had now an equal portion of curiosity added to it she longed to know the meaning of words which at present seemed so mysterious to her and with what kind of mischief she had been threatened that she readily accompanied her young conductress into a magnificent parlour at the upper end of which sat the nobleman she had been told of i am extremely happy said he as soon as he saw her enter that providence has put it in my power to rescue so fine a lady from the villainy contrived against her miss betsy replied that she should always be thankful for any favour conferred upon her but desired to know of what nature they were for which she was indebted to his lordship then he told her that the person she had been with had the most baleful designs upon her that he had heard from a closet window where he was sitting two of them lay the plot for carrying her off in a hackney coach and added that being struck with horror at the foul intention he had contrived by the means of his sister to get her out of their power for said he i know one of them to be so bloody a villain that had I gone out myself, I must have fallen a sacrifice to their resentment. Miss Betsy was quite confounded. She knew not how to question the veracity of a nobleman, who could have no view or interest to deceive her. Yet it was equally incongruous to her that Mr. Bluemaker could harbour any designs upon her of that sort his lordship mentioned. She had several times been in company with that gentleman, and he had never behaved toward her in a manner which could give her room to suspect he had any dishonorable intentions toward her. But then, the treatment she had received from the gentleman commoner at Oxford reminded her that men of an amorous complexion want only an opportunity to show those inclinations, which indolence or perhaps indelicacy prevents them from attempting to gratify by acidities and courtship after having taken some little time to consider what she should say she replied that she was infinitely obliged to his lordship for the care he took of her but might be very well amazed to hear those gentlemen had any ill designs upon her 
two of whom were perfect strangers to her, and the other often visited at the house where she was boarded. As for the sending for a coach, she said it was by her own desire if no chair could be procured, and added that if his lordship had no other reason to apprehend any will was met to her, she could not, without injustice, forbear to clear up the mistake. The lord of that manor was a little confounded at these words, but soon recovering himself, told her that she knew not the real character of the person she had been with, that Bloomaker was one of the greatest libertines in the world, and that though she might agree to have a coach sent for, she could not be sure to what place it might carry her, and that he heard two of them, while the third was entertaining her, speak to each other in a manner which convinced him the most villainous contrivance was about to be practised on her. A loud knocking at the door now interrupted their discourse. Both his lordship and his sister seemed terribly alarmed. All the servants were called, and charge given not to open the door upon any account, to bar up the lower windows, and to give answers from those above to whoever was there. The knocking continued with greater violence than it began, and Miss Betsy heard the gentlemen's voices talking to the servants, and though she could not distinguish what they said, found there were very high words between them. My lord's sister ran into the hall to listen, then came back crying, "'Oh, what terrible oaths! I am afraid they will break open the door!' No, replied the Lord, it is too strong for that, but I wish we had been so wise as to send for a constable. One of the servants came down and repeated what their young lady had said, adding that the gentlemen swore they would not leave the place till they had spoke with the lady, who they said had been trepanned into that house. On this, suppose, my Lord, said Miss Betsy, I go to the door and tell them that I will not go with them. "'No, madam,' answered the lord, "'I cannot consent my door should be open to such ruffians, "'for besides that they would certainly seize and carry you off by force. "'I know not what mischief they might do my poor men "'for having at first refused them entrance.' "'She then said she would go up to the window and answer them from there. "'But he would not suffer her to be seen by them at all, "'and to keep her from insisting on it, "'told her a great many stories of rapes, and other mischiefs that had been perpetrated by Bluemaker and those he kept company with. All this did not give Miss Betsy those terrors, which it is very plain his lordship and sister endeavoured to inspire her with, yet would she say no more of appearing to the gentleman, as she found he was so averse to it. At length the knocking ceased and one of the footmen came down and said that those who had given his lordship this disturbance had withdrawn from the door, and he believed were gone quite out of the cloisters. But this intelligence did not satisfy the lord. He either was or pretended to be in fear that they were still skulking in some corner, and would run in if once they saw the door opened. There was still the same difficulty as ever how Miss Betsy should get home. That is, how she should get safely out of the house, for the rain being over, the servants said they did not doubt but they should be able to procure a chair or coach. After much debating on this matter, it was thus contrived. The Lord had a window that looked into the yard of one of the prebendaries. A footman was to go out of the window to the back door of that reverend divine, relate the whole story, and beg leave to go through his house. This request being granted, the footman went, and returned in less than half an hour with the welcome news that a chair was ready and waited on College Street. Miss Betsy had no way of passing, but by the same the footman had done, which she easily did, by being lifted by my lord into the window, and ascending from it by the help of some steps placed on the other side by the servants of the prebendary. It would be superfluous to trouble the reader with any speeches made by the Lord and his sister to Miss Betsy, or the replies she made to them. I shall only say that passing through his house and the college garden at the door of which the chair attended, she went into it, preceded by the Lord's footman, muffled up in a cloak and without a flambeau to prevent being known, in case she should be met by Bloomaker or either of his companions. 
and with this equipage she arrived safe at home, though not without a mind strangely perplexed at the meaning of this adventure. End of chapter 20, reading by Joyce Martin Chapter 21 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin Chapter 21 Gives an explanation of the former with other particulars more agreeable to the reader in the repetition than the persons concerned with them. It was near ten o'clock when Miss Betsy came home, and Mr. Goodman, who had been very uneasy at her staying out so late, especially as she was alone, was equally rejoiced at her return, but as well as Lady Mellison was surprised on hearing by what accident she had been detained, they knew not how to judge of it. There was no circumstance in the whole affair which could make them think Mr. Bluemaker had any designs of the sort the Lord had suggested. Yet did Mr. Goodman think himself obliged, as the young lady's guardian, to go to that gentleman and have some talk with him concerning what had passed. Accordingly, he went the next morning to his house, but not finding him at home, left word with his servant that he desired to speak with him as soon as possible. He came not, however, the whole day, nor sent any message to excuse his not doing so, and this neglect gave Mr. Goodman and Miss Betsy herself some room to suspect he was no less guilty than he had been represented, since, had he been perfectly innocent, it seemed reasonable to them to think he would have come, even of his own accord, to have learned of Miss Betsy the motive of her leaving him in so abrupt and odd a manner but how much they wronged him will presently appear, and they were afterwards convinced. There was an implacable animosity between the Lord and Mr. Bluemaker on account of the former's pretending a right to some lands which the other held and could not be dispossessed of by law. As his lordship knew, Mr. Bluemaker was not of a disposition to bear an affront tamely. He had no other way to vent his spleen against him, then by vilifying and traducing him in all companies he came into. But this he took care to do, in so artful a manner as to be enabled either to evade or render what he said impossible to be proved, in case he were called to an account for it. The affair of Miss Betsy, innocent as it was, he thought gave him an excellent opportunity of gratifying his malice. He went early the next morning to the dean, complained of an insult offered to his house by Mr. Bluemaker on the score of his sister having brought in a young lady whom that gentleman had detained in the cloisters and was going to carry off by the assistance of some friends he had with him in a hackney coach. The dean, who was also a bishop, was extremely incensed, as well he might, at so glaring a profanation of that sacred place, and the moment the Lord had taken his leave, sent for Mr. Bluemaker to come to him. That gentleman, immediately obeying the summons, the bishop began to reprimand him in terms which the occasion seemed to require from a person of his function and authority. Mr. Bluemaker could not forbear interrupting him, though with the greatest respect, saying nothing could be more false and base than such an accusation that whoever had given such an information was a villain and merited to be used as such. The prelate, seeing him in this heat, would not mention the name of his accuser, but replied coolly that it was possible he might be wronged, but to convince him that he was so he must relate to him the whole truth of the story, and on what grounds a conjecture so much to the disadvantage of his reputation had been formed on which Mr. Bluemaker repeated everything that had passed, and added that he was well acquainted with the family where the young lady was boarded, and that he was certain she would appear in person to justify him in this point, if his lordship thought it proper. But, said the bishop, I hear you affronted the lord by thundering at his door and abusing his servants. No, my lord, answered Mr. Bluemaker, the lord, though far from being my friend, will not dare to allege any such thing against me. We were, indeed, a little surprised to see the young lady who was with us snatched away in so odd a manner by his sister, who we easily perceived had not the least acquaintance with her. 
we continued walking however in the cloister till the man whom we had sent for a coach returned and told us he had got one and that it waited at the gate we then indeed knocked at the lord's door and being answered from the windows by the servants in a very impertinent manner i believe we might utter some words not very respectful either of his lordship or his sister whose behaviour in this affair i am yet entirely ignorant how to account for the bishop paused a considerable time but on mr bluemaker's repeating what he had said before concerning bringing the lady herself to vouch the truth of what he had related to his lordship replied that there was no occasion for troubling either her or himself any further that he believed there had been some mistake in the business and that he should think no more of it on which mr bluemaker took his leave though the bishop had not mentioned the name of the lord to mr bluemaker as the person who had brought this complaint against him yet he was very certain by all circumstances that he could be indebted to no other for such a piece of low malice and this joined to some other provocations he had received from the ill will of that nobleman made him resolve to do himself justice he went directly from the deanery in search of the two gentlemen who had been with him in the abbey when he happened to meet miss betsy and having found them both they went to a tavern together in order to consult on what was proper to be done for the chastisement of the lord's folly and ill-nature both of them agreed with mr bluemaker that he ought to demand that satisfaction which every gentleman has a right to expect from any one who has injured him of what degree forever he be excepting those of royal blood each of them was so eager to be his second in this affair that they were obliged to draw lots for the determination of the choice he who had the ill luck as he called it to draw the shortest cut would needs oblige them to let him be the bearer of the challenge that he might at least have some share in inflicting the punishment which the behaviour of that unworthy lord so justly merited the challenge was wrote the place appointed for meeting was the field behind montague house but the gentleman who carried it brought no answer back his lordship telling him only that he would consider on the matter and let mr bluemaker know his intentions mr bluemaker as the principal and the other as his second were so enraged at this that the latter resolved to go himself and force a more categorical answer he did so and the lord having had time to consult his brother and as it is said some other friends told him he accepted the challenge and would be ready with his second at the time and place appointed in it mr bluemaker did not go home that whole day therefore he knew nothing of the message that had been left for him by mr goodman till it was too late to comply with it but this seeming remissness in him was not all that troubled the mind of that open and honest-hearted guardian of miss betsy mr trueworth and mr staple had both been at his house the day before the former on hearing his mistress was abroad left only his compliments and went away though very much pressed to come in by miss flora who seeing him through the parlour window ran to the door herself and entreated he would pass the evening there mr staple came the moment after and met his rival coming down the steps that led up to the door mr trueworth saluted him in passing with the usual complaisance which the other returned in a very cool manner and knocked hastily at the door i imagine said he to the footman who opened it that miss betsy is not at home by that gentleman's having so early taken leave but i would speak with mr goodman if he be at leisure he was then showed into the back parlour which was the room where mr goodman generally received those persons who came to him upon business on hearing who it was that asked for him he was a little surprised and desired he would walk upstairs but mr staple not knowing but that there might be company above returned for answer that he had no more than a word or two to say to him and that must be in private on which the other immediately came down to him this young lover having by accident been informed not only that mr trueworth made his addresses to miss betsy but also that it was with him she had been engaged during all that time he had been deprived of seeing her thought it proper to talk with mr goodman concerning this new obstacle to his wishes that worthy gentleman was extremely troubled to be questioned on an affair on which he had given miss betsy his word not to interfere 
but finding himself very much pressed by a person whose passion he had encouraged and who was the son of one with whom he had lived in a long friendship he frankly confessed to him that mr trueworth was indeed recommended to miss betsy by her brother told him he was sorry the thing had happened so but had nothing further to do with it that the young lady was at her own disposal as to the article of marriage that he was ignorant how she would determine and that it must be from herself alone he could learn what it was he might expect or hope mr staple received little satisfaction from what mr goodman had said but resolved to take his advice and if possible to bring miss betsy to some enclarcement of the fate he was to hope or fear accordingly he came the next morning to visit her a liberty he had never taken nor would now if he had not despaired of finding her in the afternoon she gave herself however no airs of resentment on that account but when he began to testify his discontent concerning mr trueworth and the apprehensions he had of his having gained the preference in her heart though the last who had solicited that happiness she replied in the most haughty tone that she was surprised at the freedom he took with her that she was and ever would be mistress of her actions and sentiments and no man had a right to pry into either and concluded with saying that she was sorry the civilities she had treated him with should make him imagine he had a privilege of finding fault with those she showed to others it is not to be doubted but that he made use of all the arguments in his power to convince her that a true and perfect passion was never unaccompanied with jealous fears he acknowledged the merits of mr trueworth but added he the more he is possessed of the more dangerous he is to my hopes and then begged her to consider the torments he had suffered while being so long deprived of her presence and knowing at the same time a rival was blessed with it miss betsy was not at this time in a humour either to be persuaded by the reasons or softened by the submissions of her lover and poor mr staple after having urged all that love wit despair and grief could dictate was obliged to depart more dissatisfied than he came in going out he saw mr goodman in the parlour who gave him the good morning as he passed a sad one it has been to me answered he with somewhat of horror in his countenance but I will not endure the rack of many such. With these words he flung out of the house in order to go about what, perhaps, the reader is not at a loss to guess at. End of chapter 21 Reading by Joyce Martin Chapter 22 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1 by Eliza Haywood this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin. Chapter 22. A duel begun and another fought in the same morning on Miss Betsy's account are here related with the manner in which the different antagonists behaved to each other. Well, may the God of love be painted blind. Those devoted to his influence are seldom capable of seeing things as they truly are. The smallest favor elates them with imaginary hopes, and the least coolness sinks them into despair. Their joys, their griefs, their fears more frequently spring from ideal than effective causes. Mr. Staple judged not that Miss Betsy refused to ease his jealous apprehensions on the score of Mr. Trueworth, because it was her natural temper to give pain to those that loved her, but because she had really an affection for that gentleman. Looking on himself, therefore, as now abandoned to all hope, rage and revenge took the whole possession of his soul, and chased away the softer emotions thence. Having heard Mr. Trueworth say he lodged in Pall Mall, he went to the Cocoa Tree, and there, informing himself of the particular house where his rival might be found, sat down and wrote the following billet. To Charles Trueworth, Esquire. Sir, both our wishes tend to the possession of one beautiful object. Both cannot be happy in the accomplishment. It is fit there the sword should decide the difference between us and put an end to those pretensions on the one side or the other, which it is not probable either of us will otherwise recede from. In confidence of your complying with this proposal, I shall attend you in the green park between the hours of seven and eight tomorrow morning. As the affair concerns only ourselves, 
I think it both needless and unjust to engage any of our friends in it, so shall come alone, and expect you will do the same, sir, your humble servant, T. Stable. Mr. Trueworth was at home, and on receiving this immediately, and without the least hesitation, wrote and sent back by the same messenger the following answer. To T. Staple, Esquire. Sir, though I cannot but think the decision of our fate ought to be left entirely to the lady herself, to whom, whatever be the fortune of the sword, it must at last be referred, yet, as I cannot without being guilty of injustice to my own honour and pretensions refuse you the satisfaction you require, shall not fail to meet you at the time and place mentioned in yours, till when I am, sir, your humble servant, C. Trueworth. By the style of this letter it may be easily perceived that Mr. Trueworth was not very well pleased with this combat, though the greatness of his courage and spirit would not permit him to harbour the least thought of avoiding it. Yet, whatever his thoughts were on this occasion, he visited Miss Betsy the same day and discovered no part of them in his countenance. His behaviour, on the contrary, was rather more sprightly than usual. He proposed to the two young ladies to go on some party of pleasure. Miss Betsy answered, with her accustomed freedom, that she should like it very well, but Miss Flora, who had been for three or four days past very sullen and ill-humoured, said one minute she would go, and the next she would not, and gave herself such odd and capricious airs that Miss Betsy told her she believed her head was turned, to which the other replied tartly that if the distemper was catching, it would be no wonder she should be infected, having it always so near her. Miss Betsy replied that she knew no greater proof of madness than to punish one's self in the hope of mortifying another. "'But that shall never be my case,' continued she, as you will find. Then turning to Mr. Trueworth, "'If you will accept my company without Miss Flora,' said she, laughing, "'we will take a walk into the park.' It is not to be doubted but that the lover gladly embraced this opportunity of having his mistress to himself. "'Tis like Miss Betsy Thoughtless,' cried Miss Flora, "'and only like herself to go abroad with a man alone.' Miss Betsy regarded not this reproach, but catching up her fan and gloves, gave Mr. Trueworth her hand to lead her where she had proposed, leaving the other so full of spite that the tears gushed from her eyes. "'Tis likely the reader will be pretty much surprised that Miss Flora, who had always seemed more ready than even Miss Betsy herself, to accept of invitations of the sort Mr. Trueworth had made, should now all at once become so adverse. But his curiosity for an explanation of this matter must be for a while postponed, others, for which he may be equally impatient, requiring to be first discussed. Two duels, having been agreed upon to be fought on the same morning, the respect due to the quality of the Lord, demands we should give that wherein he was concerned the preference in the repetition. The hour appointed being arrived, the lord and his brother came into the field. Mr. Bluemaker and his friend appeared immediately after. "'You are the persons,' said the lord, in an exulting tone, who made the invitation, "'but we are the first at table.' "'Tis not yet past the time,' replied Bluemaker, looking on his watch, "'but the latter we come, the more eagerly we shall fall to.' In that instant all their swords were drawn, but they had scarce time to engage one thrust before a posse of constables, with their assistants, armed with staves and clubs, rushed in between them, beat down their weapons, and carried them all four to the house of the high bailiff of Westminster. That gentleman, by virtue of his office, made a strict examination into what had passed, and having heard what both parties had to say, fervently reprimanded the one for having given the provocation and the other for the manner in which it was resented. He told them he had a right, in order to preserve the peace of Westminster and the liberties of it, to demand that they should fund sureties for their future behavior, but in regard to the quality and character he would insist on no more than their own word and honor, that the thing should be mutually forgot, and that nothing of the same kind, which now had been happily prevented, should hereafter be attempted. The Lord submitted to this injunction with a great deal of readiness, and Mr. Bluemaker, feeling no other remedy, did the same, after which the high bailiff obliged them to embrace, in token of the sincerity of their reconciliation. 
thus ended an affair which had threatened such terrible consequences it made however a very great noise and the discourse upon it was no way to the advantage of the lord's character either for generosity or courage let us now see the sequel of the challenge sent by mr staple to mr trueworth these gentlemen met almost at the same time in the place the challenger had appointed few words served to usher in the execution of the fatal purpose mr staple only said come on sir love is the word and miss betsy thoughtless be the victor's prize with these words he drew his sword mr trueworth also drew his and standing on his defence seeing the other was about to push cried hold sir your better fortune may triumph over my life, but never make me yield up my pretensions to the amiable lady. If I die, I die her martyr, and wish not to live, but in the hope of serving her. These words, making Mr. Staple imagine that his rival had indeed the greatest encouragement to hope everything, added to the fury he was before possessed of. Die then, her martyr, said he, and running upon him with more force than skill, received a slight wound in his own breast while aiming at the other's heart. It would be needless to mention all the particulars of this combat. I shall only say that the too great eagerness of Mr. Staple gave the other an advantage over him, which must have been fatal to him from a less generous enemy. But the temperate Mr. Trueworth seemed to take an equal care to avoid hurting his rival, as to avoid being hurt by him seeing however that he was about to make a serious push at him he ran in between closed with him and mr staple's foot happened to flip he fell at full length upon the earth his sword at the same time dropped out of his hand which mr trueworth took up the victory is yours cried he take also my life for i disdain to keep it no replied mr trueworth i equally disdain to take an advantage which mere chance has given me rise sir and let us finish the dispute between us as become men of honour with these words he returned him his sword i should be unworthy to be ranked among that number said mr staple on receiving it to employ this weapon against the breast whose generosity restored it were anything but miss betsy at stake but what is life what is even honour without the hope of her i therefore accept your noble offer and death or conquest be my lot they renewed the engagement with greater violence than before. After several passes, all Mr. Trueworth's dexterity could not hinder him from receiving a wound on his left side. But he gave the other at the same time so deep a one in his right arm that it deprived him in an instant of the power of continuing the fight. On which Mr. Trueworth, dropping the point of his sword, ran to him. "'I am sorry, sir,' said he, "'for the accident that has happened.' I see you are much hurt. Permit me to assist you as well as I am able, and attend you where proper care may be taken of you. I do not deserve this goodness, answered Mr. Staple, but it is the will of heaven that you should vanquish every way. Mr. Trueworth, then feeling the blood run quite down upon his hand, stripped up the sleeve and bound the wound from which it issued, as tight as he could with his handkerchief, after which they went together to an eminent surgeon near Piccadilly. On examination of his wounds, neither that in his arm nor in his breast appeared to be at all dangerous, the flesh being only pierced, and no artery or tendon touched. Mr. Trueworth seemed only assiduous in his cares for the hurts he had given his rival, without mentioning the least word of that which he had received himself, till an elderly gentleman, who happened to be with the surgeon when they came in, and had all the time been present, perceiving some blood upon the side of his coat a little above the hip cried out sir you neglect yourself i fear you have not escaped unhurt a trifle said mr trueworth a mere scratch i believe tis time enough to think of that nor would he suffer the surgeon though he bled very fast to come near him till he had done with mr staple it was indeed but a slight wound which mr trueworth had received though happening among a knot of veins occasioned the effusion of a pretty deal of blood for the stopping of which the surgeon applied an immediate remedy and told him that it required little for a cure besides keeping it from the air 
Mr. Staple, who had been deeply affected with the concern this generous enemy had expressed for him, was equally rejoiced at hearing the wound he had given him would be attended to no bad consequences. Everything that was needful being done for both, the old gentleman prevailed upon them to go with him to a tavern a few doors off, having first obtained the surgeon's leave, who told him a glass or two of wine could be of no prejudice to either. This good-natured gentleman, who was called Mr. Chatfree, used to come frequently to Mr. Goodman's house, had some knowledge of Mr. Staple, and though he was wholly unacquainted with Mr. Trueworth, conceived so great an esteem for him from his behavior toward the person he had fought with, that he thought he could not do a more meritorious action than to reconcile to each other two such worthy persons. What effect his endeavors, or rather their own nobleness of sentiments produced, shall presently be shown. End of chapter 22 Reading by Joyce Martin Chapter 23 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1, by Eliza Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin. Chapter 23. Among other things necessary to be told, gives an account of the success of a plot laid by Mr. Chatfrey for the discovery of Miss Betsy's real sentiments. Although Mr. Goodman had as yet no intimations of the accidents of that morning, yet was he extremely uneasy. The looks, as well as words of Mr. Staple, in going out of his house the day before, were continually in his mind, and he could not forbear apprehending some fatal consequence would, one time or another, attend to the levity of Miss Betsy's behavior and conduct in regard to her admirers. He was also both surprised and vexed that Mr. Bluemaker, from whom he expected an explanation of the Westminster Abbey adventure, had not come according to his request. This last motive of his disquiet was, however, soon removed. Mr. Bluemaker was no less impatient to clear himself of all blame concerning the transactions of that night, had no sooner finished his affair with the Lord, and was dismissed by the High Bailiff. Then he came directly to Mr. Goodman's, and recited to him and all the ladies the whole of what had passed. Miss Betsy laughed prodigiously, but Mr. Goodman shook his head on hearing the particulars related by Mr. Bluemaker, and, after that gentleman was gone, reproved, as he thought it his duty to do, the inconsiderateness of her conduct. He told her that, as she was alone, she ought to have left the abbey as soon as divine service was ended, and that for a person of her sex, age, and appearance, to walk in a place where there were always a great concourse of young sparks, who came for no other purpose than to make remarks upon the ladies, could not but be looked on as very odd by all who saw her. There was no rain, said he, till a long time after the service was ended, and you might then in all probability have got a chair, or if not, the walk over the park could not have been a very great fatigue. Miss Betsy blushed extremely, not through a conscious shame of imagining what she had done deserved the least rebuke, but because her spirit, yet unbroke, could not bear control. She replied that she meant no ill, those who censured her were most in fault. That is very true, answered Mr. Goodman, but, my dear child, you cannot but know it is a fault which too many in the world are guilty of. I doubt not of your innocence, but would have you consider that reputation is also of some value, that the honor of a young maid like you is a flower of so tender and delicate a nature that the least breath of scandal withers and destroys it. In fine, that it is not enough to be good without behaving in such a manner as to make others acknowledge us to be so. Miss Betsy had too much understanding not to be sensible what her guardian said on this occasion was perfectly just, and also that he had a right to offer his advice, whenever her conduct rendered it necessary, but could not help being vexed that anything she did should be liable to censure, as she thought it merited none. She made no further reply, however, to what Mr. Goodman said, though he continued his remonstrances, 
and probably would have gone on much longer if not interrupted by the coming in of Mr. Chatfrey. This gentleman, having parted from the two wounded rivals, came directly to Mr. Goodman's in order to see how Miss Betsy would receive the intelligence he had to bring her. After paying his compliments to Mr. Goodman and the other ladies, he came toward Miss Betsy, and looking on her with a more than ordinary earnestness in his countenance, "'Ah, madam,' said he, "'I shall never hereafter see you without remembering what Callie says of a lady who might, I suppose, be like you. So fatal, and withal so fair, we're told destroying angels are.' Though Miss Betsy was not at that time in a humour to have any great relish for raillery, yet she could not forbear replying to what this old gentleman said in the manner in which she imagined he spoke. "'You are at least past the age of being destroyed by any weapons I carry about me,' cried she. "'But pray, what meaning have you in this terrible simile?' "'My meaning is as terrible as the simile,' answered he. And though I believe you to be very much the favorite of heaven, I know not how you will atone for the mischief you have been the occasion of this morning. But it may be, continued he, that you think it nothing that those murdering eyes of yours have set two gentlemen a-fighting. Miss Betsy, supposing no other than that he had heard of the quarrel between Mr. Bluemaker and the Lord, replied merrily, Pray, accuse my eyes of no such thing. They are very innocent, I assure you. Yes, cried Mr. Goodman and Lady Mellison at the same time. We can clear Miss Betsy of this accusation. What? rejoined Mr. Chatfrey hastily. Was not Mr. Staple and Mr. Trueworth rivals for her love? Mr. Staple and Mr. Trueworth, said Miss Betsy, in a good deal of consternation. Pray, what of them? Oh, the most inveterate duel, answered he. They fought above half an hour, and poor Mr. Staple is dead of his wounds. Dead! cried Miss Betsy, with a great scream. Lady Mellison and Miss Flora seemed very much alarmed, but Mr. Goodman was ready to sink from his chair, till Mr. Chatfrey, unseen by Miss Betsy, winked upon him, in token that he was not in earnest in what he said. The distraction in which this young lady now appeared, the concern she expressed for Mr. Staple, and her indignation against Mr. Trueworth, would have made any one think the former had much the preference in her esteem, till Mr. Chatfrey, after having listened to her exclamations on the score, cried out in a sudden, "'Ah, madam, what a mistake has the confusion I was involved in made me guilty of! Alas, I have deceived you, though without designing to do so. Mr. Staple lives. It is Mr. Trueworth who has fallen a sacrifice to his unsuccessful passion for you.' Trueworth dead, cried Miss Betsy. Oh, God! And does his murderer live to triumph in the fall of the best, most accomplished men on earth? Oh, may all the miseries that heaven and earth can inflict light on him! Is he not secured, Mr. Chatfrey? Will he not be hanged? Mr. Chatfrey could hold his countenance no longer, but bursting into a violent fit of laughter. Ah, oh, Miss Betsy, Miss Betsy, said he, I have caught you. Mr. Trueworth, I find, then, is the happy man. "'What do you mean, Mr. Chatfrey?' cried Miss Betsy, very much amazed. "'I beg your pardon,' answered he, "'for the fright I have put you in, but be comforted, "'for Mr. Trueworth is not dead, I assure you, "'and I doubt not lives as much your slave as ever.' "'I do not care what he is if he is not dead,' said Miss Betsy. "'But pray for what end did you invent this fine story?' "'Nay, madam,' resumed he, "'it is not altogether my own inventing, neither, "'for Mr. Trueworth and Mr. Staple have had a duel this morning, "'and both of them are wounded, "'though not so dangerously as I pretended, "'merely to try by the concern you would express "'which of them you were most inclined to favour. "'And I have done it, I faith. "'Mr. Trueworth is the man.' "'Lady Mellison, who had not spoke during all this conversation, "'now cried out, "'Aye, Mr. Chatfrey, we shall soon have a wedding, I believe.' "'Believe, madam,' said he, "'why your ladyship may swear it. "'For my part, I will not give above a fortnight for the conclusion, "'and I will venture, too, with a fair bride, joy on the occasion, "'for he is a fine gentleman, a very fine gentleman indeed, "'and I think she could not have made a better choice.' "'With these words he wiped his mouth "'and advanced to Miss Betsy in order to salute her but pushing him scornfully back. None of your flights, good Mr. Chatfrey. 
said she, if I thought you were in earnest, I would never see the face of Mr. Trueworth more. This did not hinder the pleasant old gentleman from continuing his raillery. He plainly told Miss Betsy that she was in love, and that he saw the marks of it upon her, and that it was in vain for her to deny it. Lady Mellison laughed very heartily to see the fret Miss Betsy was in at hearing Mr. Chatfrey talk in this manner. But Miss Flora, to whom one would imagine this scene would have been diverting enough, never opened her lips to utter one syllable, but made such grimaces as, had they been taken notice of, would have shown how little she was pleased with it. Mr. Goodman had been so much struck with the first account given by Mr. Chatfrey that he was not to be roused by anything that gentleman said afterwards. He reflected that though the consequences of the recounter between the two rivals had been less fatal than he had been made to imagine, yet it might have happened, and indeed been naturally expected. He could not forbear, therefore, interrupting his friend's mirth by remonstrating to Miss Betsy in the most serious terms the great error she was guilty of in encouraging a plurality of lovers at the same time. He told her that gentlemen of Mr. Trueworth's and Mr. Staple's character and fortune ought not to be trifled with. Suppose, said he, that one or both of them had indeed been killed. How could you have answered to yourself or to the world the having been the sad occasion? Lord, sir, replied Miss Betsy, walking up and down the room in a good deal of agitation, what would you have me do? I do not want the men to love me, and if they will play the fool and fight and kill one another, it is none of my fault. In fine, between Mr. Chatfrey's raillery and Mr. Goodman's admonitions, this poor young lady was teased beyond all patience, and finding it impossible to put a stop to either, she flew out of the room ready to cry with vexation. She was no sooner gone than Mr. Goodman took Mr. Chatfrey into his closet and having learned from him all the particulars of the late duel, and consulted with him what was proper to be done to prevent any further mischief of the like sort, they went together to Mr. Staple's lodging, in order to use their utmost endeavours to prevail on that gentleman to desist the prosecution of his addresses to Miss Betsy. End of the first volume End of chapter 23